Welcome to our online audio library. My name is Mr. Bookman. If you enjoy audiobooks, make sure you press the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our new uploads. I just looked up today's book on our audio card catalog, and it is now playing and ready on your device. So with that said, let's get right into the book. In glancing at the title of this chapter, it may seem out of place in a work on psychology. To discuss it fully, it undoubtedly would be, but we wish only to discuss the psychological aspect of the subject in our treatment here. Psychology is concerned with what is, and not what ought to be, so we wish to give not the theory, but the facts of ethics, only in so far as they affect our subject. Every person who is developed normally is supposed to be equipped morally, at least that is our supposition in this chapter. He is thereby capable of moral conduct, and if capable, is more or less responsible for his actions. We recognize the development of the moral equipment and must also admit the possibility of degeneration. The latter occurs to such an extent at times that we do not hold persons responsible for their actions. Thus we class together the infant, whose faculties are not developed sufficiently to allow of moral conduct, and the person suffering from senile dementia whose faculties have degenerated and declined so that he is a child again. Neither of these persons is held responsible for conduct. We also consider incapable of moral conduct the person whose mind is so affected as to be considered insane. He is equally irresponsible. One of the chief questions which will come before us in this chapter is this. Is the alcoholic responsible for his conduct? This will be discussed under two divisions. First, is the alcoholic responsible for his deeds either when drunk or sober? And second, is he responsible for getting intoxicated? The answers to these questions will help us to classify alcoholism, for it has in the past been classed very largely according to the profession or views of the person dealing with it. The clergyman called it a sin, the physician classed it among the diseases, the lawyer said it was a crime, and the social reformer named it a vice. It cannot very well be all of these at once but it may be a combination of two or even more. Besides the question of responsibility, we wish to treat the general moral condition of the alcoholic as far as his excesses have caused a change from the normal moral states, endeavoring to assign causes as far as we can. Not even here can we escape the influence of the physical upon the mental, but we find that the general health, as well as the condition of the brain, has much to do with the moral conduct of man. We shall also endeavor to show the influence of the degenerate condition of the other mental faculties upon the moral, as well as a reciprocal action of the defective morals upon them. Let us turn to the facts of the moral life, as they are exhibited in those who have indulged in excessive use of alcohol for a prolonged time. It would seem that when dealing with the morals, we were entirely out of the realm of the physical. But here, even in this higher life of man, the influence of the physical not only cannot be ignored, as it is by many writers on moral conduct, but it must take an important part. As has been so well said, it is not enough to say that passion is strengthened and will weaken by indulgence, as a moral effect, that it is so no doubt, but beneath the effect there lies the deeper fact of physical deterioration of the nerve element, for the alcohol and opium enter the blood, are carried by it to the inmost minute recesses of the brain, and act there injuriously upon the elements of the exquisitely delicate structures. So its finest, latest organized, least stable parts, which subserve moral feeling and supreme will, are marred. We might be criticized for saying that most misconduct is the result of pathological states. Probably this is making the statement too strong. If that were so, we would not have so much need of the moralist as of the physician to bring about the ideal life. Let us invert and modify the statement in this way. All pathological bodily states have a tendency to lead, yes, force, the person experiencing them, away from the moral life. Footnote. P.C. Remondino, A Study of the Causes and Nature of Dipsomania, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 23, page 137, says, Morality and its offspring, chastity, sobriety, industry, wealth, comfort, and respectability are not, after all, as they are too often represented, such heaven-born attributes as any accidental shifting of our bodily health or physical condition may quickly make or unmake them. An accident or illness may convert the most 
philanthropic or benign individual into a cruel and rapacious pirate, or a like accident may convert a cruel and vicious debauchee into an evangelist. End footnote. Some of the best persons we know are intense sufferers from somatic diseases, but they are good notwithstanding their ill health rather than because of it. It requires a sound mind for the best moral life. It requires a sound body for the best mental life. It is but stating a fact with which we are all familiar, to say that a poor breakfast, a sore finger, indigestion, and other irritating bodily conditions have an effect upon conduct. Not that they are the exciting causes of crime or immorality, but rather that they influence the person as far as mood is concerned, and a very insignificant stimulus is then sufficient to precipitate an immoral action. Investigations recently made on the relation between conduct and the weather show that inclement weather of any kind is concomitant with the marked increase in crime, as provided by the police records, and the conduct of children in the schools. The reserve energy is demanded when the weather is disagreeable and produces a condition similar to that of fatigue. Emotional states are plainly influenced, and as far as they have effect upon the conduct, it is detrimental. In the case of the weather, it is the loss of the reserve energy producing a change in the emotions that to a large extent is the cause of the harmful influence on the conduct. It is noticeable in direct connection with our subject that drunkenness is increased on very cold days, in days when humidity is excessive. High winds also have a great tendency to augment the number of cases of drunkenness. Drunkenness was increased one-third when the temperature was near zero or when the winds were very high, we might expect this result at the time of very cold weather on account of the stimulating effect which alcohol produces when first taken and the paralyzing effect which it has in large quantities. Both results would help the alcoholic to forget the cold. Very many other examples will occur to everyone from his own experience of the effect of physical states and conditions upon the conduct. So in dealing with the result of the physical condition upon conduct, we are entirely within our sphere. The effects of the deterioration of the different faculties upon the conduct will now be considered. We found a serious deterioration of the memory, especially of recent events, and that an alcoholic was living largely in his remote past, that is, in his childhood. Amnesia, particularly of the feelings, is a great drawback to conduct, for, as with the alcoholic, both the bodily feelings caused by overindulgence, that is, nausea and pain, and those feelings of remorse, which accompany the uncomfortable bodily feelings being forgotten, there is lacking a great incentive to sobriety. This feeling of remorse, let us explain here, is not caused by the moral considerations involved, not that he has injured his family or society, not that he has done something that he knows is not right, but he is sorry because he has been sick and is inconvenienced thereby. This remorse invariably follows sickness brought on by overindulgence. These feelings, which would be some incentive to control, being forgotten, and only the ever-present desire for stimulation being present, the alcoholic gets no help as far as the memory of the feelings is concerned. The childhood memories being an important factor in his life, and these not being of a developed moral character, we cannot expect the alcoholic's moral nature to be strong through memory. Children are innocent not because of their exalted characters, but because they are impotent. A person with a man's power and a child's character would be an exceedingly dangerous individual. Slightly modified, this is the alcoholic's condition. The judgment is so affected as to leave the alcoholic in such a condition that he is largely unable to judge right and wrong, or if he is able to judge the end and has will enough to put it into execution, he is not able to judge well the means. About his work, as well as in his morals, he goes the longest way around to accomplish anything. He will not use what judgment he has about particular things. He, in common with all others, admits that it is wrong to get drunk, but he does not intend to get drunk. He only wants one drink, or a second drink. He does not judge regarding this particular drink, or if he does, he judges incorrectly. He wants it to strengthen him, to steady him, or even to give him courage and strength enough to resolve to take no more. His reasoning is not sound and if you present the most logical arguments, he either draws a wrong conclusion 
or else admits your conclusion in an uninterested, listless manner. Only a rational being can be moral. One must be able to reason from cause to effect to reach an approximately moral life. The alcoholic does not do this. Perhaps he does not recognize the inevitable conclusion of the life he is leading. He may be led astray by false hopes of a better constitution, not drinking so much, drinking different beverages, or many other circumstances which separate him from his friend in like distress. These reasons may seem puerile, they are, but not to him, he does not perceive the relations correctly. He must use his judgment to determine the possibility of an action, for we can only be held responsible for conduct which it is possible to accomplish. He judges many things impossible of attainment, simply on account of his own inertia and lack of force. Further, in the earlier stages of judgment, with children or savages, feelings largely, if not wholly, determine the judgment. A judgment is scarcely more than a declaration of feelings. The alcoholic, being childlike, is thus devoid to a great extent of true judgment, being led by his feelings to a further indulgence, regardless of the moral or utilitarian aspect. Being in this condition, we cannot expect him to possess those virtues which come as a result of a sound judgment. In our study of the emotions, we found that they follow the common law of degeneration, the higher developed, more complexly stable ones going first. The higher feelings which tend to assist the moral nature are among the first victims. We also found that all the emotions remaining were of an egotistical character. Some egotistical emotions are necessary to moral life, but the emotions which are left to the alcoholic, and the variety of these egotistic emotions, all go to show that as far as the feelings are concerned, he is in a low condition morally. He is totally selfish, lacking in all noble and manly emotions. Footnote, H. Maudsley, Pathology of the Mind, page 486, says regarding the moral condition of the alcoholic, his moral sense is blunted or destroyed, so that he loses all the feeling of moral responsibility and becomes cunning, cowardly, untruthful, and untrustworthy. End footnote. These are but the secondary moral emotions. What shall we say concerning the primary moral emotion, the feeling of obligation? This is universal with the race and all persons feel that they ought to do what they believe to be right. Is it true also of the alcoholic? One further statement regarding the feeling of obligation, which can best be given by using a quotation, it should be noticed that the early movements of the feeling of obligation are very frequently strongest in the direction of that which is sensuously painful or expulsive. We may say that, as far as he does retain the feeling of obligation, it is in the degenerated childlike manner, he ought to do that which helps him to escape pain or injury. Even a child doesn't act because he knows the failure to accomplish it will result in a flogging. A flogging, sickness, or other painful feelings teach the child what he should do. The pain is interpreted by the alcoholic as a lesson in what he should do, and he has not courage to resist it. He has, as the one pressing obligation, the duty to himself to rid himself of the painful sensations resulting from abstinence. This is nearer to him than anything else, and he tries to give reasons to substantiate it. He may admit that perhaps he ought not to drink, or he may endeavor to show why he should. If the ought feeling is present in any form, it is weak. He does not drink so much because he ought to, but because he wants to. He drinks now without thinking of the right or wrong of it. He drinks now because he must whatever may have been his ideas about it in the past. In one mood, he admits everything that is said to him, admits all his obligations and duties. And in another mood, he as quickly and decisively denies all that he has formally admitted. These feelings of remorse cannot be counted on very much. They are of such an egotistical and selfish character. He is therefore in no condition to possess or practice any of these virtues of feeling. Footnote. We have the following from H. Malsley, Body and Will, pages 273 forward. His finest moral sensibilities are extinguished and his least fine blunted, steadily selfish to his own selfish wants and persistent to gratify them. He is insensible to the feelings and claims of his family, whose dearest interest he sacrifices without real compunction 
and indifferent to the obligations and responsibilities of his social position. He will often profess to you very fine sentiments and perhaps indulge in the pleasant debauchery of a visionary imagination inspired by an intensely egotistic feeling and stimulated by the drug, but uncontrolled by realities, the disciplinary and disagreeable hold of which the drug has deadened or destroyed. End footnote. We will remember that the emotions which remained were of an immoral character. There seems to be a difference of opinion regarding one feeling which is the cause of immorality, referred to the sexual feeling. Some authorities say that the sexual feeling is annihilated. Others affirm that the feeling is still present and is even exaggerated, but on account of the impotence of the alcoholic, he is unable to gratify it. We know that alcohol, when first taken, has the power of exciting different feelings, but in a person in a condition which we know are subject to be, we think it hardly possible for the sexual feeling to remain in much advanced cases. The divergence of opinion may be due to the fact that one is speaking of a chronic alcoholic in advanced stage, while the other is referring to the single intoxications of one who has not been drinking long. Again, one authority may be speaking of men and another of women. Alcohol may affect the two sexes in different ways sexually. The impotence is admitted by all. Footnote. We have the following from L. G. Robinovich. Infantile Alcoholism. Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 25, page 231. Probably a direct toxic action is exercised on the reproductive elements. Testicular atrophy has been observed, and in women addicted to alcohol, menstruation ceases prematurely and the ovaries atrophy. And footnote. The will is an important factor in morals. We cannot have a moral act without will, and cannot have a moral character without continued will in one direction. We remember the condition of the will in the alcoholic, as was shown in the chapter on that subject. It flags, and after very slight exertion fails altogether. What kind of a moral character can we expect, even supposing that all the other faculties are intact, if the will is defective? If the feeling of obligation demands one course of action, which may be difficult to attain, and the will is weak, can we ever expect its consummation? No, the other faculties are useless without the aid of the will. Bain has gone so far as to say that moral inability is simply a fault of the will, being a weakness of motives, and it can be remedied by the aid of new motives. But moral inability is a matter of degree, and while this may be true of some, and sufficiently strong motives could be devised to influence them, we think that there are others who would be beyond this. It might be said of the latter class that they go beyond the bounds of the moral. This we will have to consider later when we take up the question of responsibility. We might say in a general way that we are virtuous in proportion to our self-control, for the virtues of the will are most important, especially with the alcoholic. We found in our discussion of the emotions the alcoholic to be a coward. He is a coward indeed, the lowest kind of a coward, and there is nothing he fears so much as physical pain. If he feared the disapprobation of conscience or friends, the ruin staring him in the face, the displeasure of God or the destruction of his family, there might be some hope for him, but he fears only the pain and discomfort by the abstinence from his regular dram. There is no incentive for the goodwill here. No motive for reform. The habit of the alcoholic's willing is against him. He has not been in the habit of opposing his appetite, and to exert his will against a lifelong habit is difficult, shall we say impossible. Connected closely with the defects of the will can be noticed an indecision of character in the alcoholic. He has an uncertainty and infirmity of purpose which are very characteristic. One minute or day he chooses a certain line of action, in the next he repudiates it. He knows not what he wants, and is never satisfied with his present circumstances. What is true of his resolutions for reform is characteristic of his whole life. He has not stability enough to carry out any one idea. He is good and bad, innocent and criminal, filled with worthy plans and low ones, all in the same breath. A threat and expression of goodwill are equally possible, and one is puzzled in which to believe. It is safest to believe neither, for both are alike unreliable. The senses have their influence also. It is impossible to judge the relations between actions correctly. If we do not perceive correctly 
This has been referred to before when speaking of the alcoholic's lying. He lied, it was said, for two reasons at least. One because he did not perceive correctly, and the other because he did not remember correctly. These are but the minor reasons. Alcoholic excess seems to destroy all shame as far as it is concerned, with the departure from the truth. The learning is not difficult. Everyone is a potential liar. It seems an easy way out of a difficult position at times, and this the alcoholic evidently thinks. He begins to dissemble and deceive, first denying his drinking at all, and later the quantity of which he has partaken. All sorts of deceptions are practiced to hide the fault from family, friends, and society. The lying habit is established and resorted to on all occasions, until he lies even to his own disadvantage and does not recognize the difference between falsehood and error. Of all reference made to the subject, the writer has yet to find one authority who does not speak of the alcoholic in unmistakable terms as a confirmed liar, and from his own testimony it is even difficult to arrive at the facts of his case. Of a goodly number of alcoholics examined by the writer, there is yet to be found one whose friends did not give the same testimony concerning him, and further, not one of them when asked denied that he was a liar or showed any shame concerning the admission. With truthfulness lacking, we cannot expect a virtuous life, for truth is the basis, the foundation stone of morals. In view of the alcoholic's untruthfulness and his generally criminal record, it seems strange that according to computations, only 26% of the perjurers are alcoholics. The reason for this low percentage has been given that perjury requires motives, and motives are not plentiful with the intellectually degenerate alcoholic. His lying has an effect which we notice in dealing with the emotions. Because he does not tell the truth himself, he is suspicious of others, and does not believe anything that is told him. The distrust is not confined to the verbal statements of his friends, but it soon spreads over all their actions. He does not believe in the fidelity and loyalty of his wife. He distrusts his attendant. His whole life becomes filled with distrust, which soon, through a diseased imagination, leads to hallucinations and illusions of persecutions and acts of violence caused thereby. We may now ask and endeavor to answer the question, why do morals deteriorate so quickly? Some say that they are the first to go. Footnote, H. Malsley, Body and Will, page 273 says, When the mind undergoes degeneration, the moral feeling is the first to show it, as it is the last to be restored when the disorder passes away. The latest and highest gain of mental evolution it is the first to witness by its impairment to mental dissolution. The first effect of mental degeneration, it is the last to witness to full mental regeneration. End footnote. The development of the highest moral life is the result of the highest development of all the mental faculties, intellect, feeling, and will. It is impossible for any of these to degenerate without causing also the degeneration of the moral life. It is no contradiction to say that the memory deteriorates first, and that the morals go first, for the morals would deteriorate as the memory does. The most complex, highly developed, unstable parts of the mind are the first to suffer degeneration. And it is obvious that when the morals are depending upon the proper functioning of every part of the mind, the least trouble would cause a derangement of the moral conduct of the person thus suffering. With the decline of the moral nature, there is one more link broken in the chain which might have drawn the alcoholic out of the danger of ruin and destruction. One more incentive, the chief one, to reform life is lost. It is only fair to say that the alcoholic is not really wicked and vicious. He has not courage and force enough for that. We very seldom know of his committing great crimes, but it almost seems that he has a monopoly of the petty offenses for prison statistics show that a majority of the inmates are alcoholics. It is said that in Paris, in 1888, 72% of the convicted criminals of the year were found to be chronic alcoholics, while in Bern, Canton, the proportion was about 40%. Further, it has been estimated that about 70% of all perpetrated crimes are directly or indirectly attributable to alcoholism. Principally, the offenses were of the nature of disregard of the rights of others, the contempt of law and order, assault, disturbance of domestic peace, and robbery. For, to all of such crimes, the habitual drunkard seems to be particularly prone.
a moment of passion is frequently responsible for these. Lombroso has computed that of 100 crimes, alcoholism is the cause of 50 in France and 41 in Germany. Sock states that in Germany, fully 50% of all crimes are committed under the influence of alcoholic excesses. In England and America, the percentage is no doubt equally high. We think Dr. Davis has exaggerated the case when he says careful and impartial investigations, both in this country and in Europe, have proved that at least 90% of all criminals who prey upon the person and property of others, as thugs, highway robbers, housebreakers, rioters, and murderers, are made such by the use of alcohol and other narcotic drugs. The Reverend Mr. Horsley says that of the prisoners in Clerkenwell Prison, 75% come there through drink, and of 300 cases of attempted suicide, 172 were attributable to the same cause. In a paper by Dr. W. Westcott, Alcoholic Poisoning in London and Heart Disease as its Fatal Result, the writer shows that alcohol is the most potent cause of crime, suicide, and sudden death in the great city. Inebriety in Scotland, a paper presented to the Society for the Study of Inebriety in April 1903 by A. Sherwell, speaks of the increase of crime in Scotland. All classes of crime have increased from an average of 344 per 10,000 of population for five years, 1883 to 1887, to 393 in 1897 to 1901. If we take the four principal classes of crime, viz. crime against the person, crimes against property with violence, crimes against property without violence, and malicious injury to property, the figures are much less serious but even these show a slight increase in 20 years. But it is when we return to the miscellaneous offenses, of which drunkenness and disorder constitute more than two-thirds, that we see where the real increase has been, the figures in this class rising from 295 per 10,000 of the population in the five years, 1883 to 1887, to 345 in the five years, 1897 to 1901 an increase of 17%. The closeness of the relation between intemperance and crime has become a truism, but it is nowhere more clearly demonstrated than the criminal statistics of Scotland. Take the single fact that out of a total of 179,821 persons charged with criminal offenses in 1900, no fewer than 114,207, or 63.5%, were for offenses directly connected with drinking. This lamentable figure, the commissioners are careful to tell us, is no exaggeration of the charges resulting directly from overindulgence in alcoholic liquor. In the report of the New York State Commission on Prisons for 1903, we find the following suggestive paragraph. During the last year, there were 28,519 commitments to the jails and 3,615 to the penitentiaries for intoxication. These figures do not include many thousand other convictions for the same offense, punished by a fine which was paid before commitment. It would appear that one half of the convictions in the criminal courts of the state are for this single offense. The report for the New York State Reformatory at Elmira for 1903 says that of 1,700 inmates of whom reports had recently been gathered, a total of 1,077 acknowledged drinking of which 779 were moderate drinkers and 298 drank to excess. The age limit of inmates being 30 years old, we would hardly expect so many excessive drinkers in this situation. Some of the greatest and most successful criminals do not drink. They cannot afford to in their business. Drinking would unfit them for their work and certainly mean an early capture by the police. The drunkard is not fitted mentally for great crimes, and so is not bad in that way. No doubt, though, that the prisons are filled with alcoholics, especially those in the first stages of alcoholism. Alcoholism frequently gives rise to criminal tendencies on account of the perverted moral judgment and general mental degeneration. The alcoholic's crime may take the form of immoral and indecent deeds. This lack of moral sense may often be found among criminals whose parents were both alcoholics, though they themselves have never used alcohol. Lombroso recently tested the effects of alcohol on latent criminal tendencies. The subject of his experiments was a man who had surrendered himself to the police 
by the avowal that anarchists wished to make him their instrument for assassinating the king of Italy. The man seemed sane, but no corroboration of his story could be obtained. Unexpectedly, after drinking wine, he broke out into anarchist threats. Acting upon this hint, Professor Lambroso administered alcohol to him in carefully measured doses, and discovered that after he drunk a certain amount, he developed violent criminal tendencies. Sometimes a murder which he commits is unintentional on his part. He cannot judge how hard he is striking, and instead of a tap there is given a blow. It shows a lack of judgment regarding the force of the blow. But the chronic alcoholic is not found in serious phrase. His anger is vented by less violent means. He scolds, complains, perhaps makes a show of fighting when he thinks there will be no response, and talks of his past fights rather than endeavoring to engage in present or future ones. His immorality is largely of a negative, listless sort, unless forced to what he considers self-defense, through the vividness of his hallucinations, illusions, or suspicions, when he will kill or do anything to protect himself. Footnote. G. R. Wilson, Drunkenness, page 33, says, Violence of a serious kind is rarely met with except during intoxication, or in some of the forms of alcoholic insanity but impulsive promptings to violent acts are common with nearly all drunkards. Fits of passion are frequent, and trifling provocations evoke a wholly disproportionate expression of the feeling." End footnote. We now pass to the subject which requires most of our attention in this chapter, that of the responsibility of the alcoholic. We wish first to ask the question, is the alcoholic responsible for what he does? He acts mostly in an intoxicated condition or semi-intoxicated condition for alcohol remains in the system for 48 hours after it is taken. He is seldom completely sober, and if so, is not normal. The question really is whether he is abnormal to such degree as to be irresponsible. We do not refer to the dipsomaniac, whose very name shows himself to be considered irresponsible, nor do we refer to those in the early stages of drunkenness, for these would probably be considered by all as responsible. But we refer to the chronic drunkard. There is no doubt from what we have said in the description given that the chronic drunkard is in a disease condition, for the brain and whole nervous system is so affected as not to function in a normal and proper manner. What has been said in this chapter shows that the alcoholic does not receive the moral impressions which he otherwise would if his mind were normal. Neither is he able to judge the claims of family, friends, and society. The question still remains as to the extent of the irresponsibility. Before we go further, let us quote the conditions as given by two different persons under which one is responsible. First, responsibility presupposes, one, a justly binding authority, two, knowledge in the agent of the just will of the authority, three, power either to perform or abstain from this act. If any of these be absent, responsibility in the full sense no longer exists. Second, responsibility presupposes 1. One who has in possession his natural powers of mind. 2. One who is competent to choose his own course of conduct in relation to himself, society, and the law. To approve or disapprove. To follow or refuse to follow certain courses. The decision having been formed in the light of his own reason and free will. Now, most persons would agree that when an alcoholic is intoxicated, he does not come under these conditions, that he is suffering from temporary insanity and hence not responsible. This is in a large measure true, yet there is doubt about the total irresponsibility when intoxicated, providing he is responsible when sober. The drunkard is like the hypnotized person who knows to a certain extent that he is playing a part, and while he has not command of his faculties in the same way as when sober, he is yet in much the same condition as far as his knowledge of right and wrong is concerned, and even in the performance of it. The man who commits a murder in a state of drunken frenzy is responsible for his irresponsibility. Yes, but is that all? All drunkards are equally irresponsible when intoxicated. And according to this statement, all would be alike punishable. But when the person, afraid to commit a crime in his unintoxicated state, becomes intoxicated in order that he may do it, carrying out the plan which he has conceived in his sober moments, 
he seems to be responsible not for his irresponsibility but for his responsibility this may be the exceptional case but if it be possible to guide actions during intoxications into criminal why not also into virtuous channels criminal action is to be regarded as but the expression of a long previous course of criminal thought for which in so far as he could otherwise have directed it the individual may legitimately be held responsible just as he is for his actions committed in the state of intoxication in which he has temporarily lost by his own voluntary act the power of self-control our claim is that he is responsible for more than being intoxicated this additional factor in his responsibility being measured by his responsibility when not intoxicated for responsibility is a matter of degree the question then comes to us how far is the alcoholic if not intoxicated responsible if the description which has been given in the preceding pages of the alcoholic in an advanced stage is true we cannot consider him responsible even if not under the influence of alcohol with memory contracted so as not to remember late experiences and mature ideas with will virtually gone with his emotional nature confined to only the lower and animal emotions his moral nature warped or destroyed we cannot call him a responsible being so when we make the statement that his responsibility in the intoxicated state depends upon the amount of responsibility we posit for him in his sober moments we do not put much of a burden upon him for we consider him in his present state whether drunk or practically sober to be irresponsible for his conduct anton cross mentions the case of a patient of a young girl suffering from congested liver and spleen which of course altered the state of her blood and thus for a time modified her constitution her moral character was greatly altered by it she ceased to feel any affection for father or mother her temper changed became capricious and violent would we hold this girl blameworthy for her lack of love to her parents or responsible for her conduct which was clearly the result of physical causes assuredly not no more should we hold the alcoholic who is diseased in every cell responsible for his conduct he is as irresponsible as any person whose mind is diseased we would say irresponsible even as far as reform is concerned the further question comes to us regarding his responsibility is he responsible for his present condition this is the chief question after all a man is diseased when drunk but is he diseased when sober and just about to drink knowing the effects of it or is he vicious the voluntary act of taking intoxicants sufficient to induce inebriety or intoxication is a vice for which the individual is morally responsible in the word voluntary is contained the whole question again does voluntarily take it or does it not allow another quotation your remarks are just they are indeed too true but i can no longer resist temptation if a bottle of brandy stood on one hand and the pit of hell yawned at the other and i were convinced that i would be pushed in as soon as i took one glass i could not refrain you are very kind i ought to be very grateful for so many kind good friends but you may spare yourself the trouble of trying to reform me the thing is out of the question we can well see that when a person has gotten to that stage he is not responsible for his drinking we must look further back and ask why should a person drink we are emphasizing heredity less than was formerly done perhaps we are swinging to the other extreme and minimizing its importance in disease the difficulty has been rather in the matter of theory than in the domain of facts there has been a desire too plainly evident to ignore the facts if they do not tend to substantiate the theory in which one is inclined to believe in the case of the alcoholic with those who believe in the old naive theory of heredity there has been no trouble but the followers of wiseman have had some difficulty in reconciling the theory and the facts which seem so evident fortunately in this case it is not a matter of controversy concerning the transmission of acquired characteristics for explanations eliminating this discussion have been given which not only accord better with the facts but tend to solve the riddle in a more satisfactory manner while some investigators claim that the question is one of chronic disturbance of nutrition 
in the alcoholic parent or parents which manifests itself in the sexual nature, and especially in the production of offspring mentally and physically weakened. The hypothesis of which Professor Forel is the principal exponent is steadily gaining ground. The contention of the latter is that in alcoholism we need not concern ourselves with the theories of heredity, for here we have a direct poisoning of the germplasm by means of the alcohol circulating in the blood, and thus the delicate cells composing the plasm are prevented from developing into a stable organism. The blood and lymph which convey to the sexual organs the nourishment necessary for the development of the germplasm carry also the poisoning properties of alcohol, and on account of the susceptible condition of the plasm during its growth, it is retarded in its normal development. The strength of the solution of alcohol may, yes, must make a difference in the injurious effects of the plasm, and consequently on the prospective offspring. The healthy contribution of the other parent may tend to overcome the threatened degeneration, but if both parents are likewise affected, the injury is not only uncompensated, but is multiplied. Add to this the alcohol contributed in the fetal life by the mother, and degeneration is almost inevitable. The question between the direct poisoning of the germ at the time of conception and the progressive poisoning of the germ plasm during development is one between the moderate or occasional drinker and the chronic alcoholic. It seems likely that both classes affect their offspring, but that the latter would be the most disastrous without doubt. On the other hand, some facts tend to show that alcohol in the system at the time of conception is not without evil effects. Modern science is substantiating Diogenes in his saying to the stupid boy, Young man, thy father must have been very drunk when thy mother conceived thee. Dr. Dom Bezola, in an address delivered before the Vienna Anti-Alcoholic Congress, said, Having at hand within my own community, Graubunden, 68 cases of imbecility of various grades, I undertook a preparatory investigation among these, and arrived at the astonishing result that one half of their births fell upon days following forty weeks after periods of alcoholic plenty, New Year's, the carnival, and grape gathering, that is to say, within an aggregate of fourteen weeks, while the remaining half was distributed rather evenly through the remaining thirty-eight weeks of the year. It was found also that the number of births was lower than the average during these 14 weeks. A detailed study of imbecile school children throughout all Switzerland confirmed the result of this investigation. End of chapter 8, part 1. This reference to imbecility shows that simple drinking of the parents prior to conception produces an unstable nervous organism in the children. Physical deformities are less frequent results, but it is mental troubles with which we are concerned in our study. Why should the nervous system exhibit most frequent and serious defects? We could give the same reason for this in the germ and embryo as in the adult. The proportion of the germ which shall develop into the nervous system is the latest product of evolution and most intricate in structure. It is therefore less stable and consequently more easily deranged and injured. The nutritive functions may be perfect in the offspring, for they are long established and more firmly set in the line of development. The higher delicately formed, comparatively lately evolved portions, with the lines of development unstable, first give way under the power of the alcoholic poison. When heredity is spoken of in connection with alcoholism, it is generally understood to imply that a person has inherited an unstable nervous system which, after he has begun to drink, causes such a craving for the effects of alcohol as to render it difficult, if not impossible, for the partaker to refrain. We do not mean that a person is born a drunkard, that is, but a figure of speech, but he may become a drunkard on account of his heredity after voluntary indulgence. The altered condition of the nervous system of the children of alcoholics forms a predisposing cause of alcoholism only awaiting the exciting cause to show itself in full force. It should be noticed in distinction from this, we have some reported cases of true inherited alcoholism, which develop during fetal life, at any period from conception to birth. In these cases we find the same effects in the children, who never have drunk as might be expected, 
in those whose systems have been ruined both physically and mentally by alcohol. Concerning this, we quote the following. The subjects of hereditary alcoholism have symptoms from birth. Their general constitution is feeble. They lack resistive power to infection. They succumb easily to gastroenteritis, bronchitis, meningitis, etc. Some writers think that in large commercial and industrial centers about 50% of the children die before the end of the third year, and convulsions is one of the most frequent causes. Parental alcoholism is the dominating cause of the enormous infantile mortality among the working classes of Russia, Belgium, and France. Those who survive the first few years of life generally show some marked defect, symptoms of digestive, respiratory, or nervous disorders, with consequent liability to some form of disease, such as tuberculosis or meningitis. In some cases of hereditary alcoholism, the more common characteristics of alcoholism may manifest themselves in a child, such as tremor or increased mucus secretion. Later in life, hysteria, neurasthenia, epilepsy, and chorea are very prevalent. In regard to epilepsy, Bourneville has observed that in 163 families in which either the father or mother was addicted to alcohol, 244 children suffered from epilepsy, and Korvalowski has noted 100 epileptics in 60 families. Various forms of mental disease, such as imbecility, idiocy, feeble intellect, and memory are very common, and even some forms of gross cerebral disease, such as malformations, hydrocephalus, microcephalus, etc. observed. Later, some of the more marked forms of mental disease, such as melancholia and mania, have been expected. The most common mental characteristics of such children are feeble memory, inability to learn, and a certain want of perception of the ordinary duties of life. According to Morel, idiocy does not appear until about third or fourth year. Whatever be our theories, the fact seems evident. There is no lack of medical experience to confirm the contention that the children of an alcoholic parent or parents are more liable to indulge in alcoholic excess than the offspring of temperate parents. Further, we have the testimony of some physicians and specialists to the fact that there is actually an acquired taste for alcohol in children, which is accountable only to the supposition of heredity of some form or other. Notice the following statements. A strong intoxication impulse has been manifested at a very early age in some instances. Children of four, five, six, or seven have drunk eagerly and to drunkenness on the very first occasion when drink was given to them, while the other children with them have evinced no such eagerness. Children can directly inherit the tendency to drink. Therefore, it happens not infrequently that cases of genuine dipsomania occur at the early age of four or five years. Cohn, Madden, Moreau, and others have recorded cases of alcoholic delirium in children between the ages of five to eight years. Hereditary taint may be traced in a very large proportion of alcoholic cases, it is said in nearly a moiety. The children of drunkards are extremely susceptible to the influence of alcohol. A quantity which would not affect ordinary persons intoxicates them and produces results not so readily seen in more normal persons. The crave for alcohol seems to be handed down to them, and they take to drink as a duck to water. The matter of environment must also be considered, for where there are inebriate parents, the children undoubtedly will come in frequent or constant contact with alcoholic beverages when they are young. Making all allowance for this factor, the fact of heredity is still quite evident. Let us look at some statistics. Dr. Carruthers, chairman of a committee for the study of heredity and alcoholism, appointed by the Association for the Study and Cure of Inebriety, reported on 1,744 cases, 1,300 of which had come under his personal care and observation. Of the whole number, 1,080 had a distinct history of heredity. The 1,080 were divided as follows. 430, about one quarter of the whole number, were classed as direct heredities, where the drinking of parents or grandparents reappeared in the children. 224, more than one-eighth of the whole number, were classed as indirect heredities. 
They usually were persons whose grandparents, or one or two generations back, had been moderate or occasional excessive users of spirits. In many instances, the father had a short drink period in early life, and then became an abstainer, or both parents had drunk wine at meals for a certain period, or the mother had been given wine or spirits during pregnancy, lactation, or for some other particular illness. 290, one-sixth of the total number were placed under the classification of psychopathic heredity, in whom some defect of brain or nervous system seems to persist generation after generation. 49 were grouped under epileptoid types of heredity. These cases were marked by sudden unexpected and self-limited drink storms. Dr. C. L. Dana of New York says, Among 350 patients whom I questioned on the subject, I found that drinking habits existed in one or both parents, in all but 10, 97.5%. Father was usually the drinker. In eight cases, both parents drank. In one case, the mother only was an inebriate. The patients were largely of foreign birth and descent, however, and drinking was a natural habit, so that very great importance cannot be attached to this fact. In another series of 210 cases, the percentage was much lower. Among the total, 25% gave a negative hereditary history. Among 30 periodical inebriates, in two-thirds, there was a distinct history of heredity. In 14, the father drank. In 8, both parents drank. Of 600 patients at Fort Hamilton, 265 had inebriate family history, and 38 were descended from families where there had been insanity. Of the cases treated in Dr. Stewart's private asylum, in 44%, one of the parents or grandparents had taken alcohol to excess, and in a large number of the remainder, there was a history of either epilepsy, insanity, or tuberculosis. Dr. Kerr found 50% of his cases had inebriate diathesis. W. Bevan Lewis examined 344 cases, of which 37% showed inebriate or neurotic inheritance and 27% insanity. At Darl Rimple, there were found 134 cases of inebriate inheritance and 26 of insane. Out of one group, 2,905 cases treated in America and England, mentioned by Kerr, no fewer than 1,374 had a family history of previous inebriety. If there is any allowance to be made in these statistics, it must be in favor of the thesis that there is a relation between alcoholism and heredity, because it is so difficult to get the facts. The alcoholic not infrequently endeavors to protect his mother's good name and denies her alcoholism, while secret drinking or the simple presence of alcohol at the time of conception may be unknown. One thing to be noticed in the above statistics is the frequent assumption of atavism. It has been the grandparents or great-grandparents who have indulged to excess. Hence, the alcoholism in the offspring. Footnote. Dr. Langrain's investigations on alcoholic inheritance are tabulated as follows. In the first generation from inebriety, the mental and physical degenerates were 77% of all. In the second generation, 96% were defective. In the third generation, not one escaped. All were idiots, insane, hysteric, or epileptic. From the Medical Press, 1903, we quote, The opinion of experts on the subject goes to show that when alcoholism becomes hereditary, the whole family is doomed, neurosis appearing in the second generation, epilepsy and other forms of mental instability in the third, actual imbecility and ultimate extinction in the fourth. End footnote. This would entail some theory of heredity, for the germ poisoning by alcohol would hardly account for this phenomenon. Footnote. Some are very outspoken in their opinions concerning the transmission of acquired characteristics, especially as far as alcoholism is concerned. Kerr Inebriety, pages 187 forward, gives the opinions of numerous specialists who uphold this view. End pages 194 forward. He cites cases of transmitted drink craze, perhaps the following from T.B. Hislop, Alcoholic Insanity, A System of Medicine, all but volume 9, page 322, would help to reconcile the two opposed ideas. The majority of drinkers are 
disposed to drink by heredity. In 100 recent cases of alcoholic insanity admitted to Bethlehem, no less than 67 had a neurotic inheritance. 32 had a family history of alcoholism. In eight cases only, there was a history of alcoholism without insanity in the parents. Alcoholism without insanity and other neurosis in the parents is more rarely followed by alcoholism in the offspring than when other neurosis in the parents are, are contingent factors. Alcoholism in the parents is, however, a common factor in determining the occurrence of other neurosis in the offspring. And footnote. Dr. Solier presents the four following conclusions as a result of his study on heredity. One, between dipsomania heredity insanity on the one hand and alcoholism called acquired on the other hand, there exists an intermediate form of the propensity for alcoholic drink. This intermediate form of alcoholism by heredity, it is certainly more frequent than dipsomania and tends more and more to encroach upon the domain of acquired alcoholism. That is, alcoholism by heredity may be found to have pre-existed in cases heretofore interpreted as simply acquired alcoholism. Two, the heredity of alcoholism may be either by similars or dissimilars. The relative frequency of these forms is as three to four. Three, alcoholism by heredity belongs to the neuropathic family and more especially to its psychopathic branch. Four, the causes which produce the outbreak of alcoholism in subjects having hereditary taint and more particularly in the progeny of subjects who themselves have alcoholism are merely accidental or apparent and are far from having the influence which have been attributed to them. The only true cause is heredity, which creates the predisposition, the impulse, and a condition of intellect and feeling in the subject which render them incapable of resistance. We can further see the abnormal condition of the offspring of alcoholics by noticing the great number of degenerates of different kinds to be found among them. A presiding judge of one of the Chicago courts, among other things relating to the use of alcoholic drinks, said, of all the boys in the reform school and the various reformatories about the city, 95% are the children of parents who died through drink or became criminals through the same cause. Of the insane and demented cases disposed of here in the court, Every Thursday, a moderate estimate is that 90% are from the effects of alcohol. The sandbaggers, murderers, and thugs generally today are prosecuted in the police courts and criminal courts are sons of parents who fell victims to drink. I know whereof I speak. Demi found that the direct posterity of 10 families of drunkards amounted to 57 children. 25 died soon after birth. Of the remainder, six were idiots, five dwarfs, five epileptics, one each had chorea, chronic hydrocephalus, hair lip, and club foot. Two of the epileptics became alcoholics. In ten normal families, which he examined for comparison, among 61 children, five died soon after birth. Four suffered from curable nervous affections. Two had congenital defects. 81.9% were sound in mind and body during childhood and youth, while in the alcoholic families the percentage was 17.5. Professor Delman's famous study in the hereditary inebriety naturally occurs to us. Ada Jerk, who died at the beginning of last century, at about 60 years of age, was a drunkard, a thief, and a vagabond. Seventy-five years later, her progeny was found to consist of 834 persons of whom the history of 700 has been studied. Of this number, there have been 106 illegitimate children, 144 mendicants, 64 sustained by charity, 181 prostitutes, and 76 criminals, among whom seven were assassins. In 75 years, this single family has cost in maintenance expenses of imprisonment and interest one and one quarter million dollars. Nothing is so deplorable in all investigation of the pernicious effects of alcohol as the fact that the offspring must suffer so severely for the craving and indulgence of the parents. Footnote. The writer has read Dr. G. A. Reed's most interesting and dogmatic, yet far from convincing treatise, Alcoholism. Even were we prepared to accept Dr. Reed's thesis in toto, it would not in the least change our conclusions.
regarding the moral responsibility of the drunkard for whether the alcoholic tendency is inborn or acquired in the parent if transmitted to the child the latter is equally responsible in both cases for a discussion of dr reed's principal points c w f robertson evolutionary pathology of chronic alcoholism british journal of inebriety 1904 and footnote and so frequently we find that the child is injured far more seriously than the parent on account of the latter's alcoholism some time ago the liquor journal set before us a man of 91 years of age a farmer living out of doors and working moderately he had drunk a pint of spirits daily for 60 years and was apparently hale and hearty never having had any illness the harmlessness of the continued use of pure whiskey was thereby proven an investigation brought out these facts the man was of inferior intelligence with a large physical frame and inclined to follow very methodical habits of living while the effects of his drinking were not prominent in his appearance they were very evident in his children of three children by his first wife two died in infancy one became epileptic and died at fifteen of four children by his second wife one is feeble-minded the second choreic the third is dissolute and drinks the fourth is erratic and passionate and a wanderer all are decidedly inferior both physically and mentally beside the degeneration in alcoholics children already spoken of the abnormality of genius is sometimes the result of alcoholic heredity among men of letters dr byron and poe are two prominent examples from all departments of life examples could be given which as can readily be seen show the degenerating effects as clearly as any other abnormality footnote children of alcoholic parents inherit nervous instability if nothing else often they show great extremes of activity and prostration while neurotics they are often brilliant lead in their classes and are prematurely developed all such children show great extremes of energy and exhaustion with faintness and debility their training should be very careful no tea coffee meat broths or alcohol should enter the diet no attempt to treat every symptom of exhaustion with drugs or foods they are very precarious in their nervous organization and unless brought up in the most careful manner will become inebriates quarterly journal of inebriety volume 25 page 267 and footnote while we recognize that predisposition is assured in some cases we should also recognize that by proper treatment especially in the young this predisposition can be checked or pointed in other directions some persons advocate the removal of the children of alcoholics from their homes because of the detriment of adding the power of alcoholic environment to that of heredity unfortunately alcohol does not limit the power of procreation until after the usual period of reproduction and thoughtless reproduction of degenerates is promoted we are as yet so fond of the shadow called liberty that all kinds of degenerates marry and throw upon the public ever-increasing multiplication of their kind fortunately for the good of the race alcoholism is found most frequently among the men because inebriety in the mother on account of the forty weeks of foetal life over which her organism has uncontrollable influence is much more disastrous it has been said that when the father has been a drunkard it is rather the moral nature of the offspring which is altered when the taint is on the mother's side that the brain and nerves are particularly liable to suffer the mother's influence is said to be more powerful of the two not only do we find that the alcoholic female has more influence over the offspring but we are told that in regard to heredity there appears to be a greater tendency for the female children to be affected by insanity they break down more rapidly and from slighter causes than the males dr w c sullivan has made some investigations concerning the children of female inebriates his results show that the maternal alcoholism has surprising effects upon the offspring the women examined were mostly inmates of the liverpool prison 120 of whom had produced 600 children of these 265 44.2 percent lived over two years and 335 55.8 percent died under two years or were dead born in over 60 percent of the children dying in infancy the assigned cause of death was convulsions for a comparison the progeny of sober mothers was also examined 
Drunken mothers, 21 cases, gave birth to 125 children, of whom 69, 55.2%, died under two years. Sober mothers, 28 cases, gave birth to 138 children, of whom 33, 23.9%, died under two years. In 80 of the cases, the number of children each family reached or exceeded three. Classing these children in the order of their birth, we can see the progressive death rate in the alcoholic family. This table shows the progressive degeneration of the alcoholic mother, which can only be brought about by the accumulative effects of continued indulgence. The nervous degeneracy in the surviving children was examined only on one point. Of the children in the series, 219 lived beyond infancy, and of these, 4.1% became epileptics. Many of the others counted here as non-epileptic had not reached the age at which epilepsy most commonly appears, but the percentage here given is vastly in the excess of its frequency in the general population. The facts brought out in the investigation leave no room to doubt the effect of alcoholism upon reproduction, and in these statistics the poisoning of the germ and the foetus seems to be the cause most readily assignable and acceptable rather than heredity. Regardless of what our theory of the latter may be, many physicians are awakening to the extent of the danger of alcoholic maternity, and the medical journals are sounding a note of warning. The danger is seen not only in chronic alcoholism, but in the habit of alcoholic drinking as a panacea for every pain or ill of pregnancy. Coupled with this, although we recognize that it is not a question of heredity, we have what has been called infantile acquired alcoholism. This is connected with the question of heredity, because it comes under the category of alcoholism, for which the subject is not responsible, and for which he cannot be blamed. We refer to the alcohol acquired through nursing, or directly administered to infants for the supposed medicinal or soothing effect. Some physicians have reported cases of complete intoxication in nursing children through alcohol acquired in the milk and further state that the children of the alcoholic mothers are hardly sober for weeks. The following is descriptive of the acquisition of alcoholism in infants. The most frequent source of acquired alcoholism is lactation. Alcohol is conveyed to the infant with the milk in proportion to the amount taken. The researches of Klingman, Roman, and Niccolo have shown that alcohol passes into the milk, whatever be the quantity consumed. According to Valen, it is common in Paris to give nursing women a liter or more of wine, often of the stronger and more generous kind. Not infrequently, in addition, an unlimited amount of beer is given. It is supposed that alcoholic beverages consumed by the nurse impart strength and vigor to the infant, whereas the opposite is the case. In several countries, Belgium, Russia, and parts of France, it is the custom to soothe the cries of infants by giving them a piece of sugar steeped in kirch. Eau de vie or gin, and tied up in a piece of rag, which they can suck, sometimes a piece of bread or biscuit, steeped in some form of alcohol, is given in the same manner. In some parts the mothers give the children a teaspoon of grog, to put them to sleep. Wine is regarded as beneficial during dentition, and in some parts of Austria it is regarded as indispensable for teething children. The least indisposition, colds, colic, or headache, is regarded by some as calling for alcohol. The symptoms of acquired infantile alcoholism differ from those of the adult and the greater intensity of the toxic effect, especially on the nervous system. Footnote. L. R. Robinovich, Infantile Alcoholism, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 25, pages 232 forward. In regard to alcoholism acquired in infancy and later, G. H. McMichael, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 25, page 48, says, I am probably well within the mark in saying that for one man who is born with the alcoholic susceptibility, there are three who are educated to excessive drinking by their environment. End footnote. After this discussion of heredity, we can well return to the question of responsibility, better prepared to answer it. If there were a definite reply to the query concerning heredity, we could still better place the responsibility. At least, we must recognize one thing most clearly, and that is that the children of alcoholics are in a less favorable condition to resist any strain or any temptation. 
We can all admit that much. Some, though, would go to the other extreme and ask questions like the following, which imply the answer in themselves. Where lodges the responsibility for viciousness, profligacy, or crime in the grandchildren of a drunkard? And who would hold that the offspring of an inebriate mother, saturated with alcohol before their birth, are in any way personally responsible for the nervous or moral diseases that come into the world with them and cling to them through life? Footnote. J.D. Quackenboss, Hypnotism, etc., page 84. We also quote the following equally or more extreme views. J.F. Leidenson, Toxemius and their relations to alcoholism, narcotic inebriety and intoxication, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, volume 25, pages 255 forward, says, The intolerance manifests concerning inebriety as a physical disease is an illustration of the intellectual reversion of modern Dead Sea, atmosphere which obstructs every advance. The moral factor in inebriety bears no more relation to its causation than it does to typhoid fever. The moralist who claims that the inebriate willfully took the first drink, hence is responsible, is as logical as the accusation would be of the typhoid fever patient who voluntarily drank water containing the germs of the disease. Admitting that in certain cases, an insatiable craving for spirits is a result and not the cause of inebriety. The physician must accept the conditions as he finds them. I. Ray, Mental Hygiene, pages 91 forward, says, We find it hard to hold a child accountable in any moral point of view for inherited tendency to drunkenness, as we should to blame him for inheriting gout or asthma. End footnote. Here, not only alcoholism, but other defects and crimes are charged to alcoholism. There appears to be a pathological circle, the alcoholism begetting, if not in its kind, then epilepsy, insanity, or some other nervous affliction. On the other hand, these nervous troubles in the parent not infrequently predispose the children to alcoholism. Besides, what one may acquire in the way of predisposition, certain diseases and injuries may change the nervous system in such a way as to make a person more liable to drink to excess if once started. Of the 600 at Fort Hamilton, 145 had syphilis, while several had been the subjects of local venereal diseases, and 42 had had some chest disease. Head and other injuries may work into the same way. While alcoholics are found in all occupations, it is generally recognized that those who are closely confined indoors are more liable to become alcoholics, and that the effect of alcohol upon them is more serious. Probably there is no cause of alcoholism. It is exciting rather than predisposing. So potent as the desire to forget pain, sorrow, trouble, and distress with which the world is so filled, the writer has met only one person who liked the taste of alcohol. It is usually distasteful, but the exhilarating effect is what is sought. The businessman is overworked and depressed. The laborer is fatigued and discouraged. The wanderer is cold and poor. None of them may have the nervous energy sufficient to overcome these feelings. So they seek relief outside. They can all forget their misery for a small sum and be happy for a short time at least. These people cannot reach higher pleasures. They may have neither the means nor inclination for other kinds of enjoyment. This is the panacea for all woes. It is the great struggle for existence which depresses so many, and those who are least fortunate in the struggle seek for one moment of forgetfulness. When pain and strain are pressing upon them, alcohol is set before them as presenting the opportunity for relief and their faith in it is unbounded. Women are often led to drink by neuroasthenia, brought about by overwork and lack of nutrition. Dysmenorrhea is also a cause of indulgence, and social demands call for something to brace or paralyze. People who afterwards become alcoholics frequently have less freedom than others. Their ideals are bounded by a very narrow horizon. Intoxication has been held up to them as a supreme joy. The obviously criminal population is always largely made up of a class that, on account of discouraging environment, relatively great susceptibility to impulsive consideration and a low degree of intelligence, has on the average a less degree of freedom. This can well be said of the drinking class. On account of their circumstances, they cannot do the things which they often wish to do. It is not only the lower classes of which this may be said, but many men of genius seem 
to crave strong excitement, which it is possible to acquire by this means. They have that craving for intensity of consciousness which accompanies culture and high ideals. The other great exciting cause of alcoholism is sociability. People start to drink to be social, and half of the drinking starts in this way. In Darimple, 147 out of 315 began drinking in this way, with Dr. Kerr, 46%. With the cases which the writer has examined, 55% began drinking socially. And closely related to this cause, especially among businessmen, the drinking customs of business and trade form an important factor in inciting causes. Footnote. In the investigations made by Partridge, American Journal of Psychology, Volume 11, pages 343 forward, he found the causes for intoxication as follows. The usual motives which lead to intoxication are, one, a desire for excitement, experience, and abandon, to increase companionship, to put off reserve in the presence of others, a desire to heighten the social feeling. Two, to kill pain, to calm moral distress, to overcome fatigue, a desire for temporary relief from poverty and monotony, to increase courage or overcome self-consciousness, to steady the nerves for work or unusual strain. And footnote. The environment of a man very largely makes his character. When a person is brought up, where the custom is for everyone to drink, the family around him drinking, his whole environment saturated with alcohol. Is he to blame for his indulgences? Is he responsible if he goes too far? He desires to rise above his low plane of feeling. He wants an exaltation of his whole nature. He wants freedom of mental power. He is striving for an ideal. The only means he knows of realizing it is through alcohol. He drinks, he continues to drink, he becomes a slave to drink. Is he responsible? Some have gone so far as to say that the excessive strain of our 20th century civilization requires stimulants, and man, as the only animal which uses stimulants, has reached the high plane on which he stands by the use of the brain stimulant, which puts him above the other animals. The races of men which use the most stimulants have developed far more and have outstripped their abstemious brothers in the mental race. The use of alcohol is not only a necessity but a virtue. The highest man must be the most stimulated man, and he must also be the most responsible. But do we find it so? Is he not least responsible because of his indulgence? Notwithstanding all that has been said about heredity, environment, and other causes, we believe that the person who drinks may be responsible, responsible for every drink which he takes up to a certain period in his career when he is unable to stop himself, then responsible for having gotten himself in that condition for a certain time drinking is a vice and later becomes a disorder. How long a drinker is vicious depends upon the case. It may be until he has finished his first glass or it may be for years. We cannot class all alcoholics together and say that they are equally responsible, but we must consider the individual. Usually the fault is on the side of blaming the irresponsible rather than of pitying the responsible. Yet we do not wish to clear all alcoholics with the sweeping proclamation of their irresponsibility. Footnote. In the report of the Committee upon Heredity of Inebriety of the Society for the Study of Inebriety, we find the following. 1. The genesis of inebriety in the individual depends on three essential factors, of which one is inborn and the others acquired. 2. The inborn factor is a capacity for enjoying the sensations evoked by indulgence in alcohol. Without it, men would not drink, for they would not enjoy drinking. 3. The acquired factors are a. A personal experience of the sensations evoked by alcohol. Without this, the acquired knowledge, this memory, no man would crave for the sensations in the sense the inebriate craves. b. The increased delight in drink which continued indulgence in drink confers, it is an essential factor. For, in Europeans at any rate, a single experience of drink rarely gives rise to a craving for it. G. A. Reed, Alcoholism, page 82, says, All men, of course, start life without craving for alcohol, and, in so far, are equal. But the essential fact remains that they differ vastly with respect to the ease with which the craving may be awakened and the strength it may attain. And footnote. 
True, we are not so free as we once thought we were. Our course is determined to a certain extent, and by our every choice we are determining it more. There is usually the time in the alcoholic's career when he could stop, when he could prevent the wreck, when he knew the way he was going, but continued. There is also the time when he comes to the point where he cannot stop, however much he may want to. No class of them have better sentiments or feel more constantly the difference between the higher and the lower path in life than the hopeless failure, the sentimentalist, the drunkards, the schemers, the deadbeats, whose life is one long contradiction between knowledge and action, and who, with full command of theory, never get to holding their limp characters erect. No one eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge as they do, as far as moral insight goes. In comparison with them, the orderly and prosperous Philistines, whom they scandalize, are sucking babes. And yet their moral knowledge, always their grumbling and rumbling in the background, discerning, commenting, protesting, longing, half resolving, never wholly resolves, never gets its voice out of the minor into the major key, or its speech out of the subjunctive into the imperative mood, never breaks the spell, never takes the helm into his hands. As far as the alcoholic is concerned, he never takes the helm into his hands, because he cannot, nor do we believe that he realizes, nearly so well as his friends, the difference between the higher and the lower paths of life. The same writer says, How many excuses does a drunkard find when each new temptation comes? It is a new brand of liquor which the interests of intellectual culture in such matters oblige him to test. Moreover, it is poured out, and it is a sin to waste it or others are drinking and it would be churlishness to refuse. Or it is but to enable him to sleep, or just to get through this job of work, or it isn't drinking, or it is because he feels cold, or it is Christmas Day, or it is a means of stimulating him to make a more powerful resolution in favor of abstinence than any he has hitherto made, or it is just this once, and once doesn't count, etc., etc., ad libitum. It is, in fact, anything you like except being a drunkard. That is a conception which will not stay before the poor soul's attention. But if he once gets able to pick out that way of conceiving from all the other possible ways of conceiving the various opportunities which occur, if through thick and thin he holds to it that this is being a drunkard and is nothing else, he is not likely to remain one long. These two statements are contradictory and neither one is wholly correct. He does not realize his true situation, and if he did, he has not power to overcome the habit of years. With his broken-down mental powers, we believe that the alcoholic is responsible in some measure for being in his condition, but probably not for staying in his state. We believe that every man ought to keep his body in good condition. He is responsible for that, for upon that depends his mental and moral condition. The alcoholic fails here in his duty in partaking of his first drink, and correspondingly as the amount of alcohol increases and the libations are more frequent. It is not in our province here to discuss the moral import of total abstinence, prohibition, and other subjects which might be suggested in dealing with the morals of the alcoholic. These come under the head of theoretical, not psychological ethics. We have tried to show the alcoholic's moral position the facts of his moral life, and his responsibility for moral conduct. With this done, however imperfectly, we must not be drawn away by the theoretical considerations, however great the temptations. We have seen very clearly, then, that the morals of the alcoholic decline as the mental states lose their integrity. All the moral qualities suffer, but so great is the alcoholic's disregard of the truth that lying has become a recognized symptom of alcoholism. As a criminal, he is not usually concerned in great crimes except as a tool, but commits all manner of lesser crimes. The question of the drunkard's responsibility depends on the fraction of responsibility when he is drunk, when comparatively sober but diseased, and when about to take a drink knowing the consequences. These problems largely hinge on the further question of heredity. Statistics seem to show that there is some transmitted characteristics which causes the child of a drunkard to be less able to control himself as far as his indulgence in alcoholic beverages is concerned. Very early in life, through lactation environment, the alcoholic may be taught to drink. 
Notwithstanding these considerations, there must be posited some responsibility, and to that extent the drunkard must be held liable. End of chapter 8, part 2 Insanity The whole of this work might be well devoted to this subject, the relation of insanity to alcoholism, for could the dreadful results of alcoholism be known as exhibited in the insane wards, it might have an inhibitory effect upon the drunkard, who is rushing headlong into the destruction which, if life is spared, so often causes a loss of the mind. At most, of course, we will endeavor to deal with the psychological aspects. Contradictory ideas are current concerning the exact relationship between alcoholism and insanity, but in the last analysis all agree that the facts show an intimate connection. Perhaps nothing shows how close this relationship is so much as the fact as stated by Kraft Ebbing, that all forms of insanity are found in intoxication, starting with one form and continuing with the course of the intoxication, we see all varieties of madness. The relation of cause and effect is not infrequently quite confusing. Sometimes insanity is charged to alcoholism, when the latter is but a symptom and not a cause. Allowing for all this uncertainty, we must admit the undoubted connection between the two, alcoholism being the cause in many instances. Some neurologists make the statement that alcoholism is the greatest contributor to insane hospitals, and although superintendents differ in opinions on the subject, the most of them agree in its being a prolific cause. Insane reports vary in the percentage of cases caused by alcoholism, but however much the divergence, the figures are not in all cases absolute differences only differences in the manner of viewing the cases. Heredity as a direct cause not infrequently means alcoholism as an indirect cause. It has been thought by some that alcohol causes insanity more frequently in the offspring of the person who drinks it than in the drunkard himself. Certainly we find a very large percentage of imbeciles and idiots have an alcoholic diathesis. Alcoholism and insanity seem to interact for not only do alcoholic parents beget imbecile, epileptic, idiotic, and insanely disposed children, but children of persons whose minds have been deranged are so affected, as far as their nervous systems are concerned, that if they start drinking, they are most liable to become alcoholics. After considerable experience and thought, Dr. Crothers says that the study of the origin of alcoholism shows that it is itself evidence of more or less unsoundness of mind, being in a large proportion of cases only a sign of slow and insidious brain disease. He further believes that when crime is committed by inebriates, the probability of mental disease is very strong. This opinion of Dr. Crothers would lead us to believe that alcoholism does not cause insanity, but is only a symptom of it. This is only one side of the question. It does not express the facts of some cases where drinking of alcohol and intoxication are but signs of the abnormality, but the other statements regarding the inverse relation are also true. The number of insane persons whose insanity can be directly traced through long continued stages of drinking and debauchery, and also the large number of persons in insane retreats whose parents have been alcoholics, add weight to the belief in this opposite relation. In some asylums, a direct relation is clearly traceable between the amount of liquor consumed in the surrounding country and the number of persons committed to the retreat. We have these figures from the Glamorgan Asylum. During the second half of the year 1871, the admission of male patients was only 24, whereas it was 47 and 73 in the preceding and succeeding half years. During the first quarter of 1873, it was 10 against 21 in 18 in the preceding and succeeding quarters. There was no corresponding difference in the female admission. There was, however, a similar experience at the prison, the production of crime as well as of insanity having diminished in a striking manner. The exceptional periods corresponded exactly with two strikes in the coal and iron industries in which Glamorganshire is extensively engaged. The laborers, therefore, had no money to spend in drinking and debauchery. Examples like this of the effect of alcohol as an exciting cause are not uncommon. There is recognized by all alienness and insanity caused by the too frequent and heavy indulgence in alcohol, 
and the lesions and changes in the brain recorded in the second chapter would lead us to conclude a priori that insanity must be the result. The description of the different faculties given in extreme cases as dealt with in the preceding chapters shows insanity plainly, a lack of memory and will, and a change in the motions and morals, such as we have described, could result in nothing else. Statistics gathered from both Europe and America, together with the opinions of some specialists, show that alcoholism must be recognized as a cause of insanity, although the exact percentage may differ in the opinions with the observers and in the different institutions, we quote fully a number of these. America, Dr. Howe, who some years ago made a careful examination, says that out of 300 idiots in Massachusetts, 145 had drunken parents. T.A. McNichol of New York reports the results of the examination of a number of children. There were 463 children of drinkers, and of these, 76% suffered from neurosis or organic disease. Of 231 children of abstainers, only 18% were thus afflicted. Dr. C. E. Stanley says, of 996 cases of insanity admitted to the Connecticut Hospital for Insane for the years 1899 and 1900, 16% of the male admissions were due directly to alcohol. Dr. O. Kopp, in 1901, referring to the investigations by the Bureau of Statistics for Labor in Massachusetts, said, Coming to the investigation of the cases of insanity, it was found that about 25% of the commitments of the insane were directly due to their alcoholic beverages used by the patient. I find in looking over the admissions to the institutions for the last year that an assigned cause of insanity was intemperance in more than 15% of the cases and that more than 10% of them were affected with alcoholic insanity. In 1902, Dr. Stearns of Hartford said that 17% of the admissions to the asylum over which he presides as superintendent were caused by the abuse of alcohol. This corresponds closely to the past history of the institution. In 1902 and 1903 at the Massachusetts State Asylum for the Insane Criminals and Offspring, there were admitted 154 cases. Of these, 62% were hard drinkers, 31% were moderate drinkers, and only 7% being abstainers. 36% had intemperate fathers and 14% intemperate mothers. What proportion of the cases were here as a direct result of alcohol? It was impossible to say. Dr. Drew, the medical director, continues, Alcoholism in the parent always means examples of mental diseases and weak-mindedness in the children provided the alcoholic tendency is not acquired somewhat late in life. An inebriate father is certainly a handicap, and an inebriate mother is a greater misfortune. But the offspring of an inebriate father and mother seems almost to be doomed from its birth. Dr. W. H. Welch says, It is important to know that the immoderate drinking of alcoholic liquor may be the first symptom of some disease, which, when later recognized, is erroneously ascribed to alcohol as the cause. It is furthermore established that many of the mental and nervous disorders of alcoholism, while they are attributable to the toxic action of alcohol, are dependent in large measure upon an underlying psychopathic constitution, excessive indulgence in alcohol rarely producing certain of these disorders in persons of normal constitution. Inebriety in the parents or more remote ancestors ranks among the important causes of this inherited instability of the nervous centers. After making the necessary large but not precisely definable allowance for the share of inherited or acquired organic or constitutional defects in the etiology of the nervous manifestations of alcohol, there still remain cases enough in which alcoholic poisoning is the cause of serious disease of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves in persons of previously normal constitution, so far as can be ascertained. In the recent report of the Committee of Fifty, Dr. Billings has an article on the relation of drink to insanity. He reports on 5,145 cases of insanity, of whom 39.03% were total abstainers. Of those cases reported from insane hospitals, the insanity was considered to be due to the influence of liquor in 1,239 cases, or 24.08%. In commenting on these figures, he says, it is certainly improbable that nearly one-quarter of the cases 
of insanity in this country are due to the use of alcohol drinks. As might be inferred from these figures, and while in a given case of an excessive drinker who becomes insane, the connection between cause and effect may be plausibly made out. It is necessary to take into careful consideration other inherited or acquired abnormalities or weaknesses of the nervous system. Dr. A. W. Dunning says, Alcohol is, next to heredity, the most common single cause of insanity. Dr. Frederick Peterson says, We may say of alcohol that it stands foremost, after heredity, as a single independent cause, 18 to 20 percent in males. Dr. H. J. Berkeley says, I would emphasize the fact that alcohol and heredity are the principal factors we have to look to in searching for the etiology of mental disorders. H. C. Burdett, speaking of Argentina in hospitals and asylums of the world, says, Cases arising from intoxication form one-eighth of the inmates, and this class of cases is met with chiefly among day laborers who form a large proportion of the patients. Great Britain, Dr. Clouston, who has observed the relation of alcoholism and sanity in Scotland for a number of years, reports that for the years 1874 to 1888, an average of 15.5% were alcoholic lunatics. In the years 1889 to 98, the average was 21.5%. In 1899, 22.5%. In 1900 to 01, 24.5%. In 1902, 28%. These averages were for the total admissions. If men alone were counted, the average would be increased about one quarter, making the admissions among men in 1902 about 35 percent. Dr. T. B. Hislop says, out of 100 cases of insanity in which alcohol was an assigned factor of causation, in only 11 could it be said that alcohol was the sole cause. In all other cases, the factors were at work such as syphilis, sexual excesses, bodily diseases, money losses, domestic griefs and worries, injuries to the head, intracranial diseases, or other conditions which were either the cause of the habit or at least as important factors as the alcohol itself in the causation of insanity. In 1900, Dr. R. Piercy Smith, in an address at Charing Cross Hospital, said, Next to heredity, alcohol figures most largely in the causes of insanity given in the commissioner's tables, accounting for 22% of the male and 9.1% of the female cases. This refers to the effect of alcohol upon the individual alone and takes no note of alcoholic inheritance as leading to the production of insanity, idiocy, alcoholism, epilepsy, or other neurosis in the offspring, though it is well known to act in this way. Dr. Wigglesworth in the annual presidential address before the Medico-Psychological Association in 1902 said, Out of the 3,445 cases of insanity which formed the basis of the foregoing analysis, a definite history of alcoholic excess unassociated with insanity in one or both parents, I have excluded more remote relations, was found in 578 instances a percentage on the whole number of 16.77. With separating the sexes, we find that the male patients show the higher figures, these amounting to 327, given a percentage of the total number of males of 19.31, while the females, 258 cases, give a percentage of 14.32. These figures do not give so high a percentage of alcoholic excess in parents as has been published by some observers, and in my opinion, they undoubtedly understate the case as regards alcohol. For excessive indulgence in this way by parents of patients is frequently denied when collateral evidence has proved it incontestably. In 1902, Dr. Robert Jones, medical superintendent in Clayberry Lunatic Asylum, London, published a paper in which were the following statistics. There are probably at the present time no less than 110,000 certified insane persons in England and Wales alone, of whom approximately about 50,000 are males and 60,000 females. If the Lunacy Commissioner's Blue Book for England and Wales be consulted, the proportionate percentage of instances in which alcohol has been assigned 
as the cause of insanity to the yearly average number admitted into asylums in the, the five years 1895 to 1900 inclusive is 21.8 for males and 9.5 for females. The proportion is much higher in Scotland. And after allowing for the deaths of those whose form of insanity is more immediately fatal than those caused by alcohol, there are, I believe, upon the lowest computation remaining in the asylums at the present time no less than 10,900 males and 5,800 females who are mentally decrepit through the effects of alcohol. During the time that the London County Council's asylum at Clayberry has been opened, from 1893 to the end of 1901, a period of less than nine years, 8,493 patients have been admitted, of whom 21.2% of the males and 126 of the females were definitely ascertained to owe their insanity to drink. A total of over 800 men and 594 women who were thus rendered incapable of productive work through their own acts. For the whole of London, during the period 1893 to 1901, 2,662 men and 1,677 women were received into asylums who owned their insanity to alcoholic intemperance. Dr. Forbes Winslow, writing in the London Daily News in 1903, says, The issue of the 57th report of the Lunacy Commissioners contains appalling and sad news. From it we gather that 32% of lunacy at the present day is caused by drink. During the last five years, the average admitted each year, the assignable cause being drink, is 3,143, by far the highest of all the physical causes. Of the total number of registered lunatics, that is, 113,964, about 36,465, are at the present moment detained as certified lunatics, whose condition has been so brought on by drink. Dr. G. H. Savage of Bethlehem Asylum says, In England, the increase of insanity is generally considered to vary directly as the increase in the consumption of alcohol. The Continent. According to the Journal of Mental Science, the Lunatic Statistics of Paris for the years 1872 to 85 show a total of admissions due to alcohol as 5,063, being 28% of the men. A. R. Kushni says, in Prussia, 886 to 88, 11 percent of the cases admitted to insane asylums were diagnosed as directly due to alcoholic excess, while in one of the Berlin asylums, the enormous percentage of 47.4 of the admissions were found to be addicted to alcohol. Kun Pontopadin, in the Dictionary of Psychological Medicine, gives the statistics at that time, 1892, for all Denmark as 10.2 percent of the insanity caused by inebriety. For Copenhagen, the percentage was 11.5. Professor Hopp of Berlin affirms that in 1899 to 1900, 41% of the admissions to an insane asylums in Prussia were chronic alcoholics or children of alcoholic parents. Dr. Jules Mossel, directing physician of the State Asylum for the Insane, Mons, Belgium, in 1900 said, in respect to the proportion of insanity caused by alcohol, one cannot appeal to the statistics of Belgium, which in general do not merit much confidence. French tables mention the proportion of 38% with men and 12% with women. It is evident that this is under the truth, since many cases of alcoholism are not officially mentioned. Not all these insane inebriates figure in statistics but we encounter many of them in prisons, workhouses, etc. Professor A. Forel in 1901 says, About three-quarters of the idiots and epileptics at Bicentury descend from alcoholic parents. The careful statistics of the Swiss Confederation show that about one-third of the male inmates of insane asylums, one-third of the male suicides, and one-tenth of the men who die at 20 or more, at least in the larger town of Switzerland, are due to the alcoholic drinking of the victim. Professor Kraepelin in 1902 said, It is well known that in the asylums for the insane in the German Empire, 10% of the patients have been committed on account of mental diseases due to alcohol. In some institutions, the number is as high as 30%, and even then these figures do not include numerous cases in which alcohol has been an exciting 
and not the primary cause of the trouble. In cases of mania, epilepsy, and paresis, in 1898, in the Heidelberg Clinic, the alcoholics formed more than 13% of the total number of patients. In the men's ward alone, the percentage being 25. When we remember that experience teaches that about one-third of the living children of alcoholic parents suffer from epilepsy, and that, according to Burnville, more than one-half the idiotic children have alcoholic parents, it is readily seen that there is sufficient reason for the state to take up the consideration of the alcoholic question, even if so much misery was not caused in many other directions by this poison. In dealing with insanity in its relation to alcohol, we will endeavor to describe the different forms of mental disorder. In some of our divisions, probably most authorities on insanity would concur, but the patients included in other divisions are classed differently by some observers. Many separate classes are formed and the divisions are made from different standpoints by various authorities. Chronic alcoholism. We need say but a few words concerning our first division. For most of this work is taken up with the description of chronic alcoholism and an endeavor to explain the injury done by it. It is not until it has progressed to its final stages that it comes under the head of insanity. Some very nice distinctions and diagnosis have to be made by examiners in lunacy to determine when the alcoholic is a subject for the insane asylum according to the laws and when not. Many of the symptoms which have been given in the preceding pages would be sufficient for the commitment of an alcoholic as a lunatic. In addition to the physical symptoms with which the reader is already familiar, we might mention marked tremor, especially of the lips, tongue, and hands, arteriosclerosis, liver and kidney diseases, peculiar sensations, headache, and dizziness, chronic alcoholism, and other forms of alcoholic insanity, which have been continued for a number of years, frequently end in dementia. We append a case and illustration. H.J. is a young man of 36 years of age. His maternal uncle died of alcoholic excesses. He attended school until 16 years old, but was rather backward in learning. His work as a mechanic, however, after leaving school, was steady and successful. He was always regarded as rather eccentric, reserved, and egotistical. He began alcoholic excesses at an early age, taking mostly beer, but latterly beer and whiskey. At 22, he lost his first position, where he had been employed for six years because of drunkenness. He then worked irregularly with his uncle on an average perhaps four days of the week, but he became so unstable that his father had to keep him under his constant surveillance and so employed him at home as an assistant in his Turkish bath establishment. Here he drank the alcohol used for massage, became a common loafer and was frequently arrested for drunkenness. At 34, he had an attack of delirium tremens. Following this, his excesses became more marked. He abused and assaulted his mother when she attempted to prevent him from drinking, cursed his father when he refused money for liquor, and even begged from patrons of the bath establishment. Finally, he began stealing bath towels, brushes, etc., which he pawned, and when intercepted in this by his parents, became enraged, accused them of using their son like a beggar, and in his anger broke furniture about the house. At this time, he was committed to the asylum. He gave evidence of markedly defective memory. After residence in the hospital for one month, he was unable to tell how long, within a month, he had been in the institution or dates of places of employment within six years. He belittled his drinking habits, was ready with a multitude of excuses for his irregularities in conduct, and failed to exhibit any feelings of shame. He was slovenly in his habits and somewhat careless in his personal appearance. He soiled his bedding in the walls of his room with tobacco and was thoroughly indolent. Physically, he presented a pronounced tremor of the tongue and hands, and his arteries, especially the forehead, were tortuous and firm. A residence at the hospital of about two months did not lead to improvement, though he left assuring us that the disgrace of having been sent to an insane hospital had brought him to his senses and that he would never drink again. His return to the old environment soon brought about excesses even greater than before, with abuse and violence, 
and he was again committed to the asylum six months later. Alcoholic somnambulism, a rare state called by different names, is found in alcoholism. It is little known and not recognized by the courts because of its infrequent appearance. It is called alcoholic trance, alcoholic hypnotism, alcoholic cerebral automatism, double personality of alcoholism, and alcoholic somnambulism. We have adopted the last name because it seems to be the most descriptive of the state. The attacks differ in length, and the principal characteristic, similar to all cases of so-called double personality, is a complete lapse of memory of the time covered by the attack. The distinguishing characteristics of a double personality are given by Binet as memory and character. The organization of a personality can only be distinguished by these factors, and yet it is very like the normal life. For if we regard consciousness and memory as the essential constituents of an ego, we may boldly say that every man conceals within himself the germs of a second personality. There is an abnormal condition during which the patient acts in an automatic manner and of which he can remember nothing when he awakes. The writer believes in but one personality, so when terms are used in this discussion denoting multiple personalities, they are to be understood to refer to abnormal states concerning which this is a common term. Beside the ordinary amnesia concerning the drunken state, there is sometimes a connected series of memories. We are already familiar with the case of the Irish porter, spoken of in the chapter on memory, who lost a parcel when he was intoxicated and was unable to remember, when he awoke where he had left it. But on again becoming intoxicated, he was able to remember the place and went and got the parcel. In addition to this serial memory, we know very well that the character is quite changed. The penurious, miserly person becomes the open-hearted spendthrift. The quite modest neighbor, when intoxicated, is a talkative, boisterous braggart. The kind and tender father is transformed into the cruel, quarreling brute. We can hardly recognize him. The person is so changed. How many wives have repeated to the writer their experience in identical language? He is so kind and good when he is himself, but when he is intoxicated it is impossible to live with him, unconsciously stating a real change of personality. This is shown in another way. Not infrequently the drunken man assumes the character of some one individual or of some class. He may be Napoleon, or simply a general, or perhaps a lawyer, or a clergyman, or some particular pugilist of wonderful prowess. Whatever character he represents himself to be, he acts out very faithfully, without doubt believing himself to be the very character which he represents. This is no more wonderful than the experience of normal consciousness, the dramatic sundering of the ego, of some actors during their performances, who afterwards say of their experience that they not only pretended to be, but really were the characters which they represented themselves to be for the time but they did not have the different states severed by memory to such a degree as the drunkard. It is not the single intoxication with which we are dealing here, but rather the state of the chronic drunkard. Why should he assume this somnambulistic state? The continued severing of the consciousness by amnesia in the single intoxication tends inevitably to create a habit of mind and brain of such a character that the experience is divided and the individual may spend a great part of his life in the second or abnormal state. We find not only that the alcoholism tends to produce a second personality, but conversely the drinking habit is started and kept up when the person is abnormal so that it may be continued when he again reaches the normal state. It is interesting in this regard to notice what may be an indirect effect of alcoholism. In the case of Emile X, given by Binet, we observe that her father was a drunkard. The explanation of why this disseverance of consciousness comes to the alcoholic will be more fully dealt with when we speak of the reason why an alcoholic is easily hypnotized. Let us turn our attention more particularly to a description of alcoholic somnambulism. It usually comes after a long debauch during which the patient has imbibed much alcohol. It is not ushered in by any particular symptoms. 
the beginning is usually started when a person comes to himself by saying the last i remember was evidently the transition from the normal state is sudden and quiet causing no notice from others and being accompanied by no alarming symptoms during the attack the subject does not appear drunk although he may consume vast quantities of alcoholic liquors he may seem perfectly normal talk with friends travel transact business and may attend social functions without attracting any attention if examined by a person who is well acquainted with him and who was also familiar with hypnotic somnambulism no doubt the same slight but characteristic changes might be present as example given the fixed look haggard and dim eyes and immobility of countenance usually the state is betrayed by some extraordinary act not infrequently murder or some other crime there may be simply strange actions of a puerile nature and an apparent loss of speech or hearing but most frequently crime is a result or at least we hear most of cases of this kind a young man after a few glasses of cider and a drink of gin wandered aimlessly about and deliberately shot a man when he recovered he was entirely unconscious of the occurrence yet he did not appear drunk when the shooting took place a merchant a heavy wine drinker drank champagne at his club and his mind became confused he recovered two weeks later having married in the meantime and visited several cities he drank heavily all the time his mind appeared clear and nothing unusual was noticed in his manner in conversation but no memory of the time was retained later on another occasion he came to himself on the ocean having taken passage for liverpool the last he remembered was drinking with a friend in boston a traveling salesman recovered after a week of which he could remember nothing during which he attended to his business and nothing unusual was noticed lloyd tuckey cites the following case alcoholic intoxication is sometimes accompanied by distinct double personality but this is rarely so well marked as in the case of a farmer referred to by professor ball this man was a dipsomaniac and frequently got drunk while attending the markets in this state however he continued to transact business and apparently with considerable judgment and ability but on becoming sober he would be quite unconscious of what had taken place and his business suffered severely in consequence he hit upon the idea of keeping a notebook for use during his drunken state and he found that by doing so he was able to preserve a written record of his operations which supplied the hiatus in his memory the resume of several cases has been given in order that the general condition might be portrayed no doubt defenses of amnesia and ignorance are frequently made in the courts when they are not justified by the acts but this should not debar us from recognizing genuine cases of this nature some are inclined to think that when a man appears all right and is able to transact business etc the plea of amnesia and consequent abnormality and irresponsibility is but a subterfuge but we have many cases showing similar phenomena post epileptic states may show the same characteristics especially that of amnesia everyone is familiar with the real somnambulist sleepwalker he accomplishes feats of strength and skill solves problems etc but of them he is absolutely unconscious when he awakes in the morning closely connected with this is the somnambulism of the hypnotic state and there is reason to think that this alcoholic somnambulism and that of hypnotism are closely allied on account of the suggestibleness frequently found in this condition the following case clearly illustrates this p et thirty one no fixed occupation mother died of a fit said to have been demented some time before her death a cousin on the maternal side idiotic another committed suicide a brother suffered convulsions in childhood prisoner was always idle and unstable lost several engagements through drunkenness drinking for over ten years before the crime was once convicted summarily for drunkenness had had rheumatic fever and syphilis and suffered from mitral disease three days before the crime prisoner took a room in a brothel and went on a steady drinking bout with one of the girls of the house on the day of the crime in the afternoon he went out with this girl having had some drink in a tavern they entered a cab directing the driver to take them back to the brothel on arriving there 
P. got out of the cab and told the driver that he had killed the girl and that she had asked him to do so. She was stabbed in the heart with a penknife. P. could give no further account of the affair. The woman told him to stab her, and he obeyed as one might in a dream. There is also a case reported by Prosper Despine, where one of the four drunkards who were conversing together suggested the hanging of the most intoxicated of the party, a suggestion promptly carried out, with results which only failed of being fatal through the accident of outside intervention. These attacks may last any length of time, from a few minutes to months, and when the patient awakes, he may be familiar with his surroundings and think no time, or at most a night, has passed, but there is usually a very surprised expression when he comes to himself. Alcoholic Epilepsy Besides aggravating the ordinary forms of epilepsy, alcoholic excess may give rise to epileptic attacks. This is seen in children of alcoholics, or those who have unstable nervous systems. After several debauches, the attacks most frequently appear. Berkeley says as high as 8 or 10 percent of alcoholics have eventually epileptic seizures. This state is closely connected with the alcoholic somnambulism, as ordinary epilepsy is related to somnambulism. In fact, somnambulism states may be but equivalents of epileptic seizures. It is also connected with delirium tremens, as is shown by the following from Wernicke. Of the complications of delirium tremens, that with epilepsy needs to be especially mentioned. The epileptic seizures of the inebriate are a sign of alcoholic degeneration of the brain, like delirium tremens. According to the experiences in our clinic, they generally occur 36 to 48 hours before the outbreak of the delirium, following an excess, and in case complete abstinence is affected, to be entirely wanting subsequently. At the clinic, alcoholic epileptic seizures most always occur only on the first days following admission. If we have, therefore, as it frequently happens, to constate the consequences of the epileptic seizure, bitten tongue, etc., on admission, we have the task, if possible, to effect total abstinence. Bonhoeffer has referred to this almost uniform relation. Alcoholic amnesia. Some writers lay considerable emphasis upon one form of alcoholic mental disorder which manifests itself principally by an almost total lack of memory for recent events. Other investigators deal with this form under the rubric of Korsakow's disease. This usually accompanies polyneuritis, insomnia, loss of appetite, and defective nutrition. It begins suddenly with excitement, the patient being confused, disoriented, restless, and anxious, and having some hallucinations of sight. Only the events of early life are remembered, the events of the day or even the previous minute being forgotten. He asks the same question and relates the same facts over and over again, and knows not whether he has had meals, taken a walk, or received a visitor directly after these things have taken place. He loses all account of time and cannot tell whether an event occurred a week or a year ago, nor can he recall test words after a moment's conversation. Most patients recognize their trouble, and their strive to overcome it is often partially successful. While anxious at first, they may latter become quarrelsome and irritable, especially when their inconsistencies are shown to them. Some show a marked indifference, but may improve gradually and are much better after nine months or a year. But the defect of memory persists in most cases. Complete recovery is rare. This may be the only symptom of dementia present, or the attack may terminate apoplexy, epilepsy, hemiplegia, or a simple brain wasting. This is separate from and must not be confused with the alcoholic somnambulism. Dipsomania, clearly to be classed as a form of insanity, and yet seldom found in an insane retreat, are cases of dipsomania. This is a recurrent monomania which is expressed by an unconquerable thirst for alcohol and most frequently exhibits itself at regular periods. In the interim between the attacks, alcohol is not desired and in some cases absolutely abhorred. Spitzka defines it as a form of periodical insanity manifesting itself in a blind craving for stimulant and narcotic beverages. 
Cases of this kind are distinguished from chronic alcoholism by the fact that in the latter, the desire for alcohol is always present in an intense form, and there is a total lack of shame concerning the drinking. The dipsomaniac knows his weakness and is ashamed of it, while recognizing that he is unable to prevent it. What is called pseudo-dipsomania is a condition when the patient is always ready to drink and never has the abhorrence for drinking which the dipsomaniac manifests in his periods of abstinence. Circumstances or opportunity regulate the time of the pseudo-dipsomaniac's excesses. The dipsomaniacal attacks come suddenly, but are usually preceded by some premonitory symptoms differing with the individual. When the storm bursts, the dipsomaniac gives himself up to the unrestrained indulgence, not infrequently accompanied by other vices. This is continued for periods of different lengths and may terminate as suddenly as it began. The causes of dipsomania seem to be apparent in most cases, for the subjects are almost entirely nervous degenerates, and the element of alcohol is more or less an accident and is but one of the varying manifestations of a bad diocesis. The family histories are largely tinctured with nervous disorders. Hysteria, epilepsy, migraine, and insanity are found in the immediate ancestry. Where dipsomania appears, epilepsy is suspected, and some would go so far as to say that dipsomaniacal attack is but the equivalent of an epileptic seizure. Improper physical and psychical conditions which tend to depress the nervous system of those who are already unstable are liable to prove an exciting cause of dipsomania. Such experiences as overwork, shock, prolonged depression, excitement due to political strife, social worries, neurasthenia, and sexual excess frequently excite to indulgence. Sometimes there is a pathological series of diseases of which dipsomania is one. Remondandino reports a case where the series consisted of migraine, dipsomania, and gouty rheumatism, and another case of dipsomania and hemorrhoids, the succeeding trouble taking the place of the preceding ones. In the case of John Kinzel, the series consisted of petit mal, double personality, and dipsomania. Dipsomania and other manias are coexistent in some diseased minds. Kleptomania is the one most frequently associated with dipsomania. And in some cases of alcoholism, there is developed a kleptomania which exhibits itself during every intoxication and often takes symptomatic and peculiar forms, as when, example given, an alcoholic will steal only Bibles or shoes. Sometimes these manias may be interchangeable. At one attack there will be manifested a dipsomania, and in place of this, at the next attack, may come other monomanias. Example given pyromania, kleptomania, erotomania. American climate and hurry are more favorable for the development of dipsomania than the milder climate and mode of life of Europe. Not infrequently, a change of residence or business will assist in a cure. Dr. March of Albany trefined a man who had been an inebriate since he received an injury to his head by a fall. After the operation, the man felt no further need for desire for alcohol living a total abstainer for the remainder of his life. Cases of this kind illustrate another cause of the disease and are termed traumatic dipsomania. A great number of remote causes are mentioned by different authors, as example given. Sexual continence and celibates, so that it is impossible to mention all the causes. But we can safely say that the lesser and exciting causes owe their potency in inducing the disease to an unstable nervous system. In some, the dipsomaniacal periods differ in length from two days to three or four years and occur with astronomical exactness. It may be every 52 days or every 27 days and 12 hours. But whatever time has been observed can be counted on. In other cases, there is not the regularity of the periods, but the storms are determined by exciting circumstances. In most cases, we are ignorant of the causes which determines their length, but some patients show quite plainly that such events as the seasons of the year, the rhythm of nutrition, dietetic conditions, and in females, menstruation, determine the time of the attack. With some patients, the sober periods shorten, getting less and less each time, 
but in others the rhythmical period remains constant. A great variety of the symptoms are harbingers of the outbreak. While they vary largely in different persons, they are usually constant in the same person, usually nervous depression, restlessness, irritability, insomnia, and abhorrence of existing conditions are among the symptoms, and many dipsomaniacs easily recognize when an attack is imminent. Some other symptoms gathered at random are parsimoniousness and fear of impoverishment, delusions of benevolence and consequent generosity, great activity and mania for work, inactivity and distaste for labor, insatiable appetite for food, distaste for anything to eat, and loss of all appetite for food, sexual excess, hyperesthesia to heat or cold, undue excitement over small matters, hysterical attacks, etc. During a period of total abstinence, he may be haunted with the idea of drink. This is soon followed by a desire for drink, which may be strenuously combated, but finally becomes irresistible. One case might be quoted more fully. The subject was a physician of middle age and a bachelor, highly gifted mentally and morally, liberally educated and, except for these attacks, in enjoyment of perfect health. With him, it was no accidental beginning. His spells never began by any drinking. Alcohol was no factor in his disease. The psychological processes that brought the irresistible need for that oblivion and subsequent crisis that he found only in heavy drinking came on slowly and from some obscure cause, and when fully under the influence of the spell, a veritable mental aberration, he would begin his preparations for a long and vehement debauch with all the secrecy of a conspirator, and with the watchfulness, ingenuity, and irresistible impulses of a kleptomaniac. For days he would cautiously gather his stores of brandy, gin, and whiskey, or whatever other alcoholic beverage he could procure, for the coming event, and secret his bottles in the most likely places to escape immediate detection. His hunting boots, hunting case, gun case, spaces in his bookcases, in the rear of his books, the sleeves of his coat, spaces under or between his mattresses, and every conceivable hiding place, were well stowed with bottles of the best and strongest liquors before he would allow himself to touch a drop. When all was ready, his spell of debauch would be inaugurated at nightfall, but missed at his meals and at his accustomed places by his friends, who always feared the cause of his disappearance would be found in his room in a glorious state of intoxication. He would walk rigidly with tensely rigid frame, hardly able to articulate, and his eyes would have a wild, fixed, unnatural stare, and seem to be more or less protruding. It was really pitiful to see this intelligent and proud man now attempt to act the considerate and courtly gentleman that he always was in his moments of intervals of strict sobriety. The search for his bottles would then begin, but he always managed to profit by past experiences and have some new source of supply from some obscure reserve store hidden away elsewhere, and from this and what few small bottles would escape the detection would finish his spell, an ending that always came when his stomach refused longer to hold any liquor. A week of hard retching, vomitings, stomach, and headache followed, with desires to commit suicide, with continuing spells of deep contrition and self-reproaches and when able to again take some food and stand on his feet, he would depart for a couple of weeks' recuperation away from home and be himself until the recurrence of a new attack. Footnote. P. C. Ramondino, A Study of the Causes and Nature of Dipsomania. Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 23, pages 131 forward. End footnote. These prominatory symptoms are common with other manias. It is during this time that the attack may be averted, but after the storm has burst, it must run its course. The patient will pawn his clothes, steal, or do anything to obtain alcohol. Nothing but physical restraint will prevent excessive indulgence. As Dr. Skye said years ago, he will drink, shoe blacking and turpentine, hair wash, or anything stimulating. He is able to imbibe an immense amount of liquor, and it requires much more to affect him than an ordinary drunkard. In some cases the attack is self-limited, and at certain times the craving ceases, but more often 
the debauch is limited only by the finances or the stomach. With money all gone, or experiencing inability to retain any alcohol, the patient, a physical and mental wreck for the time being, seeks to regain his former standing. During the attack, criminal and depraved instincts are developed in some cases, so that thefts, assaults, and other misdemeanors are committed, and indulgences of licentiousness and unprovoked jealousies which are directly opposed to the conduct and disposition of the individual in his normal state cause him remorse when he recovers. The restlessness of the attack is portrayed in a recent work of fiction where the hero says, Why should I have these fearful, horrible outbreaks of nervous depression ending in attacks of dipsomania? They will land me in the madhouse, prison, or grave, according to circumstances. Use your willpower. Only the most ignorant could give such advice. Do you tell the epileptic to use his willpower, doctor? I surmise you have many a time left the trembling, disheartened dipsomaniac with the advice not to drink any more. Just what he was trying to do, doctor, but he thought that you would help him carry out his fervent desires and also your advice. No, doctor, the study of these cases is beyond you. The time will arrive when scientists must recognize the nervous instability of certain individuals which takes the form of dipsomania, and be able to distinguish drunkenness, vice, and immoral habits from a nerve explosion which has wrecked numerous homes and destroyed many brilliant minds. When alcohol cannot be obtained during these attacks, an abnormal condition is very noticeable. Among the physical changes are increased pulse rate, feverish skin and parched throat, restlessness and fear of impending danger, changed temper, Jealousy and chaotic mental states are common physical symptoms. One case we quote to show the not unusual development of alcoholic symptoms when alcohol has not been taken. During these periods, dipsomania, if denied alcohol, there would be complete loss of appetite and inability to sleep. His eyes would become bloodshot, his gait staggering, his conversation would be voluble, silly, and incoherent, and delusions would often be present. In short, he would at times present all the phenomena of intoxication without having, to my certain knowledge, partaken of a single drop of alcohol. In the interim between attacks, if the patient has not had much experience, he may think that he is completely cured, sign the pledge, and make all efforts to reform. At this time, alcoholic beverages are usually repulsive. Sometimes, though, he recognizes his disease and looks forward with fear and aversion to the next outbreak, while his friends and family upbraid him for his past failures and plead with him for reform. Dipsomaniacs are not infrequently persons of extraordinary mental ability. Footnote. See C. Lombroso, The Man of Genius, pages 54 forward, for a list of famous alcoholics. And footnote. The genius has one faculty developed at the expense of the others and insofar is abnormal and subject to more abnormality. Whether he be physician, artist, musician, or literature, he is living at a high nervous tension, his nervous energy is easily exhausted, and his reserve brain power is soon expended. No other class of partaker of alcohol is composed of such bright and intelligent men or men who both by nature and education are better equipped morally. Frequently dipsomaniacs do not drink in company but imbibe secretly, and a recluse is to be suspected, especially among women. When the first symptoms of the attack make their appearance, the outbreak can sometimes be aborted by the use of physical means, correcting and cleansing the digestive organs, or by the psychical means through the use of hypnotism. Usually, though, it takes its course. It will be some advance when dipsomania is clearly diagnosed, not only by physicians, but by the courts, and it is recognized that during the paroxysms, the individual is really insane and irresponsible for his acts. Magnin has made a distinction which is well taken. A dipsomaniac is insane to drink, but a drunkard is insane after he is drunk. In 350 cases of alcoholism studied, by Dr. Dana at Bellevue Hospital, the most frequent form was dipsomania, and the next pseudo-dipsomania. End of Chapter 9, Part 1
Delirium tremens. While the onset of delirium tremens is sudden, it is the result of chronic alcoholism and not of acute intoxication. The occasion of the attack may be either excessive indulgence or the sudden withdrawal of alcohol. The immediate cause is not known, but one theory which has gained favor and is supported by not a few facts is that the condition, which is recognized as a result of poison, is not brought about by the alcohol directly, but by some toxic substance which the alcohol generates and of which the alcohol is an antidote. In a paper read at the 8th International Congress, Vienna, 1901, Professor Jalgeg sets forth this view. The facts cited to substantiate this are the necessity of a chronic alcoholic condition with previous continued excess, which shows that it is not a case of direct alcoholic poisoning, and further, this poison cannot be alcohol, for alcohol lessens its influence in delirium tremens, and after a short abstinence, as in the morning when tremor and nausea are present, the poison has great similarity in its effects to those of bacterial origin of some infectious diseases, as example given typhoid fever, for it frequently runs a course as these do, and an examination of the blood exhibits similar phenomena. Inflammation of the conjunctiva and irregularity of renal action carry the analogy still further. A paper by Dr. Pritchard confirms the kidney diagnosis and also the indirect poison theory, for his contention is that delirium tremens is usually connected with acute nephritis and that the poison which causes delirium tremens is that of uremia. In other words, he would affirm that alcohol affects the kidneys so that they are unable to excrete the poisonous materials. And when this peculiarly alcoholic matter enters the blood, the result is delirium tremens. The seriousness of the attack depends on the condition of the kidneys. This theory could be well assimilated with that of Professor Jogig, but does not explain the further contention of the latter that alcohol is an antidote to this poison. This part of the theory is maintained on account of the recognized effects of abstinence and the alleviation of the intensity of the attack. When alcohol is given, while also prolonging it, that is, the poison, no longer held in check by alcohol, spreads through the system and causes delirium. When alcohol is given, delirium is milder, but more poison is generated and the attack is prolonged. For a time it was denied that abstinence occasioned by delirium tremens, but it is being admitted more now. And hence this theory accords with facts as accepted by some investigators. Whether we accept this or not, we recognize that directly or indirectly alcohol is the cause of faulty metabolism, which in turn results in this mental and physical injury of which we are speaking. The general symptoms of delirium tremens are quite constant, among them are to be noticed tremulousness, limbs, lips, tongue, voice, depression, mental confusion, insomnia, symptoms of motor paresis, hallucinations, restless, delirium, and delusions of fear. Bleeding from nose and gums and convulsions may also be present. The hallucinations and illusions are different with every case, but it is noted that the hallucinations are usually of a visual character although they may be connected with any of the other senses. Erroneous perceptions give rise to illusions of all kinds of grotesque shapes and terrifying forms, and the hallucinations of creeping things which are so common always posit the creatures in motion. Peripheral disturbances lead the patient to think that ants and bugs are crawling over them, or that his body is full of wounds. He reacts to all his hallucinations looks under the bed, in the cracks of the floor, into the closet, to follow the movement of the animals which he has recently seen and feared, or he runs to the window to watch the horse which he sees running away. To escape from the objects of hallucinations, he may at times do injury to his attendants, or his suspicions may be centered around the attendant, so that he is led to do injury to him from the standpoint of what he considers self-protection. Small animals such as insects, snakes, toads, rats, and spiders are most frequently seen, but occasionally large and mythical animals 
like dragons are present in hallucinations. The vision of snakes and worms has been accounted for by the distended blood vessels of the eyes. Itching of the skin starts hallucinations of vermin, which are afterwards seen in the room, and the goose flesh, which sweeps cold and wave-like over portions of the body, suggests snakes. The delusions are restless, and the patient is always on the move, so that it is classed as an occupation mania. Thus, if death comes, it is from exhaustion on account of malnutrition, constant movement, and loss of sleep. The longest case of delirium tremens, of which we have read, was one of 51 days, and the attacks vary from that to two days. Very seldom the patients can stand more than a few days' illness. The disease is generally self-limiting, either reaching a favorable or fatal termination in 60 to 100 hours. If the hallucinations of hearing persist after the attack has subsided, doubts of complete mental restoration are greater. It will not be within our sphere to touch on the subject of treatment, except in one particular, and that is whether it is best to continue the use of alcohol in lessening quantities, or to entirely withdraw it, and if necessary, substitute other drugs. The latter is much more favored by authorities today. It seems, in one way, to be a matter of choice, by using less and less alcohol, so that it is entirely withdrawn at the end of four or five days. The attack is prolonged, but lessened in intensity. By completely withdrawing alcohol, the attack is made much shorter, but is more intense. In the case of 51 days referred to above, the first four weeks, a physician gave from four to six ounces of whiskey daily. Those who use alcohol in treatment claim that it is cruelty not to do so. Those who do not maintain that they have better results and the extreme agony for a few hours has a salutary effect. In line with the last idea, one army surgeon who was stationed at Fort Vancouver, which at the time had the largest ratio of admissions for drunkenness, adopted a plan which he found very successful. When an alcoholic called for him, he immediately placed the patient upon the operating table, introduced the stomach tube, pumped out the stomach, then washed it out, and after he had freed the stomach of all mucus and contents, he gave the patient a bowl of hot essence of capsicum and allowed him to rest for a few hours. This plan was very prompt in relieving the man, and its deterrent influence on the drink habit was also excellent. In his report, he concluded by saying that he never had occasion to administer his treatment to the same patient more than once. Perhaps the rapid, cruel treatment of delirium tremens may be the most humane after all. We append the following typical case. C.L. is a well-developed, well-nourished German, 41 years of age. His father was a chronic alcoholic, and his half-sister was insane. As a young man, he led a dissipated life. He has been addicted to the use of alcoholic beverages for the past 15 years, and during the past two years has frequently been intoxicated. His favorite beverages were gin and cider. He gradually became indolent and indifferent to the wants of the family, and is also said to have deteriorated in memory. While naturally suspicious, he gradually became unkind, quarrelsome, and jealous of his wife, accusing her of infidelity. Early in July 1902, he ran into the house quite out of breath and in much fear, saying, Thank God I have escaped from that devil that was after me. This apprehension, which was a touch of the horrors, lasted but a few hours. One month later, after a period of a week or so of indisposition and gastric disturbance, some nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and also muscular tremor, and in coordination, he suddenly developed terrifying hallucinations of sight and hearing. He saw devils, eels, and rats passing by him, shook worms from the ends of his fingers, thought his bed was on fire, and tried to put it out, and saw his wife in intercourse with one of his fellow workmen. He became extremely fearful rushed about to escape the animals which were following him, and would leap out of bed in great horror. His consciousness was completely clouded. 
when at home he thought himself in a shop, and that those about him were shopmates. His attention was completely absorbed in his numerous hallucinations, and he talked of being executed, asked if he was to be brought to Hartford for burial, and wept for his poor children who were to be orphans. Other delusions were that if his wife was unfaithful, and that some of his children were by other men. His insomnia was extreme, and at first he could not be induced to eat. In the course of fifteen days, while still completely disoriented and suffering from many hallucinations which had lost much of their effect, he would shake the worms from his fingertips quite indifferently and would sit for hours, apparently watching with interest the numerous creeping things about him. He became emotional only when speaking of his wife's behavior. His activity had disappeared and he was quiet and tractable, but reticent and self-absorbed. His muscular tremor continued and his deep reflexes were much exaggerated. At the end of the third week, his hallucinations began to disappear quite rapidly and he became thoroughly conscious. Likewise, all delusions and fear disappeared, and by the twenty-fifth day he had thoroughly recovered except for some muscular tremor. Pathological inebriety. Wernicke differentiates pathological drunkenness from delirium tremens, the former being distinguished chiefly by a delirium of a few hours only, where delirium tremens last days. Hale Broner has described this condition, pathological inebriety, he calls it, quite fully and says that it seldom fails to be the initial parents of those cases of delirium tremens, which later show the typical humorous disposition. He cites some cases and gives symptoms which immediately suggest delirium tremens, as example given, fear, loss of localization, and visual hallucinations. In many cases, he says that the whole course occupies a few minutes, particularly with those in whom the excitation stage sets in during half-sleep. Most cases end in deep sleep. This is called by some a touch of the horrors, and is an abortive form of delirium tremens. Mania a patu. Some authorities differentiate mania a patu from delirium tremens, but in most cases it seems hardly necessary to make the distinction. We do so here for the sake of completeness. It is called, besides mania a patu, acute alcoholic mania, delirium ambrosium, oinomania, and both this and delirium tremens are called acute alcoholic delirium by different writers. The distinction is credited to magnum. This form of disorder usually appears among those who have an inherited tendency to mental instability and excitement, and most frequently among periodic or occasional drinkers. It may follow the indulgence in a very small amount of alcohol, or there may have been abstinence from alcohol for weeks prior to the attack, but the patient may have been nervous had gastric disturbances and general malaise with irritability and hideous dreams. There may have been some sudden shock to develop the mania, which frequently comes without warning. There is great excitement and the attack is exceedingly violent, but usually brief. Similar to delirium tremens, there are hallucinations and illusions of a variable fleeting nature, and while in delirium tremens, motor symptoms are as prominent as the sensorial. The most notable feature of mania apatu is the prominence of sensorial disturbances. These may show themselves, among other ways, in amblyopia, dyschromatopia, and auditory, olfactory, and gustatory disturbances. It also differs from delirium tremens in an absence of tremor and restlessness, and in the more marked and ungovernable fury. Kerr denies any hallucinations, but most other authorities cite them. The primary effects of medication are good, but one other characteristic of this disorder is the sudden and frequent relapses. These outbursts occur after intervals of apparent convalescence and may come repeatedly without further indulgence in alcohol. Alcoholic delusional insanity. This form of insanity develops as delirium tremens does. Why the apparently same conditions 
should develop in one person into delusional insanity and in another into delirium tremens is a mystery or why at one time a person should have one form of mental trouble and at another time the other has not been explained the onset is sudden but unlike delirium tremens the consciousness is unclouded similar to dipsomaniacal attacks there may be premonitory symptoms such as irritability headache dizziness and insomnia sometimes for days after the first noises are heard the patient may attend to his regular work but when the attack is further advanced it attracts the attention of his associates sleep is disturbed by strange sounds which suddenly awaken the patient the sounds become more definite and finally are resolved into voices which are heard day and night the voices become definite words then phrases and finally sentences all of which refer to the patient and accuse him of crimes he hears himself all manner of derogatory names and the voices predict for him an ignominious fate which he well deserves he is compelled to listen to his death sentence by the court or to plans for his assassination or legal execution neighbors shout or jeer at him and all persons seen or thought of seek his life sometimes he accuses himself of crimes and when any patient pretends to be a murderer it is almost a sure symptom of alcoholism these delusions of persecution are very characteristic symptoms occasionally there may be delusions of exaltation as well as of persecution but usually they are of the latter character sometimes electricity appeals strongly to the imagination of these patients and they have delusions concerning this the writer remembers one patient who had a delusion that wires were under the floor and he was connected electrically with wax figures which his enemies were exhibiting in the town these figures reproduced every movement of his and were associated in the exhibition with the figures of noted criminals he earnestly appealed for relief from this unbearable condition very seldom any except auditory hallucinations are present sometimes there may be some sight sexual delusions are quite common and much of the supposed injury done to the patient is connected with the sexual organs he is fearful of castration or of other similar operations the patient is extremely egotistical and refers everything to himself he sees in the look of a bystander scorn and reproach or in the movement of an attendant some attempt to do him personal injury he may thus become so much prejudiced against doctor or nurse that when he recovers he is unable to overcome it and ever afterwards entertains a strong personal dislike persons watch him condemn him pursue him and seek to do him harm his whole time is spent in an endeavor to elude his persecutors he becomes suspicious and distrustful of every person and every movement people he thinks are trying to rob him and even the kindly intended acts are misinterpreted he is fearful of consequences and in his desperation may try to escape them by suicide or by killing the person who he thinks has injured him his whole life is conducted according to his delusions accompanying these psychological symptoms are some physiological ones as example given insomnia tremor of hands and tongue impaired appetite and loss of flesh the reflexes are occasionally exaggerated usually the patient recovers in a short time varying from a few weeks to a few months the delusions may persist for a year and in a few cases become chronic this trouble is sometimes called alcoholic mania but we are indebted to professor Kraepelin for the designation which we use a case is appended w n is a man of 49 years of age with negative family history an englishman and for many years a stonemason but latterly a painter he had been a moderate drinker five glasses of beer daily until a few months prior to the onset of his psychosis when he began to drink some whiskey in addition at about this time he established himself in business but did not meet with much success this worried him 
as well as the fact that he had recently passed urinary calculi. He left home to visit friends in a neighboring city, and the first night drank about three glasses of beer and some whiskey. He awoke about two o'clock in the morning and heard some people in the next room saying that his wife was unfaithful and had had intercourse with her brother. Later he heard his brother-in-law in the hallway attempting to shoot him. He went to the police for protection, became fearful and much agitated. The hallucinations of hearing became more prominent. His wife, other women, friends and strangers were heard talking day and night. He believed his wife was having illicit intercourse with attendants in the building and could hear her talking with them and cursing. He thought that he had been tricked into the hospital and that the nurses had given him poison, etc. At the end of three weeks, God was talking to him, announcing that his sentence had expired, his sins had been forgiven, etc. By this time, his ideas of infidelity had disappeared. He gradually became less restless and agitated and lost most of his former effect, spending his time playing games and reading papers. In the course of three months, while hallucinations still continued, he began to express delusions of an expansive nature, such as that he had much money to lend and had control of the buying for the institution, yet said that he must go to prison and that injury was being done to him. His delusions were unsystemized and varied greatly from day to day. Emotionally, he was greatly depressed and upon slight provocation became very irritable. About the seventh month of the psychosis, he began to develop various somatic delusions, such as that he was being played on by the x-rays, the apparatus of which was attached to his chest and ankles, and this prevented him from talking properly. He was teased by machines and was being hammered by 10,000 hammers. Men got under his pillow at night, teased him, then went through his head. His consciousness remained unclouded and his memory unimpaired. His delusions, however, were more incoherently expressed. Emotionally, he failed to show any reaction to his many delusions. The patient's condition remained unchanged after a duration of two years. Alcoholic Paranoia This mental trouble is differentiated from true paranoia by the symptoms of chronic alcoholism and by lack of system in the delusions. The onset is gradual and starts with suspicions of infidelity in the spouse and married patients. On account of the frequent indulgence in alcohol, there is often an estrangement between husband and wife, and this presents a nucleus about which delusions of jealousy form. Kraft Ebbing thinks that the failing of sex powers may be a factor in inciting the delusions. As soon as these suspicions begin, the patient thinks that the change in the attitude of his wife toward him, really due to his indulgences, is caused by her preference for other men, and he takes note of the most insignificant occurrence, which he interprets into proof of his wife's change of affections. In the partially systematized delusions, very strange circumstances are woven into the fabric. Any act of kindness proffered by a neighbor, the addresses of a friend to the children, the presence of the postman at the door discharging his regular duties, the call of an agent or a peddler, every word, glance, or action of persons passing on the street are positive proofs of his wife's infidelity, and his insane jealousy is intolerable. Hallucinations of hearing or delusions of actual noises are interpreted as signs made by his wife's lover or as whispered conversation between the two. Hallucinations of smell and taste are the beginnings of delusions of poisoning, of which he accuses his wife or her lover. His hallucinations are not nearly so numerous as in cases of delusional insanity, and in some cases are entirely absent. Scandals are not infrequently circulated concerning the innocent wife, started by the mentally unbalanced husband, who tells his suspicions and gives his proofs, 
frequently displaying much emotion but his reasoning concerning these things is weak and absurd the patient will bemoan his misfortune but will live peaceably with his wife whom he thinks is unfaithful and very seldom will he attempt acts of violence he in common with all alcoholics is always on the defensive and if he commits an act of violence it is in self-defense as he supposes in other respects his actions are at variance with his delusions in unmarried patients quite frequently religious delusions are present regardless of the religious fervor of their former lives these delusions are often connected with the priest others who are unmarried have their delusions center about the supposed outrage or prostitution of sisters or other members of the family in cases of alcoholic paranoia recovery is not probable the course of the disease is progressive and the delusions seldom disappear if taken out of home surroundings and put in a place where it is impossible to obtain alcohol the patient may improve temporarily but a return home shows how slight the improvement has been we append a case. McGee is an Irishman, 50 years of age, whose family history is of no special importance, except that his brother suffered from chronic alcoholism. He was a man of limited education, and until 39 was a steady, hard-working mechanic. He had always been a moderate drinker, mostly of beer. At this time, he gave up his regular occupation and purchased a saloon. He then began to drink liquors, mostly whiskey, intemperance increased, and at the end of two years he developed an attack of delirium tremens, from which he fully recovered. In the course of three years it became evident that he was losing his business ability. He trusted irresponsible parties, and in another year was forced to assign. Drinking continued to excess, and the support of family fell upon his wife, who was forced to take boarders. He himself was employed as a day laborer, earning only enough to supply himself with liquor. He became negligent of his family, careless of his own appearance, and surly and irritable. Delusions of jealousy gradually appeared. He accused his wife of consorting with her boarders, began to secret himself in order to watch her behavior, and followed her into the street. Once he thought that he had detected evidence of her concealment in a room with a boarder. The fact that his oldest boy was singularly red-headed was taken as evidence of earlier infidelity on her part, and a red-headed cousin of hers who had occasionally visited the family was designated as the father of this boy. He became abusive to his wife, often threatening and at times assaulting her. His memory became faulty, and he lost interest in work of any sort and when not drinking haunted the house in search of his wife's supposed admirers. His intolerable conduct necessitated his commitment to the hospital at 48. At this time he did not give evidence of hallucinations. His consciousness was clear, but his memory was impaired, especially for recent events, and his delusions of infidelity were fixed. He, however, was reticent in reference to them for several weeks. Emotionally, he was depressed by his confinement and sad over his wife's misbehavior. He was orderly in conduct, presented a tidy appearance, and employed himself willingly in small ways, but seemed to have little energy save for reading the paper and talking with fellow patients. There was a pronounced tremor of the hands and some muscular incoordination. Otherwise, he was physically in good condition. After a residence of three months, the patient suddenly developed hallucinations of hearing, claiming that he heard his wife telephoning to the attendant to keep him confined in the hospital. She also telephoned to him. The buzzing of the telephone was going on all the time, and he would have it stopped. A few days later, he accused the attendant of attempting to poison him and developed great fear, asking to be allowed to sleep in a single room as he had heard someone say that he was to be stabbed. This condition disappeared gradually within one and a half months, since which time the patient has remained without change for two years, still maintaining his delusions of infidelity, but never mentioning them unless questioned. 
His conduct is orderly, and he is neat in personal appearance, is helpful in war duties, but spends most of his time in reading newspapers. He frequently importunes for his release, but he is never aggressive in this matter. Mental weakness is apparent also in his desire and willingness to return to his wife and his poor memory for recent events. Alcoholic paresis. This is called at times alcoholic pseudoparesis, as the former type is frequently designated alcoholic pseudoparanoia. Alcoholic paresis is frequently so like general paralysis of the insane that the diagnosis may remain in doubt for some time. In both diseases, the onset is gradual with hallucinations and delusions of persecution and infidelity, progressive impairment of memory and judgment, expansive delusions, a sense of well-being, and mental stupidity. Physically, both diseases are characterized by sensory disturbances, muscular tremor, exaggerated or absent tendon reflexes, disturbances of speech, ataxia, and occasional epileptiform attacks. The differentiation is made in the progress of these two diseases. Alcoholic paresis is not progressive. The course may be protracted, but in a few months or years, the more marked symptoms disappear or remain stationary, usually leaving the patient in a condition of mild dementia with a few expansive or depressive delusions. In general paresis, the course progresses to a fatal termination, and here the patient is less active and forceful. If he has the same delusions as the alcoholic, they are less coherent and logical, and he is more indifferent to and less disturbed by them. Tremor is more general and muscular weakness more marked than in alcoholic paresis. The paretic sleeps better and has inequality of pupils with slowness of reaction, and the changes in reflexes are more marked. Moderate drinkers sometimes come gradually to this state, not recognizing any change but a slow deterioration of the mental faculties is present. The history of a case may begin with an attack of cerebritis. Knees bend under him. He becomes degraded in habits and eats ravenously, is sullen or constantly cheerful with exalted ideas. He may burst out in attacks of aggressive excitement, may mutilate himself, and after every exciting attack becomes more and more demented. Alcoholic paresis shows itself as premature senility. Old age comes to the young and middle-aged men. Insidiously, it benumbs the faculties until man comes to have little more than a vegetable existence. All that made him a man has slowly been withdrawn, and the silly, demented wreck marks the place where once a man stood. It is the last step in the alcoholic's march, the last chapter of his life to which his previous experience, if life lasted, inevitably pointed. Kraft Ebbing found the pathological conditions the same as in general paralysis, except for the absence of the granulations of the ventricles. Different from general paresis, even after year standing, the patient may improve so as to return to his business and home. This is very infrequent. Beside this alcoholic paresis, it should be noted that Next to syphilis, alcohol is the most prominent factor in production and development of general paralysis. A case is appended. D.L. is 43 years of age, a day laborer, married, and the father of six children. For three generations, the family presents, on one or the other side, a history of extreme intemperance, epilepsy, or imbecility. His maternal grandfather was a drunkard. The mother, an epileptic, father, an intemperate. One sister is both intemperate and an epileptic. Another sister embarked on various matrimonial adventures. One brother is a cider drunkard, and one brother is both intemperate and weak-minded. The patient has one son in a reform school who is a dangerous person, threatening often to shoot, kill, and also burn buildings. The patient attended the district school until he was 16 or 17. Was a good farmer and an irregular attendant at church. He was violent, abusive, and intemperate in his language. His habits since that time have been intemperate. He never refuses any kind of liquor, but has been especially addicted to the use of cider. Last fall, he drank continuously, often 
one half gallon a day. From this cause, he developed epilepsy at an unknown time and of uncertain type, the patient having no recollection of the fact. He has for some time failed to contribute to the support of his family, his wife taking in washing for the maintenance of her children and husband. The onset of the alcoholic psychosis was sudden. He had done some work up to Friday before his admission, when he became suddenly delirious, imagined that he was driving horses, became vicious and aggressive, swore at and threatened his family, tore up his clothing and the bedclothes, imagined that he was buying horses and sleighs, and called loudly for the assistance of his friends. He was especially noisy at night. During the following weeks it required two men to care for him during the day and a relief force of two at night. His speech was not affected, but his gait was unsteady for two weeks. On admission he was emaciated from lack of nourishment for two weeks. His gait was shuffling, suggestive of weakness, as well as in coordination. He was almost completely disoriented, although he recognized that he was not at home. He frequently gathered up his things to return, said that he had been here a year, that his parents formerly occupied the building. He failed to recognize patients as such, did not distinguish doctors or attendants. At ten in the morning he called for his supper, said it was June, but gave the day of the week correctly. He said it was winter, snow came in August or October. He was contented or indifferent, but at times excitable and restless, had no insight, replied to questions with a fair degree of relevance and coherence. His memory was impaired for both recent and remote events. He was forty or forty-six years old, had rented numberless farms. The sole fact about which he was accurate was the amount of cider he habitually consumed per day. He was incessantly occupied in making various passes across his face, over his eyes, and through the intervening space, picking away imaginary threads which got across his eyes, obscuring the field of vision. He picked objects from his hair, pulled cobwebs from his clothing, and saw mosquitoes crawling everywhere. They were looking for him. They jumped and grew together and continually bit him. For the first few nights he shouted and disturbed the entire ward. The pupillary reflexes were normal at this time. In about ten days the patient's condition had improved and the auditory hallucinations had disappeared. The restlessness and excitement had abated. He became oriented. Consciousness was clear, but he showed a marked inability to figure, to remember or to comprehend errors. The relational element in his mental life had almost disappeared. He was forty-six years old, but might be fifty-three on his next birthday. He gave the names of the owners of seven farms he had rented and the time he had spent on each, but the total was a half more than his entire life. He could neither add nor multiply, knew his six children's names, but bungled hopelessly about their respective ages. He wore a fatuous smile, but was indifferent, took no part in ward life or work, and lounged about in slouching and expressionless apathy. His gait was shuffling and ataxic. There was a slight tremor of the tongue and hand, in coordination of the facial muscles and of those of the upper and lower extremities. He failed on the test words. His reading was slurring and often unintelligible, but the pupillary reflexes were normal. There was inequality of pupils. The left was irregular and notched. The patellar reflexes in two weeks' time were nearly abolished. A week after exaggerated, and in an equal length of time again abolished. Throughout his convalescence, they have presented a gradual up-and-down condition, either markedly increased or nearly abolished. He has complained at intervals of belt-like pains extending from the navel, lasting for a week and disappearing from time to time. From the eighth to tenth weeks, he gradually and steadily improved, gaining in weight with improved appetite and becoming one of the most capable and willing ward workers. At the end of this time, his gait was nearly correct. There was some lingual tremor, the same tremor of the fingers, and his speech was very nearly normal. There was inequality of pupils, the right misshapen with notch in the edge, but the ocular reflexes were normal. The patellar reflexes were generally diminished. 
but at times active. The greatest improvement, however, was in the mental condition. The patient was keen, alert, memory good, reasoned well about his future, discussed his case intelligibly and hopefully, and exhibited a marked improvement in the region of the emotional and moral faculties. Our study of alcoholic insanity shows us that there is a reciprocal relation between alcoholism and insanity, one causing the other. The more serious result is frequently seen in the offspring than in the person who is afflicted with either. Insane parents often produce children who are not able to withstand the ravages of alcohol, and alcoholic parents produce imbecile, idiotic, nervous, and unstable offspring. Some of the types of insanity described in this chapter occur very frequently and are well known. Others occur but seldom and are little known. Dipsomaniacs are quite numerous but are infrequently recognized and are usually not regarded as insane. Men of this class, often of great ability, need special treatment and consideration. By eliminating alcoholic drinking from our social system, one of the most prolific, exciting, and predisposing causes of insanity would be eradicated. End of chapter 9, part 2. Religious Conversion as a Cure At one time in its history, alcohol was looked upon as a great blessing, and an occasional intoxication was considered only an accident in the general progress of good. The drunkard was chided for an apparent indiscretion or considered lacking in control. Since men have become better acquainted with the nature of alcohol and have recognized the danger of its use as a beverage, the attitude toward the alcoholic has changed. And while the preacher may still call alcoholism a sin pure and simple, the men of science who have spent years in investigating the subject Look upon it as a disease of body and mind, which may or may not have had a beginning in sinful indulgence. No sooner had the intoxication habit reached serious proportions and the condition been considered extremely undesirable than men began searching for a cure. Governments recognized the baneful influence of drunkenness and made it a crime, punishable by fine and imprisonment, considering that penalty would have a good influence upon the criminal. In a few, very few, cases it had the desired effect, but not infrequently the family of the drunkard suffered, while on account of his selfishness the motive for his reform was still wanting. By some, alcoholism was considered a disease wholly physical, and inebriate asylums began to spring up all over this in other countries. Treating the disease from this standpoint only, these were successful to some extent because they combined forced abstinence with the upbuilding of the body partially repairing the degenerated tissues, thus ministering to the brain directly and indirectly to the mind and allowing recuperation and thereby control. As a concomitant of this method of cure, one sees a great number of patent medicines and specifics advertised in every paper as a sure cure for this disease which has so stubbornly resisted treatment, and we also notice not a few unskilled and irregular doctors who claim control over this disease. One proof of the inadequacy of drugs and medicines was a cure given in a recent meeting of the New York Academy of Medicine. Here were gathered together a number of specialist doctors of repute in this and other lands who had had considerable experience with alcoholism. And among these suggested cures, not a drug nor medicine was mentioned. There were only two cures spoken of, and both of these of a psychological rather than physiological nature. They were hypnotism and religious conversion. With hypnotism and other cures, we will deal in the next chapter. But here we will turn our attention to religious conversion as a cure. In the report of the meeting, to which we have just referred, the opinion of one specialist is thus given. Religious influence potent. Dr. Starr, Mr. Allen, thought the physician or the family should be able to control these persons legally. A certain amount of moral suasion seemed to be of much more service than anything in the way of medical treatment. He was of the opinion that any measure of a religious or of a social character that could be brought to bear on these individuals was well worthy of a trial, and he would confess that the only reformed drunkards of whom he had knowledge were those who had been saved, not through medical but through religious influence. Perhaps few would go to the length of excluding all their cures 
but certainly most persons would agree with Dr. Starr in positing religious conversion as the most effective of all cures. Who has not among his acquaintances some who have been cured of alcoholism by the power of religion in their lives? He is indeed poor in friends who has at least not one such. Every church in the land has upon it rolls of men and women who have come into the new life from a drunkard's home and whose testimony is overpowering in favor of the cure. Most convincing is the visit to a mission in the slums of a city. No one could spend a half hour at the Bowery, Water Street, or Door Street Mission, New York, without coming away thoroughly satisfied concerning the efficacy of the cure. The services consist of a constant repetition by different speakers of the power of religion in their lives, results in the annihilation of the desire for drink, and the total abstinence from alcohol for periods differing in length from one month to a quarter of a century, and this from men who had previously been considered hopeless inebriates, and whose work causes them still to be placed in circumstances very unfavorable to abstinence. Hundreds of pastors could duplicate a testimony of this kind. Before the meetings were ended, nearly 30 reclaimed drunkards had been received in the Clarendon Street Church. The general opinion was that these men would not stand even to the end of the year. Yet Gordon was able to say some time after, in a Northfield address, of those who have continued their residence with us, all have remained steadfast, as consistent, as devoted, and as useful members as we have. A demonstration that God can instantly change a man from the vilest and worst drunkard to one in the way of the highest saintship. Were it desirable, the church could eclipse the patent medicine advertisers with the thousands of testimonials which might be produced by alcoholics cured by religious conversion. And speaking of cures, reference is not made to those whose abstinence states from a month or a year previous, but to those who have been cured for decades, says Professor James. The only radical remedy I know for dipsomania is religiomania, is a saying I have heard quoted from some medical men. The faith of one alcoholic specialist in religious influence was so strong that although not himself a religious man, he insisted on having prayers at his institution every morning, simply as a therapeutic measure. Some statistics have recently been obtained from the missions in New York City, among which were those of Water Street Mission. This mission was started and formally conducted by the celebrated Jerry McCauley, himself a reformed drunkard, and later superintended by Reverend S. H. Hadley, who was converted under the influence of Jerry McCauley. Mr. Hadley, in answering the inquiries of the writer, said that in the previous 17 years during which he had been connected with the mission, about 1,700 alcoholics had been converted there, of these, 25% never relapsed. They were instantly cured. Of the remaining 75%, 50% were finally reclaimed. And as Mr. Hadley added, many of these make the best workers we have. The ages of the converts range from under 20 to over 70, but the majority are between 30 and 40 years old. These figures were approximate only, but give a general idea of the work. With 62.5% of the patients cured in an experience of over 17 years with 1,700 persons, the encouragement given to this kind of work is great. A record like this might be envied by any inebriate asylum, especially when it is considered that the class of men dealt with has been of the most hopeless kind. Mr. Hadley describes some of the worst cases in a book recently published by him. The New York Christian Home for Intemperate Men formerly situated in New York City, but now in Mont Vernon, New York, gives a similar encouraging report. Answering inquiries of the writer, the Reverend G. S. Avery, the resident manager, says that in the last 27 years, 7,000 men have entered the institution, of whom 5,000 have professed conversion. Of these, 20% have never relapsed, and 40% have relapsed but have been afterwards reclaimed making a total of 60% of cures, about the same proportion as Mr. Hadley reported. In dealing with this subject of religious conversion, its very nature compels us to treat it incompletely. 
However much we may believe in the divine element in conversion, in the religious life generally, it must remain an unknown quantity and can only be judged by the apparent effects upon the persons experiencing it. It will be the aim in this chapter to examine the effects of the influence upon the individual, the way in which these effects are produced, other contributing causes, and the combined effects of all influences. The divine element itself, however, must remain unanalyzed, undescribed, and unexplained. The nature of our data causes us further difficulty. It is almost impossible to get accurate facts. People are honest and their intentions are good, but so few are able to read their experiences where introspection is required. This is a real difficulty in itself and would be sufficiently serious if uncomplicated, but added to this is an equally insurmountable one. The religious experience of one, five, or ten years standing is related as it should be according to orthodox standards, or according to the more striking experiences of others, rather than as it really was, and this, too, from persons desirous of stating the facts. The testimony of others, as related in meetings, acts in a suggestive way, and in a testimony meeting it will be found that all experiences agree, with the exception of a very few details, and these are more and more eliminated as the speakers listen to each other week after week. In services held by different churches and denominations, it will be found that while the testimonies in one service are in harmony, they may be very different from the concurring testimonies of another service. Eliminating the element of similarity due to expectancy, we still have left a large factor due to subsequent agreement of an unconscious character. At the outset, three reasons may be posited why religious conversion proves to be such a potent factor in the cure of alcoholics. In the first place, and most important, it stimulates a real desire for reform. A wish to be cured is the sign qua non. It is impossible to succeed and not worth a trial under any form of treatment if this is lacking. Many institutions refuse to accept a patient unless this condition is fulfilled for they recognize that failure is inevitable without the cooperation of the patient. Frequently the friends are deceived by a pseudo-desire on the part of the patient, which may take either one or two forms. The alcoholic expresses a desire for the alleviation of the evil effects of the drunkenness. In the morning he may express sorrow for having drunk so much on the day previous, because of the headache, nausea, or nervous tremor, but he does not regret it on account of the general injury to himself or because of the ethical wrong. He does not wish to alleviate the bad effects sufficiently to forego the pleasure that comes to him by drowning his misery and living in a false optimistic world while under the influence of alcohol. The pleasure of the intoxication is greater to him than the pain of the effects. He wants to reform if reform will annihilate the pain and allow the same pleasure. Again, he may even go so far as to be willing to forego both the pains and pleasures of intoxication. If he can be cured without effort on his part or especially any inconvenience or pain in the process. In answer to the question, would you like to be cured? He will invariably answer yes and truthfully. He is willing to be cured if he can assume a perfectly passive attitude in the matter. But as for with his being active in undergoing the pains frequently attending total abstinence, as well as giving up the exhilaration of intoxication, he absolutely declines. The desire to be cured must be real and strong to form the basis for any remedial effects. Religious influence not only provides the cure, but furnishes the necessary prerequisite for any cure in giving a desire for help. This may well be classed as a part of the process, but the part that is antecedent. In preaching, in our religious teachings, Motives for reform are prominent contents and are very appropriate to this class of people. Doubtless, when there has been waywardness and one has grown habitually sinful, the most efficacious way of rescue is to picture the fate of continuance in sin, to throw the person back on himself, to lead him to the blackness of sin as contrasted with the beauty of holiness, and make the break unavoidable, sharp, and final. In times of remorse and sorrow after a debauch, when the system has refused to receive any more alcohol, 
The contrast of the alcoholic's misery with the happiness of others comes out vividly, and an ideal of life comes before him. This is strengthened by religious talks and the memory of former religious teaching. Then comes a longing for something better. The distance between the ideal and the real is great, and there appear insurmountable barriers between the present misery and the happiness which might be. But the anticipation of better things grows, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, until there is a sudden forsaking of the lower life and an embracing of the higher. And when the ideal becomes the real, what we call conversion takes place. This, then, is one reason why religious conversion is so efficacious, because it furnishes the prerequisite necessary to any cure. The second reason is that after conversion, the subjective and objective associations are changed and are of a character to assist him in his new life. Many persons might be permanently cured if, after a short period of total abstinence, they were not thrown back among old associations. Objectively, everything calls on the alcoholic to drink. He has a hearty invitation from old friends who are so pleased to see him again that they must show their pleasure by inviting him to have a social glass, the saloon which he passes daily, whose doorway is worn by his tread, seems to hold open its doors to him. The waiter at his club or lunchroom places wine glasses before him and inquires if he will have his same old brand, every person and thing. His whole past life seemed to conspire in one pressing invitation for him to drink. Too frequently he is unable to resist and what control he has spent so much in gaining is lost in the first glass. With the new convert this is not so. He has an entirely new set of friends and acquaintances who have proved their friendship for him. And with them he spends every spare moment. Their words and lives are a constant source of encouragement and strength to him. The fact of his conversion has come to the ears of his old friends, and some honestly congratulate him on his change of life and never after invite him to drink. Others chafe him concerning his change, and even this may cause him to hold to his course more strongly. He has not time to think of, nor inclination to go to the saloon, for his leisure is spent either at church or some religious gathering, in an endeavor to assist someone in the Christian life, or in some philanthropic work. All external associations have a tendency to assist rather than to hinder him. Add to this the power of subjective associations. His mind is no longer occupied with the thought of drink, but the events of the new experience fill his thoughts, and his work in and for the church leaves him no time to long for the flesh pots of Egypt. Associations, objective and subjective, are a constant assistance. Another reason why religious conversion is so efficacious as a cure for alcoholism is that it not only destroys the craving, but it provides an emotional substitute, says a social writer. The drink habit is in a very large degree the perversion of one of the most universal human desires, the thirst for exhilaration, recreation, and joy, and to remove the only available means for satisfying this normal craving without providing adequate substitutes is like blocking the channel where a stream does harm without observing how many new fields the same stream is likely to devastate. While other cures may be deficient in the direction of this criticism, religious conversion is not, and the substitute is of such a character as to better supply the need than alcohol itself. We cannot help recognizing temporary exhilaration and realization of the idea brought about by the accustomed dram of alcohol. The only means some know of realizing their ideas even for a short time. We know that it is perfectly artificial, and yet for the moment it is real to the individual. There is a similarity in the exhilaration due to intoxication and spiritual ecstasy. The apostle recognized this when he warned the Ephesians to be not drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit, and he desired his readers to make the distinction. The pleasure due to alcohol is intense in its nature. This is true of the pleasures of the so-called lower passions, because of their being confined to one kind of expression, which is always the same. And in addition to this, the pleasure occupies but a small portion of the life. As far as intensity is concerned, religion 
or any other form of higher pleasure cannot, except under abnormal conditions, hope to vie with intoxication or lower pleasures. Wherein, then, does the religious life excel? Not in intensity, that is sure, but in an extensity. This is being true of the higher pleasures generally. There is no condition of life in which the religious pleasures cannot be realized. For religious conversions embrace not one set of passions, but the whole man. Body and soul respond. The variation of expression is endless, and all associations of the mind lead to the spiritual life. The idea of religious faculty or sense has been abolished, and it should be recognized that there is no experience so comprehensive in its scope as that of religion. This removes a number of objections to religion and religious methods, some of which will be referred to further on. Here we see that the expulsive power of a new affection has its virtue in the fact that even if deficient in intensity as compared with the lower passions it ministers to the whole man and thus exceeds any other pleasure in extensity one other reason why religious conversion stands at the head of the list of the cures of alcoholism might just be mentioned here while the explanation will be taken up later in connection with another topic most conversions of alcoholics are of a sudden nature because the mental condition of the alcoholic causes him to be particularly susceptible to the methods favorable to this variety of religious experience the types of conversion are many in fact every case is a type by itself while the decision in all cases must be instantaneous to say that conversion is an instantaneous change in all cases is to pervert the facts two general classes may be clearly recognized and these are divided according to the time element in the process. Although the rapidity of the movement is only an index to many other factors which differ in the two classes, as mentioned above, the great majority of the cures of alcoholics by religious conversion have been accomplished by the instantaneous or sudden method, and few, if any, cures are recorded among conversions of the more deliberate type. One can see how the various names of these classes would follow as a matter of course. For instance, Starbuck designates them as follows, and this quotation clearly shows where he would class the converted alcoholic. Two types of conversion. They may be characterized respectively as escape from sin and spiritual illumination. The first type, escape from sin, is more nearly akin to breaking a habit. It is characteristic of all the older persons studied, and of all, regardless of age, who have led wayward lives. It is connected with the feeling of sinfulness, proper in which the mental state is negative, and attended by dejection and self-abnegation. Escape from sin would be necessarily sudden, while illumination would be a more gradual process, there being no gradual breaking of the alcoholic habit as a rule and generally only a short time of remorse and sorrow after debauch that desire for reform is entertained by the alcoholic if from his standpoint he is to make a start it must be a sudden one and his condition brings it to a sudden culmination while he continues drinking it would be entirely unlikely that he could concentrate his mind on the subject and give it sufficient consideration to bring about a gradual or deliberate climax the good resolutions of the sober or partially sober moments would be killed by the hours of debauch, and speaking from his point of view, it seems very unlikely that it should last. There have been a few cases of the deliberate type met with, but the struggle has been more intense and the cure frequently not so permanent. It might be well to add, in this connection, that there are some cases of sudden cures of alcoholism that have been entirely separate from all religious influence, and although in the narrower sense of the term they cannot be classed as religious conversion, they have been equally effective and permanent. These are comparatively rare and are of an automatic type not traceable to any apparent motive. Conversion has been frequently referred to, and it seems that some definition of the term should be given. Conversion is not a complete experience in itself but forms a part of a process of which the total religious experience is the whole. It should be noted, especially concerning conversion, that those parts which seem at first to be sudden and instantaneous are but the fructification 
of a longer or shorter development, more probably of a subconscious nature. This process of conversion is variously defined and explained, as can be seen from the following quotations. Conversion is in its essence a change of intention. The regenerate life is a changed life. It is a change marked by the consciousness of the person's own needs and that Christ's life can satisfy them. At last the rationalistic fetters off and the suppressed hypnotic centers explode with immense satisfaction. This is the most important key to the psychology of conversion. The essence of religion is a striving towards being, not toward knowing. In Christianity, the goal of religious life becomes regeneration, by which unification of motives, that is, union with God, when objectively considered, is achieved. The explanation of sudden conversions is no doubt to be sought in some overpowering impression upon the mind that supplies a new and energetic motive to the will, thereby initiating a new line of conduct. Such changes occasionally happen, but not without terrific struggles, which prove how hard it is to set up the volition of a day against the bent of years. Conversion is suddenly forsaking the lower for the higher self, in terms of the neural basis of consciousness. It is the inhibition of lower channels of nervous discharge through the establishment of higher connections and identification of the ego with the new activities. In theological terminology, it is Christ coming into the heart and the old life being blotted out, the human life being swallowed up in the life of God, to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance, are so many phrases which denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which a self hitherto divided and consciously wrong, inferior and unhappy, becomes unified and consciously right superior and happy in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. Now there may be great oscillations in the emotional interest, and the hot places may shift before one. Then we have the wavering and divided self, or the focus of excitement and heat. The point of view from which the aim is taken may come to lie permanently within a certain system, and then, if the change be a religious one, we call it conversion especially if the change be by crisis or sudden. Many more quotations might be given to show the great difference in the definitions and explanations given by different men, or the same men at different times. It is not claimed that any one is wrong, for the variety of expression shows what was stated above, that religious applies to the whole man. The definition of religious conversion would depend upon the standpoint from which it was viewed. The faculty concerning which one was speaking at the time, the faculty thought to be chiefly concerned, the particular type of conversion with which the speaker was most familiar, or the interpretation of the facts by the individual. It is because it does not concern the whole man, and not one faculty, and there is such a diversity of definition and explanation. Further, some in their definitions might entirely eliminate the human element and speak of it in theological rather than psychological terms as a divine act. So in order to get a correct definition of conversion, we might be able to take the substance of all definitions and then probably it would not be too comprehensive. The idea of unity, so prominent with some, has this advantage. It comprehends the whole man, but complete unity seems to be rather the ideal ripened experience than the common experience of converts. A glance at the process in the case of alcoholics and an examination of the elements involved may help us to get a clear view of conversion. One factor very common in cases of conversion of the abrupt type is that of a profound sense of sin from which the new life spontaneously shines forth as a natural reaction. The older form of the presentation of the gospel was that of magnifying sin and the terrible results to the sinner. Salvation came as a rescue from sin rather than the door to the abundant life. Thus, Starbuck says, conversion is the process of struggling away from sin rather than a striving towards righteousness. Whether this is the direct result of the manner of presenting the gospel or something inherent in conversion itself, it is difficult to say. 
but it will be interesting to compare the conversions of the next 20 years when the opposite form of the gospel is more especially presented to see if this will not correspondingly change the nature of conversion from a struggling away from sin to a striving towards righteousness now the alcoholic does not feel a sense of sin as such little he cares that he has broken laws little he cares that he has injured family and friends and disobeyed god his whole life is selfish and all that he cares about is the physical and mental suffering incident to his debauch or his failure to obtain fresh supply of alcohol he may suffer even more from a sense of virtue than a sense of sin sin itself does not bother him it is the effect of sin or virtue or both combined giving him pain and wretchedness that causes him suffering therefore if the term sin means anything here it is necessary to disagree with starbuck when he says perhaps the purest type of escape from sin is the case of the conversion of a drunkard such as found in the autobiography of john b gow or h h hadley or other records of a similar nature what the alcoholic wants is escape from his physical suffering and it is perfectly immaterial to him whether he goes into more sin or into righteousness to procure it his moral nature is killed he is not in a position to appreciate moral distinctions his mouth is full of foolish excuses and lies to justify himself and he demands from his friends pity for his condition rather than blame for his wrongdoing the drink is necessary to him it is always one more and i won't count this time because it is necessary he must do it for some reason or other and what he must do he cannot be blamed for in moments of remorse he admits certain blame but this is not really felt it is maudlin talk which is not infrequently successful in procuring him another drink to brace him up it is also necessary to disagree with luba in making the sense of sin synonymous with physical misery for this is a misuse of the term and seems rather to be an attempt to have the sense of sin present whether it really is or not but in the remainder of the following quotation he has analyzed the case well the sense of sin is at times little more than a feeling of physical misery the anguish of the sickened flesh in such cases the expressions regret and desire for relief should properly take the place of remorse and of repentance which designate experiences modified by specific intellectual considerations ignored by the persons we speak of this primitive consciousness is especially noticeable in persons addicted to some gross vice drunkards for instance frequently show no sign of the sense of condemnation although fully aware of their utter worthlessness they feel shame at their degradation but are not conscious of any responsibility towards god for breaking his laws they do not exclaim oh my sins my sins but rather oh cursed wretch that i am the ideas of punishment of eternal death or of damnation make no impression upon them the realities of their daily life go beyond the pictorial power of imagination what they want is deliverance deliverance from the unbearable misery of life returning to starbuck's statement that cases like those of go and hadley present the purest cases of escape from sin the writer is unable to find any overpowering sense of sin in either case. Go is asked to sign the pledge and immediately promises to on the morrow, and his sense of sin is so great and his desire for escape from sin is so keen that he immediately goes and gets another drink. In a number of different accounts of Hadley's conversion, which have been accessible, there is no trace of a sense of sin as such. Deliverance is desired without doubt, but not deliverance from sin. As the innocent passenger in a railroad wreck desires relief from suffering, not because he has sinned, but because he is in great agony, so in regard to the drunkard, in the majority of cases at least, the terms used should be sense of suffering and escape from suffering, and we should not gratuitously bring the term sin into the discussion just because we are dealing with a religious subject the writer has sat for hours in the missions in new york listening to the experiences of men who had been cured of drunkenness by religious conversion 
many of whom said they were intoxicated at the time. No doubt there is a tendency to exaggerate the condition of depravity at the time of conversion. Unintentional, of course. But notwithstanding this, some cases which the writer investigated were found to be true, and there is no reason to think that the others were not equally correct. In answer to an inquiry of the writer concerning the proportion of drunken men converted in the Water Street Mission, Mr. Hadley made the following statement. Decidedly more men are converted when drunk than sober, 90% at least. A large number have been soundly converted while in the throes of delirium tremens, and never wanted a drink afterwards. Mr. Avery says, Sometimes men are converted when drunk, but not often. It is natural to suppose that not so many men come to the Christian home for intemperate men in a drunken state as would be found in the Water Street Mission. Persons in this condition cannot have much sense of sin or desire to escape from sin, but they do have a desire for relief, and this could well be connected with what was said in the first part of the chapter concerning the desire for help being necessary in all cases of cure. The value of this desire in conversion should not be minimized, but objection is made to its being called by the name of escape from sin. And further, there was no doubt concerning the sense of sin in many cases of conversion, but very rarely in cases of conversion of alcoholics. Whether from a sense of sin or a sense of suffering, there comes a desire for cure, or perhaps a realization of the necessity for cure. It is followed by the struggle between the higher and lower selves. Thus we have the condition known as the divided self. It is the endeavor of the individual to make this new ideal his own. Contrary to his habit of life, for years, with the knowledge of the suffering which it may entail, and with associations and companions, all on the side of his former life, he has set before him this hope of release from slavery and suffering, and he must meddle it for himself. He must answer the question, is the change worthwhile? With most persons there are a number of sins or vices which come into consideration, all of course less violent than the alcoholics, and there may be one of them standing out more prominently than the rest. But with the alcoholic, his resistance is centered in this one sin. All of his past associations are gathered around this. The associations of the ideal are entirely separated and form a distinct system without any connecting links. In this state, the struggle, misery, agony, and uncertainty common in some cases is felt, together with worry and anger or despair and fear. The individual knows not where he will eventually settle, and some powers outside of him seem to be contending for possession of him. By some, this condition is called conviction. This may last for days or weeks, or only for a moment may appear with varying degrees of intensity and is modified when the climax of the process of conversion takes place, although it is probably never eliminated from the Christian life. Professor Coe tells us when dealing with the religion of a mature mind that competition is going on for the mastery of life. You may call it, in theological terms, a struggle between Satan and the Spirit of God, or you may call it, in biological language, an effort to adjust ourselves to environment against unsocialized remnants of the ape and tiger nature. In any case, the contest is a fact that each of us knows for himself, irrespective of catechism and all other theories, whether biological or theological. It is evident that the division of the self is never entirely healed, and unity afterwards accomplished in the process of conversion is only partial. In a subconscious way, if not otherwise, we would naturally expect that the association of years would crop up occasionally. In the conversion process, the natural consequent of the divided self is what has been termed self-surrender. The struggle has continued until the ego seems to be almost rent asunder. One or the other of the contesting factors must give way, and finally the old self, the lower desires, gives up the battle and sometimes instantaneously, sometimes gradually, the misery, worry, and despair are changed to happiness, trust, and confidence. The unsettled, divided self becomes stable and united. 
This is the turning point in the process. It sometimes seems to be immediately due to physical causes, at least quite largely. The struggle becomes so great and therefore so wearying that the brain refuses to respond, bringing about temporarily a state of apathy and in exceptional cases, coma. It may be called a surrender of both sides, insomuch as neither one shows signs of activity. But when activity again takes place, or in cases of coma, when consciousness appears, the side of the good is dominant. Notice that this breakdown does not always take place, but it may, and more frequently does, in cases of sudden conversion. The alcoholic with diseased brain and weakened mentality is not able to stand much strain, but according to some answers from slum workers, he does not seem to be more than ordinarily subject to such breakdowns. In Mr. Hadley's account of the conversion of Jerry Macaulay, the following statement is given concerning the climax. There was a shock came into the room, something similar to a flash of lightning, which everyone present felt and saw. Jerry fell down on his side, prone on the floor, with tears streaming from his eyes. Oh, Jesus, you did come back. You did come back. Bless your dear name. Jerry's companions were so frightened by what they saw that they sprang from their knees, ran out of the house, and fled down the street. In a letter received from Mr. Hadley, he speaks as follows. I have never seen a convert so such signs as you speak of, falling to the floor, becoming unconscious, or any abnormal phenomena, since I came here. From the physiological standpoint, the exhaustion is caused by the turning of the energy into new channels and breaking up the associations with the old. If we could speak in so crass a way concerning processes of which we know little or nothing, we might say that the exhaustion is caused by the effort to connect the associations of this new cellular system, which is the basis of the ideal, with those which form the basis of the vital forces. Or shall we say that it is exhausting to turn the total vital energy into new courses? The same process is experienced in the breaking of any habit, but in a limited degree. For while the habit may touch a small part of the mental life, religion embraces the whole of man. End of part one, chapter ten. Religious conversion as a cure. What has been said regarding the physical is but an analogy drawn from the psychical, from the state of exhaustion and the evident endeavor to transfer the ego to the side of the forces of the good, with the help of additional motives advanced either by friends or by the self. Consciously or not, the transfer is made, and once made, the devil forces retreat. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. With the weakening and expulsion of the evil forces, there comes that unity of the ideals, feelings, and volitions, in fact the whole of life, which is a characteristic feeling in the conversion process. Professor James speaks of the conversion climax as follows. Let us hereafter, in speaking of the hot places in a man's consciousness, the group of ideas to which he devotes himself and from which he works, call it the habitual center of his personal energy, it makes a great difference to a man whether one set of his ideas or another be the center of his energy. And it makes a great difference as regards any set of ideas which he may possess, whether they become central or remain peripheral in him. To say that a man is converted means in these terms that a religious idea previously peripheral in his consciousness now take a central place and that religious aims form the habitual center of his energy. Now, if you ask of psychology just how the excitement shifts in a man's mental system and why aims that were peripheral become at a certain moment central, psychology has to reply that although she can give a general description of what happens, she is unable in a given case to account accurately for all the single forces at work. Neither an outside observer nor the subject who undergoes the process can explain fully how particular experiences are able to change one center of energy so decisively, or why they so often have to bide their hour to do so. The struggle and victory may be toward an end, which is distinctly defined, or it may be very confused. But it is against the old, and for the new, very clearly. And what we call self-surrender of the old may be as well named the acceptance of the new. It depends on the standpoint from which we view it. 
it may be further expressed or defined by saying that the desire and affection for the new life or for god or for jesus are so overpowering as to drive out all baser motives or ideas the self-surrender or religious victory is frequently shown first by a desire to proclaim the change which has been experienced in what is called confession or testimony logically following self-surrender is faith this is a condition of mind shown by its attitude towards all truth consistent with its lately formed determination to accept the new life this condition is one of receptivity toward the good while logically these can be separated in reality is difficult indeed impossible to draw the line between them for they are both factors of a process and these factors are so interwoven as to be inseparable faith could be defined as the acceptance of certain elements of the christian life as a belief in salvation as believing that you are saved but is not this the very point in self-surrender accepting the new believing in one's own salvation if they do not coincide the distinction might be made thus Self-surrender is the beginning of a process of which faith is the continuance. Both self-surrender and faith have a large effective element. The change effected by this whole process is great, whether it has come gradually or suddenly, regardless of what mental element may seem to dominate or what is the immediate antecedent of the change. Relieved of a great burden, as some express it, there is a feeling of peace and happiness in the unity achieved. Although psychologically the process of religious conversion does not stand alone, it is by far the most common of its class, and perhaps on account of this seems more closely related to normal processes. In everyday life we find mental experiences analogous to each factor of the conversion experience, and sometimes to the whole process. While there may be at times abnormal elements in conversion, it conforms more closely to the experiences of everyday life than one at first supposes. And why not? Are we not being converted more or less every day? Do we not break old habits and receive new revelations of truth that change us daily, making us different persons indeed today from what we were yesterday? Here again the difference should be emphasized. Religious conversion, in contradistinction from other experiences, comprehends the whole mental life. The result of conversion, or perhaps we could better say, the final part of the process, differs with different individuals. One experience, which is very common, is the feeling of newness, and properly so when we consider the change involved. The convert lives in a new world because he sees everything from a new point of view, Everything appears beautiful, and the world calls forth exclamations of admiration. The convert suddenly becomes an optimist of the most pronounced type. He wonders why he did not see the good in every person and thing before, and a smile is upon his face because he sees the beautiful significance of all things. This newness brings him joy and freedom, partially because he feels justified, as if his sins were forgiven and he had come into harmony with God and the world. It is the joy and freedom of the prisoner released from his bonds. He may appear overjoyful, ultra-confident, and super-optimistic, but he is sure that he is normal, and wonders why others fail to experience as much joy as he. He feels confident that it will never decrease, that he will always be equally happy. The feelings, no doubt, fluctuate from time to time and become much calmer, but the attitude towards the new life and the old remains constant. Religion thus acts in a double way on the feelings. It does arouse them, but it also aids to calm them. They may become much excited, but there is also in religion the motives for control. Luba compares the experience of newness to that felt by the youth who has sung for the first time his love tale to his lady and receives the assurance of requited love. The afflicted one who has walked through a dark passage and suddenly comes to the light, and this is undoubtedly true. To reiterate, conversion is not unlike the experiences of everyday life. Mr. Luba also suggests, as an explanation of this phenomena, changes in the physiological processes 
he makes as a conjecture, and no one can do more than conjecture, the following. We might rest content with the explanation that we have to do with an emotional delusion in which the affective state colors external sense impressions, but we can perhaps make another suggestion in this wise. The conversion crisis may be supposed to have for physiological counterpart a redistribution of energy involving general modifications of the association paths or an alteration of rhythms changing the nervous regime it is natural enough to admit that to a psychic turmoil so intense as that of conversion corresponds a no less considerable physiological commotion setting up a new arrangement of the motor mechanism we know the alcoholic to be the embodiment of selfishness but when he is converted, the broadening of his horizon is shown most plainly here, for he comes into close sympathy with the world outside. He is a part of wider life for which he must work, and for which he feels a great attachment. He is capable of self-sacrifice which would astonish anyone acquainted with him in his alcoholic days. This element may show itself in connection with the greater freedom of which we speak above. It may really be a great factor in bringing it about. Coupled with this, in what may at first seem to be a contradictory principle, is an awakening of the self. The self-consciousness is magnified, and the convert feels his importance. This does not take the old form of trying to make everyone and everything work together to satisfy his petty selfish desires, but he is important in the advancement of the world along the road of righteousness. No longer is he looked down upon. He is a man and recognizes it. No more is he held in bondage. He is free from all men and from himself. He is master where he used to be servant. He is ruler where he was serf. One can easily see that the form of awakening of the self does not minister to selfishness, but rather annihilates it. In no way is the lack of selfishness so noticeable as in the changed attitude towards his family and friends, and this in turn is an assistance to him in his struggle against his enslaving habit. There is a reinforcement of altruistic feelings and impulses, and his natural affections are stirred. The indifference which he formerly showed to the misery and grief of his family has vanished, and he recognizes the claims which the members have upon him. Another motive is hereby furnished for his abstinence and reform, and he becomes a natural husband and father, similar to his pre-alcoholic days. The other natural impulses are revived, such as his duty to the state as a citizen, and this is also an additional reason for his change of habits. All motives, however insignificant they may appear to the onlooker, are of great importance to the person who has to weigh the smallest action in the balance, lest by association or suggestion, it may lead him to the bondage which he has so recently escaped. A characteristic of the new life, we might say a part also of the conversion process, is a revival of cheerfulness, courage, and hope. This is closely connected with the feeling of newness, and is especially helpful to the alcoholic. When free from alcohol, when approximately sober, the alcoholic is depressed and discouraged. He sees no future except a drunkard's life in a drunkard's grave. Little use for him to strive and struggle. He could not conquer. He has tried and failed, and he decides not to try again, for there is nothing ahead of him except failure and degradation. His only pleasure is negative. He can down his sorrow and drink, but at conversion he is filled with joy and hope, for he is free and the future is bright and promising. No longer he trudges along with head downcast and heart heavy. No longer he feels the future. He is encouraged and therefore brave. The coward of yesterday is the hero of today. He fears neither men nor demons. He is strong in his newly found love and friendship and unshaken in his determination and hope. This is an important element in the change which comes to him, enabling him to battle against the habit which he has feared and striven against in vain. This encouragement and hope give the alcoholic confidence in himself, and this from a suggestive standpoint is half the battle. He knows now that he can accomplish what before he thought impossible, 
and going forth with this confidence he is greatly helped. It is a matter in which others can do nothing. It depends upon him, and the expectancy with which he starts out is the harbinger of the result. This confidence which he has in himself is largely due to the expectation of help from God, which help according to his testimony is duly provided. He expects to be guided in a way that shall lead him away from temptation and to be given strength to overcome the strongest desire for alcohol. To say that this is suggestion is probably true, but to say that it is suggestion only is doing violence to the united testimony of thousands whose evidence is as valuable as any in the land. Of one of the chief consequences of conversion, in what undoubtedly seems the most miraculous one, is complete annulling of the lower temptations, and in the particular case of the alcoholic, the appetite for alcohol which for years was irresistible. The fact is marvelous, but none the less true, and may be shown by references to many cases. We might expect a condition where the man would be strengthened, so that when the appetite was strongest and the craving had returned, he would by a great effort be able to withstand it. But in so many cases, it is not this way. The appetite is gone without a trace. In the description of conversion, the feelings and intellect have been referred to, but the will has seemed to play no part. Lest the fact should be misrepresented, let us devote a little space to the discussion of the will in conversion, for it is an important factor. Conversion shows very plainly what a great effect a mental crisis has upon an almost totally destroyed will. The will is necessary, and the alcoholic must work as well as pray. As Mr. Stanley says, thus man, by appealing to the rain god, instead of using scientific means to promote rainfall or to supply lack of irrigation, has hindered his development for centuries. So the alcoholic must put forth some effort, however small, to help himself if he wishes external aid. Here again we have a seeming paradox. If self-surrender means anything at all, it certainly means the giving up of the personal will. The convert then has no voice in the matter. He is led, he does not lead. He seems to sink will and all into a more comprehensive mind which bears him resistlessly along. It will be remembered that we had the same apparent paradox in regard to the self, and there he came to himself in the process and felt his importance in self-consciousness, probably before this in the process, and it may be as the cause of this, we have the awakening of the will, awakening as though from a long sleep, the sleep of years, and thoroughly refreshed, it takes its rightful position and begins to assume control. Of course it is understood that by the will, is meant the self as willing. The effort of the will in the direction of the good is felt by all the other mental faculties and gives direction to the turn which the whole self is to take, and consciously as well as subconsciously its work is valuable and shows in every part of the process. Ribo evidently does not give the will much credit in the process, for he looks upon it very much like a fixed idea or an irresistible impulse. This seems a little extreme, and although they are undoubtedly allied phenomena in some respects, there is more conscious purpose and definite will displayed in conversion than in the fixed idea, and in the general process there seems a well-defined line of demarcation. Flader gives the place of the will in conversion as follows. Proceeding to ask how the consciousness of redemption is arrived at, we are struck at the outset by a remarkable statement which recurs regularly in the history of religion in connection with such tendencies, viz. that instruction and theoretical reflection do not of themselves suffice to produce religious faith, but that it rests on processes of feeling that reach down to the depths of the soul and point to its mysterious nature and origin. Such practical truths as have power to determine the life and the ideals of life are of this nature, can never be known theoretically only. There may be knowledge about them, even a notional apprehension of their meaning, but they are not known 
in the full sense of knowledge, so long as they are not experienced as a living power in the heart. This experience may not always be equally profound and clear, but the full decisive experience comes about only when the will lays hold of itself of the truth, by the power of which it feels itself laid hold of, appropriates it, recognizes it, takes it up into the heart as the ruling power and dearest possession of life, in short, where the saving truth is appropriated in living faith. But how can the will come to appropriate a truth which requires of it the abnegation of its own natural and personal desires? The will is not able to take upon itself the pain so long as the activity of its natural desires is productive entirely or predominantly of pleasure. But this is not permanently the case. For this the divine wisdom and justice in the natural and moral world order has sufficiently provided. Gone is the painful sense of sin for the cause of it. The disunion of self-will with the divine will has been removed. The New Testament is not a textbook on psychology, but it is one on religion and it is worth noticing that it lays considerable emphasis on the work of the will in the process of conversion. The will is a factor, and an important factor, both in passive and active, the positive and negative work required of it. Early in this chapter, it was said that little could be definitely stated concerning the divine element in conversion, since by its nature it could not be scientifically analyzed. But because we cannot analyze it, it does not follow that it is unreasonable to believe it. We can do no better at this point than to present two brief quotations from Professor James. To plead the organic causation of the religious state of mind, then, in refutation of its claims to possess superior spiritual value, it is quite illogical and arbitrary, unless one have already worked out in advance some psychophysical theory connecting spiritual values in general with determinate sorts of physiological change. Otherwise, none of our thoughts and feelings, not even our scientific doctrines, not even our disbeliefs, could retain any value as revelation of the truth. For every one of them, without exception, flows from the state of their possessor's body at the time. Psychology and religion are both in perfect harmony up to this point, since both admit that there are forces seemingly outside of the conscious individual that bring redemption to his life. Nevertheless, psychology, defining these forces as subconscious, and speaking of their effect as due to incubation or cerebration, implies that they do not transcend the individual's personality. And herein she diverges from Christian theology, which insists that they are direct supernatural operations of the deity. The mistake is frequently made of holding that if we have explained the way in which the mind operates in conversion, we have thereby eliminated the supernatural, or rather we should say, the divine element. As well might we say when we have described the law of nature, we have proved therefore that nature requires no power to operate the elements which conform to this law, simply because we know how it is operated, or that when we know how the machine works, it therefore needs no power to operate it. Flaterer, from the standpoint of philosophy, speaks very decidedly as follows. This wonderful change is not arbitrarily brought about by man himself, but experienced as a thing that has happened to him. It appears to him as the operation of a higher power, as the gift of undeserved divine favor of grace. And is this not in truth the case? Careful thought, in fact, can do nothing but confirm what the believer holds as a truth requiring no proof. Mr. Everett defined religion as a feeling toward a supernatural presence manifesting itself in truth, goodness, and beauty. This makes religion a purely psychological matter, but his subject leads him to do so. If, however, there is a feeling toward a supernatural presence on our part, is it unnatural or unreasonable that that presence should respond to our gropings? The testimony of the individual experiencing the conversion, even admitting that it is not the best, ought to be worth as much, probably more, than the opinion of a person entirely unacquainted with religion. There is in so many cases a feeling of power from without, a testimony of experience directly 
opposed to the psychological theory, as we may call it. Recognizing the objection which was made at the beginning of so many persons being unable to read or write their physical experiences, yet there is no testimony to the contrary, and the experience of those who witness concerning it is more valuable than the ideas of those who simply theorize about it. As the last topic in this chapter, the part played by the subconscious will be discussed, and therein the relation of this religious experience to hypnotism and suggestion. There seems to be not the least doubt that the subconscious is an important factor in the process of religious conversion. To say this is only to state a fact which again confirms one of the main contentions of this chapter, viz. that religious conversion deals with the whole man. But to say that conversion has to deal with the subconscious is only to misrepresent the facts. With like stimuli, it is known that persons react differently on account of the difference in the operation of their mental processes. In their temperament, we say, persons who have sudden conversions have them rather than the gradual ones, not because it just happens that way, but because they are so constituted that the religious influences react in that way. If we know the person, Psychologically, we can prophesy quite correctly the type of his conversion, whether it be sudden or gradual, quiet or excited. This is simply saying that of conversion we may know scientific facts which admit of classification. The divine element is not eliminated because we can do this. This has no bearing on this subject. For whether the power which causes conversion is autonomous or divine, it conforms to one type when it passes through one variety of mold. It is rather an argument for the divine element than it is orderly. Professor Coe, who has made the most exhaustive examination of the subject of which the writer knows, gives three sets of factors favorable to the attainment of a striking, and therefore of a sudden religious transformation. There are as follows, a certain temperament, expectation, and a tendency to automatisms, and passive suggestibility. Given these three known quantities, the unknown type, the type of conversion, can be predicted. In the cases which were thoroughly examined, those who experienced a great transformation, almost without exception, expected the change. Of these, 70% were of such a temperament that sensibility predominated. 12% had intellect in the ascendancy, and 18% will. Further of these, 82% were of sanguine or melancholic temperament. We therefore see from these investigations that the temperament favorable to sudden or striking conversion is sanguine or melancholic, with sensibility predominating. The majority of these has exhibited some automatic phenomena, as example given, hallucinations, and these correspond almost exactly with the passives in hypnotic experiments. Of course, the number of cases examined was small, and necessarily so, on account of the thoroughness of the examination, and although there were too few to warrant us in making too sweeping generalization, they correspond so closely with what we should naturally expect that they must have considerable weight. We can now see why, apart from the fact that if the alcoholic is to be cured, the break with this controlling habit must necessarily be sharp and abrupt. His conversion is a sudden one. We know that his intellect and will are so impaired that he is largely a creature of his feeling and can be classed primarily among those with sensibility predominating. In temperament, so far as one can be arbitrarily classified as belonging to any one temperament, the alcoholic is melancholic. We know alcoholics to be passives. For a class, they are more easily hypnotized than the average and on account of their disease are subject to automatisms, being victims of hallucinations and vivid dreams. This gives all the elements that Professor Coe demands for a sudden and striking conversion, except the expectation. This must be left to the investigation of the individual case, but it would seem that if the alcoholic's hope is an escape from suffering, if he knows anything of the necessity of a sudden break with the habit, and most of them do recognize this, and if he comes under mission preaching, which is the style usually most effective with him, he must therefore expect this sudden and striking change. If this is so, 
we furnish Professor Coe with another illustration of his classification. With the convert who has come into life in a sudden and abrupt way, the conscious element in the process is undoubtedly large. This is shown by comparative scarcity or absence of the intellectual and volitional element at the time of the climax, and the inability of the convert to give his reasons for the change, the very little self-direction at the time, and the abruptness of the decision with few or no motives. The conscious and the subconscious interact, and in no case of conversion, however deliberate, is the subconscious element eliminated any more than the conscious element is absent in sudden conversion, but the proportion of the two varies. What shows itself as a sudden development in consciousness is undoubtedly the result of a subconscious development which suddenly ripens and thrusts itself into consciousness, apparently ready-made, but of what this process, this development, in the subconscious area is, and of its cause, we are entirely ignorant, and our guesses will depend upon our point of view. Now, it is plain that if God operates in the human mind in conversion, that is, if there is such a thing as a divine element in conversion, it must be largely through the subconscious, and especially is this true in cases of sudden conversion. This being so, we must recognize the similarity between these cases and hypnotism, whether we wish to or not. In fact, some persons in relating their conversion experiences necessarily couple with them a hypnotic element, as example given. It seems to me now hypnotic. There has been a great objection to the recognition of this relation among some religious people, not because they were in a position to confute the statement, but because they considered it detrimental to Christianity on account of the ill repute of hypnotism. On the other hand, because some persons, not particularly jealous for the good name of Christianity, have seen a relation between conversion and hypnotism, they have identified the two. The position that appeals to the writer is the mean. He recognizes both the similarity and the difference. True, we recognize the almost total similarity in some revivals where methods are employed which a trained hypnotist might well eschew, but it is unfair to class all conversions as revival conversions, or all revival conversions as of this objectionable stamp. Even admitting the hypnotic and suggestive element in most alcoholic conversions, for undoubtedly it is there, it is not the use of it, but the abuse of it that is objectionable. The same thing can be said of many other forces that at times are abused. For instance, there is a certain authority which religion can justly claim on account of its nature. The use of this is justifiable, but oh, what abuses have been wrought in its name. Mr. Granger says concerning hypnotism and conversion. We are now prepared to take up a topic referred to before conversion by hypnotic suggestion. The reader will perhaps remember that in other kinds of conversion, there was a more or less prolonged period of preparation for the change as the soul came to harmony of intellectual judgment or to peace after stress. As against these modes, instantaneous conversion seems explicable by saying that the mind is occupied by suggestion when it is in a suggestible state, when, that is, it is subject to neurasthenia. It is fortunate, of course, that the same nervous weakness which lays a man open to control by passing impulses should now and then subject him to a good impulse. But this weakness is not a normal state, and there is something inexpressibly repulsive in the idea that the religious life should necessarily begin in this way. Jesus did not so view conversion. The writer does not feel the same repulsion concerning the matter, which Mr. Granger apparently does. If, as some would have it, the hypnotic or suggestive element were eliminated, religion would lose thereby. We do not recognize the part that the subconscious plays in our everyday life, or we would see to eliminate this would be to confine religion necessarily to a lesser part of man's nature, instead of holding its present important position of affecting the whole man, conscious and subconscious, 
if this is a weakness mr granger says it is a weakness that he shares with the rest of mankind for no one is free from it and however much it may be deprecated its importance in the mental processes is profound if it is true as was said above when god works in man he works through the subconscious these subconscious factors should be lauded rather than deprecated further the wisdom of having these subconscious factors so prominent in conversion is apparent because the greater stability of the change thereby were it in the mental and not deeply rooted in the physical the passing change of circumstances would bring about a corresponding change in the desires and what promised to become a permanent change would be temporarily only here is to be found the distinction between the purely hypnotic and pseudo conversion and the real conversion when the subject awake he wonders what it all meant and laughs at the thought of the part he played in the revival or else it may last for a week or a month and then fade away but the true conversion takes a permanent hold of the whole man with cases like the alcoholics the fact that the conversion has roots in the physical is doubly fortunate insomuch that the disease to be cured has its hold in the same part of our being as here we have perhaps a further reason why conversion has been so successful as a cure nor can the writer agree with mr granger that jesus did not recognize and use the subconscious element in conversion the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the voice thereof but canst thou not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth so is every one that is born of the spirit canst not tell whence it cometh because it enters through the subconscious it is certain that most of the conversions of jesus were instantaneous and most of his cures were of the same kind to say that both of these were of divine origin par excellence does not explain how they worked in the human mind or contrarywise to say that they were of subconscious character does not detract in the least from their divine significance the same can be said of the apostles who followed jesus peter who knew well the methods of jesus gives us one of the best examples of healing of a suggestive or hypnotic character which we have anywhere peter fastens his eyes on a lame man and demands that the man look at him and his companion peter being the spokesman the man not being able to look at both at once must have looked at him here is the first condition of hypnotic suggestion fixation of attention and it is aided by that most powerful ally the fixation of the eyes we are told that the man gave heed unto them peter begins to speak and ends by commanding abruptly walk following up this verbal suggestion with a dramatic one he takes the man by the right hand and lifts him up could any trained hypnotist have done it better yet this does not explain the power at the back of it giving the suggestive treatment all its due we have yet to explain how the congenitally lame grown to manhood could be cured for this exceeds all feats of suggestive treatment known to science and even supposing that we have some functional disease which easily yields to hypnotic treatment the divine element is none the more eliminated paul's work at paphos was evidently of a similar character this is sufficient to show that the disciples and jesus also did not deny the employment of the subconscious elements and methods which might be considered of a partially hypnotic character so much as some of the followers today they use them not abuse them now the altruism which is thus seen to be the gist of all mental healing is the very essence of christianity religion has in it all there is in mental therapeutics and has in its best form it teaches temperance in the broadest sense high ideals and dependence upon the highest alone this preserves those who know it by practice as well as by precept from most of the ills that make up the list of those curable by mental methods but further it teaches a wise submission to the inevitable a freedom from care and worry and a spirit of hopefulness 
and these are the exact conditions aimed at by all mental practices. Living up to these ideals will do everything for us that can be done. The cure of the drunkard in conversion is one peculiar to itself, but which contains elements found in hypnotic and allied practices, and it necessarily must if it embraces the whole man in its scope. The manner of the conversion we can partially describe and explain, but the power at the back of it remains a mystery. Those who claim it is divine have much both a philosophical and theological nature to warrant them in their contention, and from a psychological standpoint it is admissible. Conversion is not alone of religious experiences to use the subconscious, for it is employed in such experiences as inspiration and revelation. In religious conversion, then, we have the most efficacious cure of alcoholism. This is scientifically established. The reasons for this are that, apart from the divine element, there is instilled a desire for reform, and a change of associations and an emotional substitute are provided. Different from other cures, religion is concerned with the whole man, and thus is capable of reaching a deep-seated trouble. The escape from physical misery is a powerful motive, greater than that of escape from sin or future punishment. When self-surrender places the charge of the self and the power of the best impulses, the subconsciousness works a wonderful change in the entire system, and frequently there is never a desire for another drink. The divine element, although inexplicable, is clearly established and cannot be explained away. End of chapter 10, part 2 Hypnotism and Other Cures There is considerable difference of opinion concerning the definition of the term cure, when applied to alcoholism. Some go so far as to say that there is no such thing as a cure, that is, that the alcoholic never returns to a normal condition where he is able to partake of a glass of alcoholic liquor without danger of the recurrence of the impulse to excessive use. This is undoubtedly so, but it may also be true that the nervous system of the patient was such that, prior to his first glass, this same condition was present to a less degree and this may partially account for his alcoholism. This claim of no cure, however, is an extreme view. Those who believe in physical rather than mental treatment object to the use of this term in cases where the drink impulse is annihilated, but no further treatment has been given. They claim that the drink impulse is only a symptom, and to eradicate the symptom is not to cure the disease. It seems as though here the disease theory is being exaggerated so that the term cure can only be pertinent in cases where certain remedies have been used. For example, it is asserted that such methods as religion, temperance pledges and hypnotism do not cure. They simply remove the symptom, the drink craze or impulse. The writer believes in the disease theory of alcohol as surely as its most ardent devotee, but in all that he has read on the subject, he has been unable to find any other symptom of the disease than this. In fact, as far as he can understand, this is the whole disease, and when this is eliminated, the disease as such is cured. There is in many cases a certain condition of the nervous system due to heredity, traumatism, or a variety of causes, which is favorable to the development of the disease, but this is the case in all diseases. A person must be in a certain bodily state before even a cold can be contracted, but this bodily state is not the cold. Notwithstanding all that had been said concerning the disease of inebriety or alcoholism, and the drink craze or impulse only as a symptom, no one has been bold enough to assert that a person had alcoholism who had never drunk alcohol, or experienced this impulse. On the other hand, it is claimed that the disease continues after the symptom. The drink impulse is removed. The cessation of the drink impulse is not the cure. It is only a half, and remission in the progress of the disease which will return or appear in some other states of degeneration and disease. Here is a confusion. There are some mental diseases of which the drink impulse is only a symptom, but these diseases are not or should not be called inebriety or alcoholism. If we are speaking of the latter, the above quotation in the opinion of the writer is overstated. The ravages of alcoholism upon the nervous system are fully recognized. 
This can be seen from chapter 2. But the results of the disease are not the disease. If deafness or blindness results from a case of fever, 20 years after the fever disappears, shall we say that the patient still has the disease because he continues to be blind or deaf? No one would say that a person is completely normal the instant the drink impulse is removed. The degeneration of body and mind is clearly seen, and the need of recuperation is very apparent. Nothing that can be done to restore the diseased tissue to the normal condition should be neglected. Yet let us distinguish between the disease and the results of the disease, and let us recognize that the disease can be cured while the results may never all be remedied. In fact, this is the case, for the results of alcoholism are never wholly repaired. Because the dire effects of alcohol excess are recognized, the benefits of the physical treatment are apparent. The patient needs medical treatment, as other organs beside those of the nervous system are diseased, the stomach and liver being most likely to suffer. The nourishment for which the nerve cells have so long been in need can only be furnished when these organs are restored to their normal function. The assistance of bath, massage, electricity, rest, outdoor recreation, and a few drugs have proved of great benefit in eliminating the effects of disease, after the disease itself has been cured. Sometimes it has been found that local irritation, especially of the rectum, pelvis, or sexual organs, has produced a profound nervous depression, which in persons predisposed to alcoholism causes excess. The value of surgery in these cases has been fully proved as complete recovery from inebriety has followed the operations. Any treatment which is found remedial in allowing nervous irritation or depression will be beneficial in the treatment of alcoholism, as the endeavor to relieve mental or physical pain frequently causes alcoholic excess. Other remedies for pain are recommended. It is rarely, if ever necessary, to try to rid the patient of his liking for the taste of alcohol, for this the alcoholic seldom has. The writer has met only one man who affirmed that he liked the taste of alcohol. Sometimes alcoholic beverages are absolutely distasteful, but the effect on the nervous system is what is desired. However great the nervous craving may be, it seldom lasts longer than ten days after the indulgence is discontinued, and never more than twenty days. Of course, under certain conditions, it may return again, and this is what it is necessary to prevent in trying to cure alcoholism. On account of the short duration of the craving, except in cases which are very severe, or where there is no desire for reform, it is not necessary to keep the alcoholic under restraint for a great length of time, but it is frequently advisable for the first few days. This largely depends on the amount of cooperation given by the patient. Restraint alone is not sufficient for a cure, but it may be a necessary prerequisite. Many institutions depend upon moral influence, social environment, and a few tonics administered to assist in building up the body during the period of rest. In a few cases, the drink impulse stops suddenly, without any apparent cause. It seems to just die out. Some patients, after they have been treated by every method, and all has been done to cure them without avail, suddenly recover. This is often concomitant with some bodily change which reacts on the nervous system, such as the climatic change in women between the ages of 40 and 50, but more frequently not even remote causes like this can be posited. Apart from the suggestive influence which they may have, the numerous specifics advertised for the cure of alcoholism are largely valueless. Besides some tonic, most of them contain a drug which produces the same stimulative feeling as that of alcohol, and may be even more harmful. As long as this is taken, alcohol is not needed, but as soon as this is discontinued, the patient again resorts to his former indulgence. As in some cases of morphinism, the remedy is simply opium in another form, and thus does away with the customary portion of the morphine. These specifics are largely substitutes, not remedies. There have lately appeared some cures of a secret character, administered by selected physicians or at certain institutions, which have had some success in curing alcohol and drug addictions. Chief among these is the Keeley cure. It has been supposed that the cure was of a suggestive character, and the physician in charge of one of the Keeley Institutes admitted this to the writer. The cure is, of course, secret, and only a surmise can be made regarding it. The following quotation may give a more accurate account of the supposed treatment. 
the lawyer frankly gave the details of his experience to all inquirers and to many who did not inquire when he first arrived at the institute keeley asked him if he had in his satchel any whiskey or brandy the answer was i have both give them to me responded the doctor i wish you to keep on drinking as usual but i will empty your bottles and fill them with a pure article the bottles were filled and refilled by keeley as fast as emptied the craving for drink disappeared in a short time but the orders of the doctor to keep on drinking were strictly followed notwithstanding that nausea which attended every swallow became so severe that the very thought of the custom intoxicant excited it the patients who after a longer or shorter period were dismissed from the institute were exhorted to continue taking a certain liquid tonic which keeley furnished to avoid visiting saloons and to abstain entirely from even tasting an intoxicating beverage keeley forewarned them that a return to their drinking habits within a week would be fatal and that if the resumption did not take place till after a month's abstinence their condition would be worse than before the treatment commenced not a few heeded the admonition and their reformation has continued with scarcely a lapse up to the present time that a double chloride of gold if there be such an orous salt was the sole or chief drug employed by keeley or his disciples to produce certain conditions is open to very grave suspicions why did he demand that the lawyer should surrender the whiskey and brandy in his possession and drink a pure article which he claimed to possess the attorney might have told him but curiously enough he did not that his own whiskey and brandy were the best which money could buy in the market but the shrewd keeley knew that neither these nor the combination with the gold chloride would remove the crave nor produce the desirable nausea a sensation as hayden calls it akin to seasickness he must add to the pure substitute increasing quantities of apomorphine or some other nausea which would cause an abhorrence delightfully overwhelming that the frequent hypodermic use of strychnine with some other tonic auriferous or not kept up the strength of the patients during their three weeks treatment at the institute is highly probable that the disgust at the very thought of whiskey was not permanent is evident from the fact that when one of the reformed alcoholics ventured in a saloon and tasted an intoxicating liquor not the slightest nausea ensued and the lost crave soon returned dr thatcher in eighteen twenty six mentioned several methods which have been employed successfully to overcome the love of strong drink one of these seems to have anticipated the keeley cure he says i once tempted a negro man who was habitually fond of ardent spirits to drink some rum which i had placed in his way and into which i had put a few grains of tartar emetic the tartar sickened and puked him to such a degree that he supposed himself to be poisoned i was much gratified by observing that he could not bear the sight nor smell of spirits for two years afterwards if this account of the cure is correct and the conclusions well drawn and there seems no reason to doubt whether the cure is a suggestive one and in so far is related to hypnotic treatment the suggestion that the whiskey will nauseate the alcoholic is frequently well received and proves effective this is a rather heroic method of receiving suggestions but if it is successful in curing the alcoholic it is probably worth while if we receive this as an adequate account of dr keeley's methods it is amusing to read his arrangement of hypnotism and suggestion but this is necessary for the protection of his business personally the writer accepts the keeley cure as he does other cures he has known cases of complete recovery of long standing where this method has been used and although there are more pleasant ways of getting suggestions the cure is the main point the efficacy of any method or of combined methods commends them for the disease has reached such serious proportions that we cannot afford to reject or discourage any method of cure because it is not our cure but cheerfully receive all the assistance regardless of the source it has not been directly within the providence of this book to discuss the physical cures we are concerned with those only which we may call mental hence the inadequate treatment of the former the testimony concerning the efficacy of physical remedies is convincing 
the best result should come from a combination of moral, mental, and physical treatment. There are undoubtedly some cases which are comparatively hopeless, and no treatment can help them. Dr. Crowther speaks of one class very pertinently as follows. Another class of cases come under medical care that are still more difficult to treat. They are generally young men, sons of wealthy parents, and men who from bad mental surroundings, bad company, ignorance, and neglect are periodic or continuous drinkers. Further, some cases are almost hopeless on account of the attitude of the parents and friends. The kindest wife and most indulgent parents are very much in the way of numerous cures and prove to be, instead of the best friends, the worst enemies the alcoholic has. As Palmer so well says, it is often said of an inebriate in a tone of wonder and reproach that he has so good a wife, one who loved and indulged him. The universality of good wives to intemperate husbands suggests an inquiry into the connection they may bear and the influence they may exercise, however innocently, in the downfall of their husbands. A good woman is not necessarily a good wife. On the contrary, she may be, without meaning it, and in spite of her conscious efforts to be otherwise, a very bad wife to her husband, and that in spite of her gentleness, docility, piety, and excessive love of him. And it is possible that he might not be in the position he occupies today if, instead of possessing these qualities, she had developed stronger, even more selfish traits of character. The continued exercise of the spirit of unselfishness on the wife's part has helped in no small degree to restrain the husband from denying himself in a hundred ways, and all innocently, but not less fatally, has fanned the flames of self-indulgence until his power of resistance, insidiously encroached upon by loving hands, has finally succumbed to her persistency, and his great preservative against any strong temptation to which he may be constitutionally inclined has become so weakened that he is unable to cope with the strong desire for drink when it manifests itself. The subject of hypnotism and its relation to alcoholism is one which has for the past few years attracted considerable attention on account of its value in this disease, which has proved so difficult for treatment by the medical profession. In a meeting of the New York Academy of Medicine, referred to in the last chapter among all the experienced and prominent physicians present, there was no one who had any kind of medicine to suggest as a cure. On the contrary, two other forms of cure were recommended. One of these, conversion, we have already discussed. The other, hypnotism, we will take up now. In the account of the meeting, one address is reported as follows. As to the treatment of inebriates, the speaker, Dr. S. A. Knopf, said that he approved of moral suasion, arguments, and hypnotic suggestion. Knowing the terrible ravages of alcoholism, and hearing this testimony from men, some of whom witness in alcoholic wards thousands of cases a year, if hypnotism holds out a hope, which medicine does not, it is not strange that attention has been attracted to hypnotism in these cases. In Europe, many successful cases are reported by eminent and trustworthy men. Boysen, Tucky, Leydame, Forel, Aiden, Nielsen, von Rentergen, Widmer, Corval, Wetterstrand, Schrenk Natzing, Bernheim, and others have reported many cures of all kinds of alcoholic diseases and vices. We have also good reports from Mason, Quackenboss, and others in this country. The experience of the writer confirms this, for in cases of dipsomania and chronic alcoholism, which he has treated 80%, have been helped. And if the time of abstinence were long enough to warrant the statement, it could also be said that many of these had been complete cures. The subjects treated have been almost without exception those who had tried other methods without avail. They wished to be treated by hypnotism, not because they had much faith in the remedial value of this method, but because it was the last resort. They might be classed as hopeless cases. It might be stated in this connection that hypnotism is not the grand panacea which some persons suppose. It will not cure regardless of circumstances. It is not a super mundane prohibitive. The experience of the writer with hundreds of persons who were sufferers, directly or indirectly, from alcoholism shows the current mistaken ideas on the subject by the most intelligent people. A lady may call and desire her husband treated without his knowledge or presence. Men come of their own volition and wish to be compelled to stop drinking. They attend that 
it shall be a battle royal, their appetite on one side, the power of the rider on the other, their part will be that of the spectators of the fray. They hope that the power will win, providing it does not cause them any inconvenience. Or another may be willing to come once, submit to the force, and leave the house entirely cured. He expects a habit which has been continued for twenty to fifty years to be cured in from ten to fifteen minutes. Hypnotism is only a help to the patient. In very few, if any cases, can the patient be forced to renounce alcohol. Cases to be quoted later will show this. A person must wish to be cured to get the best and most frequently any result. This is the almost universal testimony of all persons who have had any experience with alcoholics, regardless of the method of treatment. Nothing that the patient or his friends can do to help should be despised. For all means possible should be used, but... As Forel says, hypnotism enables the drunkard to take the first step towards reformation and cure, and this is most frequently the difficult part of the process. In what seems the greatest drawback to the cure of alcoholism by hypnotism, in all of the cures except that by religious conversion, is the fact that the patient is surrounded by the same environment after he has been treated. Even the strongest form of suggestion of a hypnotic nature, when given for a few minutes daily or weekly, can hardly hope to complete with the legion of suggestions which the environment inevitably gives. Here is one way in which religious conversion excels hypnotism as a method of treatment. It gives a new environment, different companions, a place to spend a portion at least of the spare time, and a new train of thoughts. The life changed in other respects must inevitably carry with it a change in respect to environment also. Notwithstanding the great disadvantage under which hypnotism works, the number and character of the cures by this method are really marvelous. Quotations like the following are testimony to the efficacy of this method of treatment. I have treated during the last 12 years nearly 200 cases of chronic alcoholism and found hypnotic suggestion has proved completely curative in about one-third of these. This is a good result considering that in no case was the patient confined in a retreat or kept away from his home or business longer than a month. In nearly all cases I have seen partial or temporary success, and in many instances where there was relapse, cure would, I think, have resulted had circumstances been more favorable. Since I came to London about ten years ago, I have treated seventy-six cases of dipsomania and chronic alcoholism by means of hypnotic suggestion. A. Recoveries. Twenty-eight cases recovered. By this I mean that the patient ceased drinking during treatment, and that, as far as I have been able to learn, they have remained total abstainers to the present date, or to that of the last report received, although the earliest of these cases has now passed nearly ten years without relapse, I should not describe the patient as cured, for it is possible the disease might return. One of my patients relapsed after eight years total abstinence. Of the above 28 cases, 17 were males, 11 females. The average age was 40. Average number of hypnotic treatments, 30. Average length of time since recovery, 3 years. All the patients in this class, as well as in the two other groups, belong to the educated classes. B. Cases improved. These numbered 36, 26 males and 10 females. Average age, 39. Average number of hypnotic treatments, 32. Average length of time since treatment, three and a half years. The results obtained in this class varied widely. The best case abstained for eight years, then relapsed, but has now again abstained for six months. In a considerable portion of the remainder of the improvement has been marked and valuable. Several other patients who formerly lived lives of drunkenness are now engaged in useful work and only drink at rare intervals. C. Failures. These numbered 12, 10 males and 2 females, average age 43, average number of hypnotic treatments 20. In the majority of the above cases, it was impossible to get patients to cease drinking during treatment, which in 6 out of 12 was very short. In more than one instance, however, although the treatment was prolonged and carried out under the favorable conditions, no benefit was obtained. The conditions necessary for cures are two in number. First, a willing subject, and second, a subject susceptible to hypnotic suggestions. 
by the first condition is not meant a passively willing subject but an actively willing subject one who is desirous of being cured and who will do all that he can to further the cure two cases by the way of example may be cited d f a brass worker aged thirty nine parents both have stainers knew nothing of grandparents he began drinking at the age of twenty three and after one year of moderate drinking began to drink heavily and continued to do so until he entered new haven as a tramp not having anywhere to sleep he applied to calvary industry home and was there given assistance he was brought to the writer for treatment after being without alcohol for eight days he proved to be an excellent subject and went into deep sleep in four minutes after watching one other subject who was hypnotized appropriate suggestions were given regarding alcohol and also tobacco the latter being freely used by the patient a post-hypnotic suggestion was given to the effect that he would give his pipe and tobacco to the superintendent of the home the suggestion was carried out as directed it should be taken into consideration that although the patient did not object to coming for treatment yet he consented largely on account of the solicitations of the superintendent with whom it was desirable for all the inmates of the home to be on good terms from this time august sixth until november thirteenth he was hypnotized twenty-nine times and during that time did not touch alcohol or tobacco although he had ample opportunity to obtain both one of the suggestions given most frequently was that alcohol in any form would nauseate him not long after this treatment was stopped he went to a neighboring town where he had lived for some years during which time he had had most of his drinking experience here he met a number of his boon companions whom he had not seen for some time and the only way for them to show him their joy in his return was to treat him to beer he drank some and became violently sick vomiting in an alarming manner this however did not prevent his taking more the more he drank the more sick he became until he was taken home and the physician summoned he was in bed for four days not able to retain either food or drink until as he told the writer he thought he was going to die he did not repeat the experiment for some time but finally after several unsuccessful attempts he was able to drink again he had no craving for alcohol but simply wished to be sociable when invited to drink he learned in the same way as a boy learns to smoke smoking and vomiting but being determined to learn he overcomes the nausea and by continued attempts he is able to indulge freely another case somewhat similar shows the same phenomena t h twenty nine years of age a laborer both parents living and healthy neither of whom had drank he began drinking when he was fourteen years of age for the last ten years had been drinking to excess he drank any kind of alcoholic liquor but preferred whiskey he went on a spree as often as he had money and stopped drinking only when he could not get anything more to drink at the solicitation of mr butterfield superintendent of calvary industrial home he consented to be treated and mr butterfield brought him to the writer first on august tenth he was a good subject going into deep sleep in fourteen minutes the first attempt he was hypnotized eighteen times before october sixth both alcohol and tobacco were renounced during this time and for a few succeeding weeks he then went to work in a hotel where he was surrounded by alcohol all the time and started to drink again he met with the same success as the former patient he became very sick and vomited severely again and again he tried until he finally succeeded in getting drunk enough to be arrested and committed to prison on the charge of drunkenness and disorderly conduct these seem to be test cases regarding the necessity of a desire for a cure for both men were good subjects they performed post-hypnotic feats according to the suggestions given during hypnosis and received suggestions which produced negative hallucinations as well as positive ones both hypnotically and post-hypnotically the hypnosis was followed by complete amnesia there was no craving for drink at any time after the first treatment and even after they started to drink had either of them had a desire to stop drinking nothing would have been easier it was far easier to stop than to begin again notwithstanding the terrible vomiting and nausea while they were yet sober and able to appreciate the full effect they preserved until they were able to drink and from there it was an easy stage to the old condition of continued drunkenness if any one is determined to drink he will do so regardless of the means used to prevent him 
providing he can get access to alcohol in any way. This, then, is laid down as principle, in order to be able to effect a permanent cure. The subject must be actively willing. He must want to be cured enough to help himself. The other requisite stated was that he must be hypnotizable. There is a number of persons, both temperate and intemperate, who are refractory to hypnotism, and it is still a mute question whether the inebriate is more or less susceptible to its influence on account of his alcoholism. Alcohol no doubt lessens self-control and makes men weak-minded, and so some have thought that inebriates must be more easy to hypnotize. But this may not be so, because it is not a general fact, so far as I know, that the weak-minded are the most easy to hypnotize, nor that women are more easy to succeed with than men. Fortunately, we do not have to depend upon a priori reasoning to determine the, whether the alcoholic is more easily hypnotized. We have the facts of experience to resort to. Alcoholized persons are generally good subjects for treatment, but I have never succeeded in hypnotizing a person for the first time in a state of intoxication. It is necessary to wait until the first effect of the stimulant has passed off. Drunkards are fortunately easy to hypnotize. We, Wyametsky, has found that these patients, alcoholics, are easily hypnotized. Besides these statements, many others speak in the same way, and the experience of the writer is very decided and substantiated the statement that alcoholics are easier to hypnotize than persons generally. Only one dissenting voice has been noticed. Unfortunately, chronic alcoholism renders its victim very hard to hypnotize. We know not how it happened that Mr. Myers has had this experience, for it seems to the writer to lead undoubtedly to a mistaken conclusion. It is necessary, of course, to distinguish, as Mr. Tucky does, between the intoxicated person and the chronic alcoholic. It is generally admitted that intoxicated persons are difficult to hypnotize, but quite as generally, with this one exception, that alcoholics are good subjects. There is one further statement which the writer has not been able to verify, but which would seem very true, viz. I have noticed in more than one case that the best time to make an attempt to hypnotize is very shortly after a bout of drunkenness, and that the patient is less easily hypnotized the longer he is kept sober. This may be true for two reasons, not only because he is organically in a more favorable condition for hypnosis, but because at this time he has a period of remorse and is much ashamed of his conduct. He submits readily to any suggestion, is willing, and may be anxious to be cured. Thus, he fulfills the conditions for hypnosis better. Two psychological questions arise here. First, why should it be difficult to hypnotize a person who is in a state of intoxication? And second, why should an alcoholic be easily hypnotized? The answers to both of these questions will be determined by our ideas of the nature of hypnotism, both psychically and physically. Before trying to answer these questions, two cases with which the writer has experience will be given. These cases are interesting because of the success attending the efforts of the writer when such an experienced operator as Mr. Tucky has failed. Reference is made of two cases of persons who were hypnotized while in a state of intoxication. Although Mr. Tucky distinctly states twice in his book, one quotation of which is given above, that he has never been able to hypnotize a person who was intoxicated at the time, if he had not previously been hypnotized. The reader is already acquainted with the first case, as he appears in the experiments recorded in chapter on Will, and there his records can be consulted. The subject, Thomas Duck, was known as Jim the Penman because he went from house to house selling pens, and in the days when his hand was more steady, he earned considerable money by writing names on visiting cards, for he was an excellent penman. The writer met him on Sunday evening, March twenty fifth, 1900, at the Yale Mission. He looked very badly and was partially intoxicated. He said that he had been on a spree for three weeks, and for the previous two nights, I've had him, referring to delirium tremens, the writer was on his guard concerning the trustworthiness and truthfulness of alcoholics in general, and mission frequenters in particular, but his appearance testified to the truth of his statements, and they were partially confirmed by others. 
arrangements were made to meet the next day at a designated place but he was warned to be sure to come sober as soon as he appeared on the following day his intoxication was noticeable and on his being accused of not being sober he finally admitted to having taken eight drinks of whiskey this was probably an understatement and it was then only half past one o'clock in the afternoon he said he had him again the night previous and had to take a drink or two to brace up and further as election was coming on the ward politicians were all treating and he was a voter the writer had difficulty in getting him to make the experiments once he disarranged and disconnected the apparatus so by his violent movements that the experiments had to be repeated he was taken to the office of dr w g anderson where he was examined his heart was very irregular his pulse at a hundred and twelve and he was exceedingly nervous he was placed in an easy chair and told to look at a bright blue marble he did so and after considerable twitching of the muscles all over his body he slept he was not very suggestible and principally on account of his nervous condition he awoke easily he was allowed to sleep for fifteen minutes some post-hypnotic suggestions were given to him and he was awakened his heart was then quite regular and his pulse registered eighty a decrease of thirty-two beats he said that he felt much better he was then allowed to go but the post-hypnotic suggestions were not carried out the other case was that a man of twenty-eight years of age a laborer his father who had been a heavy drinker was dead he had eight brothers all of whom drank he began drinking when thirteen years old and had been drinking ever since with the exception of three years when he was converted and joined the church he drank mostly whiskey and absinthe he had just started on a spree and had been drinking all the morning a friend found him and took him riding around town for a while trying to get him sober and to keep him from drinking when he came to the house of the writer he was in great distress because of his intense desire for drink he was seated comfortably and went into a sound sleep in three minutes it was suggested to him that he would feel hungry instead of thirsty and that on awakening there would be no desire for drink it was also suggested that he would not drink any more after he was awakened he was asked how he felt to which he replied i feel much better do you feel like having a drink no but i feel awful hungry i haven't had anything to eat today he was then supplied with some food which he ate with apparent relish and went away that afternoon he succeeded in continuing his spree so that he was completely intoxicated by evening and drank until some misdemeanor committed during intoxication he is now serving a term in prison these cases are interesting for two reasons they show that occasionally a person can be hypnotized when intoxicated and further they show that the suggestions given under such conditions are of little or no value with these two exceptions the writer has no better success than mr tucky one glass of beer frequently interfering with the attempt so that the person was not the least affected the instructions invariably given by the writer are as follows come without having taken either alcohol or coffee for the inhibitory effect of either is recognized we must now return to the answer of the two questions which was deferred in order to give these two cases the answer as was said would depend upon our idea of the nature of hypnosis most answers which have been given are descriptive rather than explanatory supposing that the quite popular theory of mr myers is accepted and hypnosis is considered a disseverance of consciousness the consciousness giving place to the subconscious the question naturally arises why does the mind so function it may be said again that it is a disseverance of consciousness and that memory is the factor which makes the trouble but again the question why does memory behave thus we may dally with the word suggestion until we make suggestion its own progenitor but the question still comes why does suggestion cause these phenomena giving the phenomena another name does not help us in the explanation let us consider the common analogy of natural sleep the conditions both psychically and physically are very similar we can find a very common example of hypnotism in natural sleep in the mother and the child the mother goes to sleep in rapport with the child the most severe thunderstorm does not affect her in the least through the slamming of doors and the trampling of feet she sleeps deeply and serenely but let the baby breathe hard or make the least sound and she is awake instantly or if the child is in her arms she draws it to her to a limited extent she tends it and never injures it in any way 
She is conscious as the hypnotized person is conscious of certain things, although both will probably forget them when they wake. Certain drugs which induce sleep will also induce hypnosis, as example given. Chloroform, passiflora, etc., and the conditions favorable for sleep are also favorable for hypnotism. Further, one can frequently be changed into the other. Physically, it seems as though there is a great similarity, and to the physical we go for the explanation of the phenomena of hypnotism, at least in part. The phase of the physical which throws on hypnotism the most light, at least according to the judgment of the writer, is the blood supply. It is not contended that hypnotism is going to be fully explained by the change in the encephalic circulation, but it is believed that this change in the circulation can help to clear up the difficulty. We know that the change of blood supply is very necessary in normal sleep, and this suggests the explanation. Wundt suggests the blood supply is a factor in the phenomena. Also Sully, Carpenter, Took, and Lehman agree that this is the solution of the riddle. Not unlikely, some of these investigators claim too much for this one factor, failing to recognize its limitations and difficulties. Heidenhain at first accepted this explanation, but later rejected it for the following reasons. 1. Hypnotism appeared in spite of the inhalation of nitrite of a meal, which causes hyperemia. 2. There are no changes in the vessels in the back of the eyes during hypnosis. 3. Salvioli and Bouchut found cerebral hyperemia during hypnosis. These reasons are sufficient to cause us to reject the theory of total anemia of the brain, if anyone claimed that, but hardly sufficient to reject the theory of partial anemia. No doubt some portions of the brain are in a condition of hyperemia, while the other portions are anemic. The supply of blood being less than ordinary, if what remains is taken to one portion of the brain, the other parts have less, so much less as to force the anemic parts into a condition of inactivity. In hypnotism, the condition of the encephalic circulation may now be considered analogous to that of the atmosphere with a low baromic pressure. It is mobile and disposed to storms. If attracted in one direction, it is determined strongly. Then the very momentum with which the blood surges in that special direction reacts on and strengthens function. If it be toward an idealation center, some particular idea may so monopolize the consciousness that the judging faculty is almost as completely in abeyance as in ordinary dreaming. This would partially at least explain the disseverance of consciousness, and if the theory of subconscious is accepted, this would be an important element in the explanation also. Further, it would tend to explain the anemia, which most frequently follows hypnotism. It is on this basis that an attempt will be made to show why the chronic alcoholic is easily hypnotized, and the intoxicated person difficult to hypnotize. It was shown when dealing with the physiological part of the discussion that on account of the growth of the arteries, the normal amount of blood does not reach the brain. This would keep it in an anemic condition and thus make it favorable to hypnosis. On the other hand, intoxication causes an increased circulation and sending more blood to the brain would cause hyperemia. This would be unfavorable to hypnosis and therefore make the intoxicated person difficult to hypnotize. This is only one factor, but an important factor. Even accepting James' theory that the change in the circulation is the result, not the cause, of the altered activity of the nervous matter, it would make little difference in the relation of alcoholism to hypnotism. If the effect were easily obtained, there would be less trouble in furnishing the cause. In fact, the effect would suggest the cause. Those who hold to the chemical theory of sleep could also apply it to hypnotism and could assist us in our explanation. There is nothing to prevent the two theories, that of change in the circulation and that of change in the chemical constitution of the blood, going side by side. In alcoholism, the subject has, as we know, the quality as well as the quantity changed, so that this would be favorable to hypnotism if hypnotism and sleep are allied conditions. The increased circulation of intoxication would tend to the purification of the blood by removing the waste products, and thereby prevent hypnosis. In certain emotional states, when the circulation is very active, both hypnosis and sleep are impossible. As was said when dealing with the subject of alterations of personality, the alcoholic has the consciousness dissevered so frequently in so much of his time that when disseverance comes in another way, example given, when hypnotism is suggested, it is readily induced on account of his habit. 
There is considerable resemblance between the drunkard and the hypnotic. They will both personify some character. Both are suggestible. Both are hyperesthetic, and a small thing may be exaggerated by both. They are both lower states of being, and both are easily deluded. The resemblance is so great that some opponents of hypnotism have termed it teetotal intoxication. There is noticeable difference, however. In intoxication we have the nervous system involved in the inverse order of its evolution, but in the lighter grades of hypnotism we do not find that the higher psychical functions are so much affected as of motion and sensation. With all the agreement between the two states, it is not strange that a person used to one could easily acquire the other. The method used by the writer to induce hypnosis is not different enough from those of other operators to require more than passing notice. Every operator has some special factors in his methods, of which he must also have a variety. Seating the subject comfortably in his chair, the attention is directed to some object, which is bright and causes a slight strain on the eyes. Usually there is used a piece of apparatus, similar to that employed by some European operators, which has been improved by the writer. A piece of tin or zinc covered with velvet fits over the forehead, to which is fashioned at one end a piece of elastic, to the other a hook. At the other end of the elastic are several eyes, so that the elastic can be shortened or lengthened, according to the size of the head. The zinc is thus kept in place by the elastic. In the middle of the zinc is placed vertically a square socket, into which fits a short piece of brass, which is joined to the end of a piece of fuse wire, on the other end of which is a nickel ball. This wire can be bent into any position, and the ball adjusted so as to be of the most use in tiring the eyes. The piece of brass can be removed from the socket so that the apparatus is in two pieces, and thus more easily carried in the pocket. After this apparatus is in place, the subject is told to look at the ball, which will soon make him sleepy, and in the manner so familiar to all he soon goes to sleep. Methods are varied with different subjects, and frequently no apparatus is used. The suggestions are of three different classes, destructive, constructive, and physiological. The destructive suggestions are to effect that he must not drink any more, that alcoholic drinks are harmful to him, that he does not care for either the taste or effects of the liquor, and that he has given up drinking altogether. Drinking is ruining his family, his health, and his business, and he must not continue it. He must keep away from the persons who drink liquor and the places where it is kept. As alcohol is a poison, anyone offering to him is his enemy and is doing him injury. These and any other suggestions which will destroy his desire for alcohol may be used, many of which may be invented for the particular case. If the house is left empty, it may become so filled as to leave the last state of the man worse than the first. We must therefore make constructive suggestions, of which the following are examples. He is very much engrossed with his family and business. He has developed a great fondness for reading or attending church. He likes to associate with persons who do not drink. He attends the baseball games or rides in the park. He is now happy and cheerful and has attained control over himself. He is no longer the slave but the master. His ideals are higher now. He wants to set a good example and help everyone to do right. He is confident in his power to continue in the way he has started, etc. Any suggestion which will assist him to construct a new line of thought and a new environment so as to prevent his thinking about drinking by doing something else should be used. The physiological suggestions are very important. The suggestion of nausea if any alcohol is drunk and that the taste of all alcoholic drinks will be like wormwood or castor oil or anything that is known to be obnoxious to the subject. A suggestion of the paralysis of the arm if the patient tries to convey a glass of liquor to his mouth, or an inability to swallow liquor, may be helpful. Auxiliary suggestions to improve the general health are also beneficial, such as those regarding digestion, appetite, action of the bowels, immunity from headache, or any other ailment which hypnosis can aid. All three classes of suggestions should be continued for a few weeks regularly so as to help the patient to get accustomed to the new surroundings. If there is a craving, as in the case of the regular drinker, suggestions regarding this should be given, but at most this lasts not more than ten days in a severe form. After regular treatment has been stopped, occasional treatments are no doubt beneficial. In addition to the suggestions given by the operator, 
it has been found advantageous to have the patient give himself suggestions. Mason and Quackenboss have both used autosuggestion in their cases with considerable success. The patient should give himself suggestions similar to those given by the operator, just as he was going to sleep at night, and in this way much the same result will follow as in hypnotism. If it is correct that hypnotism is closely allied to natural sleep, we can well see the benefit of such a course. This is generally used as an auxiliary to hypnotism, but in cases where hypnosis is not practical, it has proved effective at times. The writer has tried auto-suggestion on himself in minor difficulties with considerable success. Duke made the unpleasant operation of having a tooth extracted almost painless by mentally repeating, how delightful, and Le Beau cured himself of facial neuralgia by auto-suggestion. This is the principle of Christian science and other faith cures. It is one characteristic of hypnotism which is very valuable in cases of the nature of alcoholism, that it is much easier to reform persons and lead them than it is to debase them and lead them to do evil. It is much easier to restore moral rectitude to a somnambulist who has fallen therefrom than to pervert the integrity of character of a woman of high moral standing. One reason for this is that the hypnotized person is never devoid of will. Hypnotic actions are always voluntary actions in the wider sense of the word. Mr. Gurney reports a case which clearly shows this. I was recently experimenting with a youth who had formerly been a telegraph boy and who had taken a strong dislike for the metier. When hypnotized, he was at the mercy of any suggestion or command except one. Nothing would induce him to carry a telegram. The refusal was unaffected by considerations which would certainly have reversed it in his normal state. Example given. When he was told that the matter was one of life and death, and that he should have twenty pounds for the job, the will that remains in hypnosis, being directed in the best ways, receives an environment from suggestion, and is strengthened. The patient is thus enabled to overcome the force of habit and external suggestion. Dr. A. Forel gives a case which was of such long standing and so unpromising, and yet resulted so successfully that an epitome of it will be given. The man, who was confirmed in alcoholism, was brought to him. He was seventeen years old, having spent nine years in an asylum, and had twice tried to commit suicide. Whenever he had an opportunity, he would drink to madness while in the asylum, was a great care, always making trouble for himself and inciting other inmates to acts of violence and rebellion. After Dr. Forel had hypnotized him a few times, he seemed like another person. He became quiet and tractable. He gave up his allowance of wine, and to crown all, united with the temperance society, which he had hitherto opposed and condemned. Three cases of the writer's experience will close the chapter. The first one is the case of the longest standing, which the writer has treated. The second is the case of alcoholism of longest standing, which the writer has stopped. And the third is a case which has value in itself, worthy of recitation. Mr. X, 36 years old, father and mother both drank, the former very hard. Patient started drinking when 12 years of age, and when 24, drank very heavily. Drank beer mostly, but usually finished the day on whiskey. Drank regularly every day. About one year and a half before applying for treatment, he had taken the Keeley cure and remained sober afterwards for four months. At the time of coming for treatment, he was drinking about two quarts of beer and whiskey every day, taking about an equal number of drinks of each. Every inducement was offered on the other hand, and threats of various kinds were made on the other hand to compel him to stop drinking, but they were powerless to help him. Early in September 1900, he came to the writer in the evening partially intoxicated. He became a little drowsy, and his eyes were closed by the writer. Appropriate suggestions were made, and he went away. He was hypnotized every day for two weeks, then every other day for about the same length of time. At no time did he get beyond a light sleep, and most of the time it was a little more than drowsiness. At the ninth day all craving and taste for a liquor was gone, and from the first day he did not taste a drop of any kind of alcoholic liquors. He had twenty treatments in all. He seems hardly to have been more deeply hypnotized than Mrs. C. in the case quoted by Bramwell but the effect was all that could be desired. Mr. K., aged 59, 
Father and mother both drank, and his father's relatives drank. Mr. K.'s children drank also. His father kept a tavern, and the patient started drinking when ten years old, and has been drinking ever since. With the exception of five years, beginning twenty years ago, he drinks whiskey. Here is a case of forty-nine years standing. The first time he came, he went into a deep sleep, and after that all desire was gone. After the second visit, he went into saloons while about his business, but had not the least desire for alcohol in any form. Scratch. This was three years ago, and when last heard of was abstemious. Many other cases equally successful could be given, but these will suffice as examples to show the value of hypnotism to alcoholism. The following case is one of special interest and value from a psychological point of view. A very meager outline of the case will be given, except in so far as it deals directly with dipsomania. John Kinzel was born on a farm in central New England in 1873. The family history, as far as alcoholism is concerned, is as follows. Maternal grandfather, great-grandfather, great-uncles all drank heavily, but neither his mother nor any of her brothers or sisters drank. All the Kinzels, his fathers, drank, and do yet. Only two, however, drank to excess, viz. John's uncle and cousin. Mr. Kinzel, the father, makes about twelve barrels of cider every fall and uses it regularly. Toward spring, it gets pretty hard. He drinks about eight or ten glasses per day, but he was never intoxicated in his life. In the summer, at hang time, cider brandy augments the stock of cider. His drinking is like that of the New England farmer of fifty or one hundred years ago. John drank cider at home when a boy, but was never intoxicated except once. When seven years of age, his mother being away, he climbed up in the pantry, took from the shelf some cider brandy, and drank enough to intoxicate him. He never drank anything but cider and this cider brandy until he was fourteen, when he had a glass of beer. When twenty-one years old, being in the sophomore class in college, he drank on one occasion beer and wine, and on another occasion claret lemonade. On the former of these occasions he became happy. The following summer he drank cider at home. During his sophomore year he developed a double personality. He would pass into an abnormal state, during which he would remember all of his normal state and all previous experiences in the abnormal state. That is, in the abnormal state he would remember all his life. But when he returned to the normal state again, the abnormal state would be a blank to him. While in these abnormal states his character was much changed, showing itself in no way more prominently than in his appetite for alcoholic drinks. In his junior year he only drank when in these abnormal states. He drank mostly beer, very little of which would intoxicate him. In the summer vacation between his junior and senior years, he drank nothing, not even the cider at home. In the senior year, the abnormal states became more frequent and lasted longer. During this year, he drank a great deal, but only in the abnormal states, except that sometimes he would come out of the abnormal state into the normal, partially intoxicated. Then he would continue drinking in the normal state. Never was the drinking initiated in the normal state. He smoked much when normal and nearly constantly when abnormal. During the summer vacation following graduation, he drank twice, both times during his abnormal state, and both times he was very much intoxicated. In the autumn following his graduation, he entered a divinity school and there drank some when abnormal, not sufficient to get intoxicated, but enough to smell it after he came to himself. After leaving the divinity school in January the following year, he drank cider somewhat while normal, as well as during the abnormal state, and this is the first of a desire to drink when normal. This desire was gratified by cider. He also smoked very heavily during this time. In April of that year, in 1898, he went fishing with some men who had wine and whiskey, and here we have his first voluntary intoxication. He drank cider all that summer and autumn but not to intoxication, and continued very light or no drinking during the following winter, spring, and summer. The following autumn, 1899, he drank considerable cider, becoming once intoxicated and also became intoxicated on beer. The next winter he became happy, several times on cider, drank cider all the spring and summer, and in the early fall developed a true dipsomania with monthly periods, which continued all the fall and winter, the last one being on March 19, 1901.
on march twentieth he came to the writer for treatment he had had two drinks that morning but as he had previously been hypnotized and was an excellent subject no difficulty was experienced in inducing hypnosis he slept deeply and appropriate suggestions were given he came again the following day and on april sixteenth seventeenth and eighteenth the last three being just previous to the time for his next outbreak he went away and the next day the craving appeared on time contrary to suggestion he went to a saloon and procured a glass of beer went to another and got another glass he went into a third saloon purchased and drank a third glass of beer when he began to know he expressed it here feel or remember i can't tell which it seemed like all three what had been suggested to him the following day he sent a letter to the writer containing the exact words of the suggestions given to him showing that they all came back to him as soon as he began to hear apparently away off in the distance the words of the suggestions to him he became very sick and vomited violently he was sick the whole day and could not take anything more to drink nor did he want it he disliked alcohol in any form on june second again he came and was hypnotized from that time until november for six months he did not touch any kind of intoxicating liquors but then he got a quart of whiskey and became intoxicated for three years he had no desire for alcohol and where the smell of liquor used to engender a great desire for drink it later had no effect or if any it was distasteful when examining him in the hypnotic condition after this he said that the reason he drank when he was in the abnormal state was that it seemed all right for him to do so he had had none of the scruples which were ever present in the normal state when these monthly dipsomaniacal spells would come on the identical feeling reappeared so he went and drank because it seemed the right thing for him to do in the case of louis v mr meyer says though he had before the attack of double personality been a total abstainer he now not only drank his own wine but stole the wine of other patients this shows a common tendency in the abnormal states of these two persons thus the double personality and alcoholism interact not only does alcoholism cause a phenomenon of double personality as shown in a previous chapter but the double personality causes alcoholism or dipsomania as shown by the case cited here perhaps it might be a better statement to say that they are both expressions of a common disorder this case also shows the value of hypnotism and dipsomania something else is very interesting and well worthy of notice in the reappearance of the suggestions usually the alcoholic becomes sick and if the hypnosis has been deep enough to cause amnesia he does not know why he is sick but although in this case there was complete amnesia after hypnosis the exact words of the suggestions were sent to the writer by the subject being remembered during the sickness and afterwards the physical treatment given by some sanitaria has proved very beneficial to a great number of alcoholics rest a little medication and even surgery have helped in restoring almost hopeless inebriates any method which is beneficial is welcome hypnotism as a promising field has been much used during the past half century with considerable success but it is only a help and not a prohibitive the two conditions of success in this form of treatment are active cooperation on the part of the subject and a hypnotizable person with which to deal the alcoholic is usually easily hypnotized on account of the frequent disseverance of consciousness when drunk and the condition of the blood various methods of hypnotizing are used and suggestions given all tending to destroy the old conditions and implant new associations end of chapter 11 end of the psychology of alcoholism by george barton cuton mr bookman here if you enjoyed today's book go ahead and hit the like button also subscribe so you don't miss any of our new uploads tell us what you thought about the book in the comments and of course just know we thank you for listening and you are appreciated